Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Are there any documents to be tabled, Clark? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. And are there any proposals for committee to meet? Not today. I'd ask senators just to remain for a moment. As some of you may be aware, today marks the last occasion which Senate Attendant Adrian Morrison will be assisting us in the chamber. Adrian joined the Senate Department as a Senate attendant on 4 October 2006, initially engaged to support the 41st Parliament. Adrian is... Come out, Adrian. Now, you're holding up the Senate now, Adrian. Adrian has continued with the Chamber team, providing support to, the se to Senators for 15 years. Since 2006, Adrian has served six Presidents, three Clerks and five Ushers of the Black Rod. Adrian has also been present for four openings of the parliament and the swearing-in of three governors-general. All of us have first-hand experience of Adrian's professionalism, dedication to her work and provision of service to the highest standard. I am sure that all senators will join me in thanking Adrian for her exceptional service to the Senate and wishing her a long and leisurely retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senators, all. Uh, you seeking the call, Minister? No. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, National Health Amendment, enhancing the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. And Senator Gallagher, Thank I believe you. you have the call. Thank you, Mr President. Labor will be supporting this bill. This bill flows from the conclusion of the light latest round of strategic agreements between the Commonwealth, the pharmaceutical industry represented by Medicines Australia, which represents the innovative part of the industry, and the Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association GBMA, which represents the generics and biosimilars part of the industry. This is a process that has been, under, that has been underway now for some time. It started largely in response to the projections contained in the first intergenerational report which was published by the then Treasurer Peter Costello in 2002. It projected that PBS costs would climb quite dramatically over the 40-year period that each Morning. of the IGRs <laughs> contemplate. The process that has now been undertaken through governments of both political persuasions, including the Wright and Gillard governments, to come to an agreement that balances the viability of this critically important sector to bring medicines that are often developed overseas to Australian Perfect. patients and to ensure that Australian patients have a ready dependable and affordable supply of the best medicines in the world is, on the one hand, a key objective. On the other hand, the financial fiscal sustainability has been essentially a balance to be achieved through a series of strategic agreements. This is the latest one, which follows a lengthy negotiation between the Commonwealth and the industry. The, the agreement contains a number of other very important measures that are not reflected in this bill because they will largely be measures implemented through executive government and the industry. We take the view that agreements concluded in good faith between the Commonwealth Government and industry, as in this case, must be respected by an incoming government, if we're lucky enough to be an incoming government next year. Our approach to the conclusion of this agreement, which we've indicated publicly we support, extends to our support for this bill. 
This bill covers two important measures contained in the strategic agreements. The first is to amend the price reduction system that has been a feature of the strategic agreements going back to the first decade of the century to ensure that some of the anomalies are fixed in favour of taxpayers in the budget, particularly through catch-up statutory price reductions. Secondly, the agreements in this bill also put in place measures to deal with the insecurity of supply of a range of medicines that had already uh, started to become an issue in Australia, which, which has been greatly exacerbated by the supply chain shock that we've seen through COVID. And I'll deal with that measure first. At the moment, there are 263 medicines that are listed by the TGA that are experiencing shortages in Australia, with a further 54 medicines that have anticipated shortages. So well over 300 listed, therapeutically listed medicines in Australia do not have secure supply. I'm sure all senators have been receiving substantial feedback from patients, constituents and pharmacies about the difficulty they've been having. Some of that was already happening before COVID, but assessing supplies of very standard important medicines, medicines for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, epilepsy, high cholesterol, pain management, particularly for severe pain as well as a range of medicines for mental health conditions, including depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. These are obviously very important issues for the delivery of good health care to the Australian community. This agreement contains a number of measures to essentially put in place an obligation on industry to guarantee security of supply of a range of medicines, particularly those that are at risk of supply shortage a security of supply of four to six months stock holding. This is a measure that we support. We think it's a proportionate, measured response to the shortages we've seen, particularly over the last two years, but, as I said, some of which predated uh, COVID. So it's a measure we welcome. Regarding return for the obligations that industry has taken on through the signing of the agreement, I make the point, firstly, that this is largely a supply guarantee that will fall on genericised medicines, because they are the medicines that are usually subject to insecurity of supply. In return for that guarantee, the government has agreed to a modest price support for these medicines. This itself, frankly, should help ensure a greater willingness on the part of global industry to ensure that the Australian market is properly supplied. So that is the first technical measure contemplated by this bill and a measure which we support. The bill also implements a number of important measures designed to deliver price reductions for medicines. These new measures include catch-up price provisions that deliver price reductions for medicines that have thus far avoided price reductions commensurate with what we would expect in the functioning of a competitive market. It is through these catch-up price reductions that the bill delivers around $1.9 billion in savings to the PBS, which will be reinvested in the PBS through new listings. The full schedule of statutory price reductions is very large and complex um, uh, and for, you know, is, um, doesn't need detailing in this speech, but it's worth the House noting or the Chamber noting that some of the more prominent of these details. These reductions will ensure that on the fifth and tenth year anniversary of a drug being listed on the PBS, the drug will see a five per cent reduction on each of the two anniversaries. This price reduction increases to over 26 per cent on the 15th year of a listing. In 2027, towards the end of the agreement, this 26 per cent reduction for the 15th year anniversary will increase to 30 per cent price reduction, a very substantial saving to taxpayers, which again will be reinvested in new listings on the PBS. The bill maintains the first new brand price reduction of 25 per cent which applies when the first new brand, which will usually be a generic. Again, that is a substantial saving. The 5, 10 and 15 year anniversary statutory price reductions only apply if a drug has no competitors listed on the PBS and, as a result, has not been subject to a first new brand price reduction. Some drugs have been listed on the PBS for over 15 years have not been subject to price disclosure reductions that are designed to ensure the PBS can adjust and see those decreasing costs over time. These drugs will now be subject to catch-up price reductions equal to the cumulative statutory re reductions that would have applied over the period of their listing. That means that for a drug listed for 15 years that so far has not seen any price reductions, we will see a price reduction of almost 37 per cent by 1 April 2023. It should be noted that the 25 per cent first new brand price reduction will not apply if the 15-year anniversary price reduction has been applied.
Again, we welcome the agreement between industry and the government on these catch-up price reductions. We think they're a proportionate measured response to the circumstances surrounding some of the drugs that have not been subject to price disclosure reductions over 15 years, again seeking to balance that need around access to new medicines for Australian patients with the sustainability of the PBS elements of the budget. The intent of this bill, which we support and understand the government has, is to give effect to a broad objective in ensuring the sustainability of the PBS while safeguarding medicine supply for the Australian population. That includes making sure that the statutory price reductions do not have an unintended consequence that results in the withdrawal of supply of important medicines from the Australian market. We have a strong view, and I imagine the government shares it, that statutory price reductions should not be allowed to undermine medicine supply. As a result of that shared objective, we note the important role that ministerial discretion has in determining how price reductions are applied in order to ensure that supply of medicines is maintained, along with the financial viability of medicine suppliers. We know that the government shares that view, and to that effect we understand that the government has committed to bringing forward an update of the ministerial discretion guidance material and to engage companies that are potentially affected in that process of an update. This is an important agreement that has been struck between the government and the pharmaceutical industry. It follows a series of agreements that have been struck now for some years, and it's clear that predictions contained in the 2002 IGR around increases in the PBS budget have not come to pass. We're only halfway through the 40 years that the then Treasurer Costello was looking at that time, and Labor will be supporting the bill. Thank you, Madam Deputy Thank President. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the National Health Amendment enhancing the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme Bill 2021. Madam Deputy President, the government has a strong record in managing the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme and is making a record number of medicines available for patients. Since 2013, the government has approved close to 2,000 800 new or amended medicine listings on the PBS at an overall cost of around $13.9 billion. The National Health Amendment enhancing the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme Bill 2021 amends the National Health Act 1953 to implement reforms negotiated with the medicines industry. The amendments reflect new five-year agreements with Medicines Australia, which is the representative body for the innovative medicine sector in Australia, and the Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association, which is the representative for generic and biosimilar medicines suppliers in Australia. The new industry agreements will operate from the 1st of July 2022 to the 30th of June 2027. Through these new agreements, the government and the medicines industry have co-developed a comprehensive package of reforms to the PBS. These reforms will ensure that Australians continue to gain access to new breakthrough medicines as early as possible. They will deliver a robust and uninterrupted supply of medicines needed and used every day by Australians. And, very importantly, Madam Deputy President, uh, these reforms keep the PBS on a long-term sustainable footing. The industry agreements will achieve this by securing commitments from the medicines industry, which will result in new savings from improved statutory price reductions, which will be reinvested in the PBS. The reinvestment will in turn help to make headroom on the PBS for listing new medicines. So what we will see is a 5 per cent reduction at the five years anniversary of a drug listing on the PBS, a 5 per cent reduction at the 10 year anniversary of a drug listing on the PBS, a 26.1 per cent price reduction on the 15 year anniversary of a drug listing on the PBS, which will increase to 30 per cent in 2027. And this, these reforms will also ensure that there'll be a greater level of stock held of commonly prescribed and older medicines in Australia, which in recent years have become susceptible to global medicines shortage, shortages. These reforms will generate net savings of approximately $1.9 billion over the terms of the agreements. 
with an expected investment of approximately $5 billion in PBS medicine listings over the life of the agreement through the PBS New Medicines Funding Guarantee and the reinvestment of efficiencies agreed with the sector. These reforms also target Commonwealth investment towards securing the supply of commonly prescribed lower priced medicines that have lower margins and are often in short supply globally. Increasingly, global shortages are interrupting the supply of medicines, which are the mainstay of treatment for some of the most prevalent health conditions in the Australian community. In 2019 and 2020, brands of over 500 PBS items were affected by medium to critical impact shortages, with brands supplied by manufacturers for $4 or less most susceptible. This includes medicines for common health conditions, such as high blood pressure and diabetes, and medicines for mental health conditions, such as depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. These reforms, as agreed with the medicines industry, will ensure that manufacturers are, get, are better placed to compete for supply of these medicines in the global medicine market and hold greater reserve supplies of at least four to six months of stock in Australia to buffer the Australian market when interruptions do occur. From the 1st of July 2023, additional stocks will be held for over 600 PBS items including most brands which have an approved ex-manufacturer price of $4 or less. Madam Deputy President, these reforms are critical to ensuring the continuity of access that is so important to the proper treatment and management of common medical conditions. Overall and on average, patients will benefit and save from the reforms through improved supply chain security for a larger number of lower cost pharmaceutical items on the PBS, including for diabetes, epilepsy, arthritis and asthma. And our patients will also benefit through reduced costs associated with lowered brand premiums. There will be no increased cost to concession card holders who will continue to pay a maximum of just $6.60 per script. The agreements with the medicines industry strike a balance between affordable access for Australians, a PBS that is sustainable over the long term, and providing the Australian medicines industry the right conditions for it to thrive, launch new and innovative medical treatments in Australia, and provide reliable supply. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Patrick. Yes, yeah, thank you, Madam. Uh, Deputy President, I rise only uh, briefly to uh, speak on the bill. I note that uh, um, the Labor Party and uh, the Liberal Party of both uh, Liberal Party senators have both spelt out the, the provisions, uh, which I support. Um, I have some concerns about unintended consequences, uh, particularly in relation to some some drugs that may end up being um, uh, caught in a, a price cut. Uh, in circumstances where they haven't hit the 15-year mark, and uh, that, that's the reason in which I ask that this uh, bill be removed from non-controversial, simply so that I could ask some questions in the committee stage. But in principle, I, uh, I support the bill, just worried about some unintended consequences. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Chair. The Australian Government and the medicines industry have co-developed a comprehensive package of reforms to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, the PBS. This is in recognition that the sustainable delivery of world-class world -class access to medicines requires a close partnership between the government and the Australian businesses and industries which supply, distribute and dispense the millions of medicines needed and used every day by Australians. These reforms have been designed to meet current and future challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the ever-expanding treatment options for patients. The reforms are also designed to address the impact of global medicine shortages on Australians, which have interrupted the supply of medicines that are the mainstay of treatment for some of the most common health conditions in Australia, including medicines for high blood pressure and diabetes, and medicines for mental health conditions such as depression, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The new five-year strategic agreements with Medicines Australian and Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association will ensure that Australians continue to gain access to new breakthrough medicines as early as possible. 
It will also deliver robust and un uninterrupted supply of the medicines that Australians need and use every day and keep the PBS on a long-term sustainable footing. The industry agreements will achieve this by securing commitments from the medicines industry and the government to deliver new savings from improved statutory price reductions, which will be reinvested in the PBS. The reinvestment will in turn help to make headroom on the PBS for the listing of new medicines and the holding in Australia of greater levels of stock of commonly prescribed and older medicines, which in recent years have become susceptible to global medicines shortages. The measures in this bill are in addition to significant policy and process improvements outlined in the strategic agreements with Medicines Australian and Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association. And I thank the members for their contributions to the debate on this bill. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the you read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for other purposes. Minister. Uh, I think did you want to go to committee? Do you, is there a committee stage required? You're asking for a committee stage, Senator Gallagher? Uh, Senator, sorry, Senator Patrick. Last day. <laughs> is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? Yes. There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, Senator Patrick. Yeah, just I have a series of questions for the minister. Um, again, I'm supportive of the bill. I'm supportive of the stability uh, and, and uh, assurance that the bill provi provides to <clears throat> both uh, people who are benefit uh, beneficiaries of the, uh, of the PBS, but also the companies that engage with the, with the government in relation to this. Um, Minister, can you confirm that the catch-up provisions in the bill are only meant to apply to those listed brands that have been on the PBS for 15 years? Uh, Senator, Senator, I can confirm that it is to drugs, not brands. Senator Patrick. Is the intention of the bill to apply the catch-up provisions to drugs that have been listed uh, um, that have been listed on the PBS for, for 15 years? Minister. There is also ministerial discretion that's available. Senator Patrick. Thank you. I might come back to that. But it was reported in Pharma Dispatch on the 10th of November 21 that catch-up uh, price reductions will contribute to something like $1.9 billion in savings over the course of uh, five years. Um, by in, because of the agreement between Medicines and Australia and the, the federal government, in, in terms of calculating that that saving, uh, and I'm happy if you might want to present a, a different number if you if that's not correct. Um, I'm just wondering which of the brands listed on the PBS are subject to the cuts because that clearly must have been included as part of the calculation. Minister. So the catch-up reductions are one part of the contribution to that $1.9 billion and the schedule of drugs that it's calculated from will be made available in 2022. Senator Patrick. So in some sense this goes to secrecy, which um, uh, as you know I, I don't like very much. Um, I wonder uh, if you're not listing the, the drugs now, wh why is that the case? Why, why won't you at least let people see uh, which drugs are going to be affected. Um, that, in my view, is consistent with the general principle of giving or setting up a, a, an arrangement that, has, uh, uh, that, that does give companies surety and indeed allows the users of the PBS to see what will and won't be affected. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. So the assessment will be made on each individual drug in 2022, so the schedule obviously can't be made available until that time. Senator Patrick. Which, which goes to the question about if you've calculated some cost savings, you must have at least done that on the basis of some uh, calculation. So I wonder if you could perhaps, uh, and, and I accept that you say that the, there's uh, a couple of part, moving parts to this, but you, you must have come to uh, that number by doing at least some analysis. Minister. 
Minister. Okay. So it's a, uh, Senator, it's a point in time calculation and it's a projection. And at the time when the schedule is created, that's when the actual number will be determined, or the actual drugs that, that qualify will be determined. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Again, this goes back to you've made a calculation, and you must have made a calculation on the basis of something. Uh, so you must have some idea, is the point I'm making. It, you know, obviously, you're, I accept what you say. You're moving forward to the point where the, um, where, where the, uh, dr the drugs will be defined, but you have made a calculation. I'm trying to understand the basis of that calculation. Minister. So if the schedule was created today and calculated on the basis of the calculations that we're talking about, it could potentially be very misleading as to which drugs it are affected. Senator Patrick. So I understand your, your answer to be, I just want to make sure I've got it clear, is that um, you're saying you don't want to announce what you've based the calculation on because it may in fact change and would be misleading. Is that essentially the gist of what you're saying? Minister? So the projection can be made with reasonable accuracy because there are some drugs that are five years or old, older that know they're going to fall into the net, but there are as a number, a smaller, a smaller number that uh, are, are unconfirmed at this point in time. Senator Patrick. Is it possible for you to take on notice to table those that are known? Um, if you, you know, I accept there are some unknowns, but uh, to take on notice the knowns. Minister. We can take that question on notice. Senator Patrick. I think, sorry, um, um, Chair. Will the cuts include uh, cuts to listed brands on the PBS uh, that treat mental illness, pain, hypertension and infection? And will any of these cuts apply to listed brands that have been on the PBS for less than 15 years? <coughs> Minister. Uh, all medicines on the PBS will be subject to uh, to, the, to some form of price reduction, yeah, and there is ministerial discretion available. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> so the the bill sets out a schedule of, that deals with changes at different points in time, one of which is 15 years. Um, uh, so my question really is going to: Is there a possibility that there will be some of these brands that are actually um, uh, currently on the list that are not? That haven't been on there for 15 years that will be affected by the 15 year change? Minister? So the calculation will be made on the basis of whether the drug itself has been on the PBS for 15 years, not necessarily the brand of drug. But if, a, but if a particular brand would be adversely affected, well, then that would fall under ministerial discretion. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, so let's go to ministerial discretion then. What a, um, I understand you, uh, there's been no guidance given to how that discretion will be exercised. Is that the case? Or, or perhaps you could advise the chamber of uh, some aspects of that uh, guidance for ministerial discretion. So there yes, is guidance uh, uh, that's been published, it's already available, but that is being updated subject to passage of this bill and it's being done in conjunction with the sector, in collaboration with the sector. Senator Patrick. So what sort of criteria would apply to those, those, um, <clears throat> those brands uh, that have been on the, on the uh, PBS for less than 15 years in circumstances where the drug may have been um, on for less than five, uh, less than 15. Minister. Okay. 
So the assessments are going to be made as to uh, the extent of the use of the, of the particular drug, of the particular brand, and whether the price reduction would cause that brand to leave the PPS or leave the market, and the, and the assessments would be made at the time. Senator Patrick. So just going to the timing, uh, <coughs> uh, when is it likely that a company might be able to make an application to the minister uh, to exercise the discretion, if that indeed is the way in which the discretion uh, might work. Minister. So the time frame is currently being negotiated with industry, but the intention is it would be at the earliest opportunity. Senator Patrick. Um, has the department received any correspondence, or the minister received any correspondence uh, that might preempt an application indicating that there is a concern? <clears throat> Minister. Yes. Yes, there's been a limited amount of uh, correspondence already received from very few companies, and the Minister is responding to that now. Senator uh, Patrick. Thank you. I, I, I'm not meaning to uh, necessarily divulge, uh, ask you to, to divulge the companies, but what, what sort of number are we talking? Is it three, five, ten? How many companies have approached the Minister? Minister? It's under five, Senator. Senator Patrick. So, sorry, under five per cent. Uh, under, under five uh, companies. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I presume we've had uh, exemptions or discretions in the past. You've talked about discretions that are already in place. Can you give me some idea of, of how that discretion has been? Uh, exercised in the past in terms of perhaps number of applications versus number of uh, exem exemptions that have been made using the discretion? Minister. So uh, exemptions have been um, uh, discretion has been used on about 90 brands in recent years uh, in those circumstances where those brands would have exited the market. Senator Patrick. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, 90 out of how many applications? Just I just want to understand how um, yeah, how, how the, 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 the discretion falls. Minister. That's not information I have to hand, but I can take it on notice for you. That concludes our committee stage. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the National Health Amendment enhancing the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme Bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. All those in favour the, be, uh, sorry, all those in favour say aye. <laughs> Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for other purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Electoral Legislation Amendment Annual Disclosure Equality Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So all those in favour of the bill proceeding without formalities and being read a first time, those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to electoral and financial disclosure matters and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. All those in favour of the bill being read for a second time say aye. Against say no, the ayes have it. Okay. So, in that case, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Oh, sorry, 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 I just clap first, sorry. Is that right? Okay, so I was right. Senator Kitching. Sorry about that. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Electoral Legislation Amendment Annual Disclosure Equality Bill 2021. 
Labor will be supporting this bill. The bill contains necessary measures to ensure that members and senators are covered by our political funding and disclosure laws. In 2018, this parliament agreed to important reforms to enhance transparency and protect our democracy. It was Labor that successfully fought for a ban on foreign donations to be included in the Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act 2018. We knew that we had to act to protect our democracy from foreign interference. But this government had to be dragged kicking and screaming into banning them. It took two years for them to act after Labor introduced our own bill to protect democracy. Because of the reforms Labor, Labor achieved in 2018, registered political parties, candidates, Senate groups and political campaigners are unable to accept donations from foreign sources over $100 if they are intended to be used for electoral expenditure or any foreign donation at all over $1,000. However, there is an inconsistency in the way the funding and disclosure framework operates with respect to parliamentarians once they are elected. This bill will extend the ban on foreign donations that applies to parties, candidates and political campaigners, to senators and members of the House of Representatives. It will also align the donations disclosure obligations of serving parliamentarians with those that apply to candidates and to political parties. While candidates for an election are unable to accept foreign donations and are required to submit a return to the Australian Electoral Commission which details their donations and electoral expenditure, this obligation ceases 30 days after the return of the writs. That means that anyone in this place who receives donations personally during their term in parliament is not required to disclose them. It also means that there is a loophole which would allow serving parliamentarians to accept donations from foreign sources. This bill will close that loophole. Now, given the prohibition on parties and candidates accepting foreign donations, it would be surprising if anyone in this place was taking gifts from foreign citizens or entities. That would be going against the spirit of the donations reforms that were enacted in 2018. But the ban should, of course, be extended to elected members of this place. It's illogical for it to cease 30 days after a candidate is elected. The ban will apply to gifts received by sitting parliamentarians from the commencement of the bill. The other change the bill makes in relation to foreign donations is to prohibit candidates from accepting them from six months prior to either the date of their nomination or the date that they announce their candidacy, whichever is earlier. This will enhance the integrity of our democratic processes and put candidates on a level playing field with elected representatives. This bill will further align the obligations of parliamentarians with those of political parties by requiring them to provide an annual return to the Australian Electoral Commission detailing political donations they personally receive which are over the disclosure threshold. Most donations received by parliamentarians who belong to a political party would be received on their behalf by the political party. The political party then must disclose the detail of those donations each year to the AEC. However, there is currently no obligation on parliamentarians to disclose donations personally received. That means that donations received by parliamentarians who are not members of political parties are not required to be disclosed. That is not right and will be corrected by this bill. Parliamentarians who do not personally receive donations will not be required to provide a return to the AEC. Annual returns will need to include the total value of all gifts received by, parliamentary, by the parliamentarian during the year, the total number of persons who made the gifts, for each gift over the disclosure threshold, which is currently $14,500, the value of each gift, the date on which each gift was made and the name and address of each donor. A parliamentarian's return must be provided within 20 weeks of the end of the financial year. The bill requires parliamentarians to provide an annual return in relation to each financial year from 2020-2021, whether the gifts were made before or on or after the commencement of the Act. That is, the bill will have retrospective application in relation to gifts received personally by parliamentarians during the 2020-2021 financial year. Returns for the 2020-2021 financial year will need to be provided within 30 days of the Act's commencement and annual returns will be published on the AEC's website. Candidates will also be required to disclose donations they personally receive during the period of six months prior to the date of their nomination or six months prior to the date of them announcing their can candidacy 
whichever is earlier. A similar provision will apply to Senate groups who will be, able, who will be taken to begin being a group in an election six months before the day members apply to be grouped on the Senate ballot paper until 30 days after polling day. These changes will substantially improve transparency and, along with the ban on foreign donations, will put candidates and elected representatives on a level playing field. Deputy President, there is, Acting Deputy President, there is so much more to be done. If this government really wanted to improve transparency, it would be supporting Labor's proposals of lowering the donations disclosure threshold from the current $14,500 to a fixed $1,000 and require donations to be disclosed within seven days. This simple change would mean that voters have this information when they go to cast their ballot and not have to wait up to 18 months to find out who is funding political parties, as is currently the case. There are other reforms that would enhance our democracy, which the government should be committing to. The government should be providing more resources to the AEC to increase enrolment and turnout. There should be reform of electoral expenditure laws. The government should be establishing a powerful and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission, a three-year-old promise left languishing. It should be addressing the spread of dangerous misinformation and disinformation and making laws to prevent governments from pork barrelling in marginally held seats. And the Prime Minister should be requiring members to disclose secret donations that can't be hidden by a blind trust. Despite Labor's ongoing calls for increased transparency, the government has not taken any action on real-time disclosure or lower donations disclosure thresholds or on any other measures. Instead, in the final two sitting weeks of the year, possibly the last of this parliamentary term, the government has finally decided to pursue some form of electoral reform. Labor will support this bill despite being a late and imperfect attempt at increased transparency. Thank you. Senator Waters. Thanks very much. <coughs> Deputy President, pardon me. The government maintains that this bill, along with the political campaigners' bill that they rammed through yesterday, is all about transparency. But they were saying the quiet part out loud when they introduced the bills. Government members have been explicit about their targets: the Voices of movement, the Climate 200 Group, Open Australia Foundation. They vote for you. The government is not after transparency for their dirty donors. They're not after transparency for beneficiaries of blind trusts or for meetings with lobbyists. They just want to tie up all those whose activities call out the government or who threaten their electoral prospects. They want to scare off the competition. They want to discourage new voices from putting their hat into the ring for election. The Greens will always support more transparency, but let's be real about who the government is targeting with this particular bill. On its counterpart bill, the political campaigners' bill, Jason Falinski MP said that the government was trying to, and I quote, turn the rock on all the cockroaches lurking in the dark of Australian democracy, end quote. He said the government wants to prevent parties from campaigning, quote, in the shadows, in the darkness, where no one can see them, where no one knows what they're up to, where no one knows really who's backing them, end quote. And yet this government's donors love to lurk in the darkness. They wield influence away from the light. They have secret meetings. They exploit the loopholes that allow millions in dark money donations. Now, this bill will increase transparency, and we support it for that reason. But it will not shine the light where it most needs to go. In the long list of electoral bills that the government has put up over the last few sittings, I think it's eight now and counting, many of them rammed through without inquiry or proper debate, they still fail to address the core issues that the public are concerned about. If this government was actually serious about transparency, they would ban dirty donations, like the Greens bill proposes. They would cap donations to no more than $1,000 from anybody, whether it's an individual, whether it's a corporation, whether it's any sort of organisation at all. That's what needs to be done. If they were really serious about transparency, they would lower the do donations disclosure threshold and they'd require real-time reporting. 
if they were serious about transparency, um, they would bring in election spending caps, something that they've also refused to do. If they were serious about transparency, they would stop the revolving door of lobbyists and MPs' offices. And if they were really serious about transparency, we would have seen the bill for a corruption watchdog that this government promised more than three years ago, before the last election, that has apparently become a non-core promise in the way that would make John Howard proud. These are the reforms that Australians actually want to their electoral system. This is what the Australian people deserve to get their democracy back and to get it back from the vested interests and the corporate donors who run both big parties and who engineer the system to get the political and legislative outcomes that suit their private bottom lines, never mind what the rest of the community wants or deserves. Senator Scar. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I totally reject and repudiate uh, Senator Warder's contribution. Of course, anyone who contributes to the Greens in Senator Warder's world is self-righteous. In her self-righteous world, anyone who contributes to the Greens uh, is, of course, doing noble work, contributing to a great cause, promoting the cause of humanity. Anyone who donates to the other side of politics, be it the Labor Party, the uh, LNP, the Liberal Party, is a, is a vested interest, a corporate donor. Uh, it's dirty money, a dirty donation, and it's just an absolutely um, absurd, absolutely absurd characterisation of how the political system works in this country. And Senator Kitching, uh, Senator Ciccone from the Labor Party, I'll rise to defend them. I'll rise to the defend them and say I'm absolutely certain, absolutely certain that their judgment in terms of any legislation that comes before this place will be guided by their conscience will be guided by their intellect and reason, which is outstanding in both cases, and that they will make a decision on the basis of what they consider, based on the, constructed on the basis of the foundation of their strongly held values with respect to what's in the best interest of the country. Um, just, as, just as my very good friend, Minister, um, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne, who I've known for a long, long time, <laughs> uh, I won't say how, how long, has always, has always been guided uh, by the minister's values and her desire to assist the public and promote the public interest. And my good friend Senator Davey, who uh, I've had the pleasure of working with since 2019 and who has been a fierce advocate for rural communities prior, prior to coming to this place, continues to be a fierce advocate for those communities and is totally uninfluenced totally uninfluenced by uh, the issue of donations. So I simply do not accept, I totally repudiate the characterisation which Senator Waters seeks to present in relation to the, uh, the mechanics of, our, of how our political system works. In relation to the specifics, in relation to the specifics of this bill, uh, it actually, Madam Acting Deputy President, came as a surprise to me. It actually came as a surprise to me, prior to the introduction of this bill, that there was this loophole, there was this gap, this lacuna, in terms of how our electoral disclosure laws apply. And this bill will address two very important gaps in terms of that legislation. The first is to ensure that foreign donations, and, and before I make this contribution, I, I, or as I'm making this contribution, I should say that nothing I'm saying here should in any way reflect uh, on my good friend Senator Patrick, who I am absolutely sure um, in all of these manners conducts himself with uh, great decency and integrity. Um, and I, I don't question that in absolutely any way. Um, and it, I, I suspect Senator Patrick was not aware of these loopholes either because he would never seek to exploit such loopholes. Uh, so the two loopholes which were addressed in this bill are as follows. The first is in relation to foreign donations. And it can't be the case that someone could be sitting in this place and then before, or outside of this place, and then before they announce their candidacy, before they announce their candidacy as an independent, that uh, they can accept some sort of financial contribution from foreign uh, stakeholders, 
with respect to a future candidacy that simply hasn't been announced yet. I mean, that, that simply should not be permitted to happen. And that loophole no, needs to be closed, and there needs to be uh, a level playing field in terms of how all, all participants in the political uh, system uh, uh, deal with foreign stakeholders. And this bill achieves that, with an appropriate look-back period as well with respect to uh, any financial contributions which were received by candidates. The second point is with respect to the disclosure period for candidates. And again, again, it should be a level playing field. We should all be treated equally, all of us, all of us, whether or not we come from uh, the National Party, the Liberal Party, the LNP, my home state of Queensland, the Labor Party, the Greens, independents, crossbenchers. We should all be treated equally in terms of uh, disclosure periods. And that disclosure period should be calibrated appropriately so that someone is not incentivised to delay the announcement of their candidacy in order to avoid disclosure of donations. So it needs to be a look back period, and I think that's entirely appropriate. There may be other issues, and, and, and no doubt there are other issues in relation to the funding of our political uh, parties and political candidates, which other senators in this place wish, wish, to, wish to contribute. But I think on the specifics of this bill, I think on the specifics of this bill, uh, we should all, um, I, I suspect, at least the vast majority of us agree that these are two gaps in our current system which should be closed. And on that basis, I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. I just uh, wanted to rise uh, to say that uh, uh, whilst uh, I will be supporting this bill um, for many of the reasons pointed out by other contributors and indeed Senator Scar, uh, there, there are other loopholes that also need to be uh, closed or other uh, reforms that need to be looked at, and uh, my amendments will seek to do that. Uh, just in relation to the mention I got from uh, Senator Scar, um, I, I just want to point out he, he, he's not. A, I don't think he was suggesting in any way that uh, uh, that people ought to look at me. Just uh, w w just that he was talking about independence, and I was the only independent in the chamber. So so, uh, and I, he's acknowledging uh, he's acknowledging that now. Um, uh, but but I will also say that Senator Scar ro uh, you know, rose and talked about um, doubts being expressed about who is and who isn't donating to different parties. And uh, you know whether they're all corporate uh, donors in, in one uh, for one party, and whether they're all environmental donors for uh, another party. Um, I think the point is, if you have disclosure that's at a low level, because we don't want to burden you know, mums and dads who want to contribute to a party when they look at the party and say, you know what, I like what they do, I want to help that party get re-elected, as opposed to perhaps a very large donor who says. I want to own that party. That's something. There's a distinction, and, and there is a line where, where um, an accusation can be drawn. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, right now, our disclosure threshold sits at fourteen thousand three hundred dollars, and that is way too high. That does give rise to an accusation that influence is or access is being bought, influence is, is occurring. Uh, and that needs to be addressed. So it's not a, it, it's not a matter of uh, these donations coming in. You know, let other people see where those donations are coming from, so that they can make better claims when they're when they're uh, you know, advocating uh, their particular uh, concerns. You know, if if we are seeing very very large donations coming in from uh, from uh, uh, mining companies to the Liberal Party or to the National Party. Let's see what. Let's let's see that. Let's not have people having innuendo and and, and claims being made. And that's why I've moved moved a bill uh, that uh, or moved an amendment that seeks to lower the threshold to one thousand dollars, such that we don't capture the mums and dads. That's there's a lot of burden involved in that. Uh, no one would suggest someone who's donating a few hundred dollars would ever be trying to buy access or influence. But certainly above that level, the question starts to arise. Uh, so why not 
reduce that, the disclosure threshold down to 1,000. In fact, it's my view that it should also be real time. We're in a world now where uh, real time is not difficult to do, and uh, that would allow the electorate to be uh, uh, completely informed as to uh, who is receiving what, what money and when, how much, who it's from, when they're receiving it. Um, now, in reality, I, as I said, I'd like it to be real time. My amendment doesn't go there, and the reason my amendment doesn't go there is because I know there's no support for that in either of the major parties. But what I am happy to report is that the uh, the Labor Party does support disclosures, um, uh, a disclosure threshold down to one thousand dollars. I'll just read from their website. Uh, they say donations over. 14,300 are subject to disclosure under the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918. This is the reason we require your personal details when making a donation. However, the Australian Labor Party has a policy of disclosing all donations uh, above $1,000. So I'll be very surprised. Well, maybe I won't be surprised because I gave the opportunity yet last night for the Labor Party to vote for their own policy, but, but they decided not to. So, um, well, Senator Scar, to be fair, on your side of the chamber, you need to be looking at your own policies, and you should be adopting these policies because they're about transparency. They're about confidence in our de democratic system. So, you know, I am up here having a go at the Labor Party because they're not supporting their own policy, but I'll, I'll happily have a go at the Liberal Party in saying it should be your policy. It ought to be your policy, and I hope you take that to the party room uh, because I know. Uh, you are a senator of great integrity, uh, and uh, whilst you might not be able to express your views outside the party lines, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that you would, would share my, my views. So, um, I hope that when my amendment is moved, that the Labor Party will, in fact, support their own policy. So let's uh, let's cross our fingers and see what happens there. The other amendment uh, that I'll be moving during the committee stage is one where. Uh, we know that people come to, to, to dinners with either uh, minister, prime ministers, ministers or influential politicians, and they'll pay a ticket price of $10,000 to do so, to have a private audience with, with, uh, uh, with a, uh, a minister or someone influential. And I, you know, I, I, Whilst that practice may take place, I think you have to be open about it. I think you have to be open about, uh, about doing that. I, you know, I know there are a lot of companies that have policies that say you can't make political donations. So they rock up to these events and they pay a ticket price. It's not a donation from their perspective. It's a ticket price. Now, no one, no one uh, is ever going to front up to a, a, me a, a meal and get a $10,000 plate. That's, that's not going to happen. That's not what's happening here. People turn up and they get a nice meal. There's no question the, the meal would be nice. The wine might be nice. But, but uh, well, Senator Scar, the nice thing is you can come around and visit me at any time and you don't have to pay a cent. And that's the way I like it. That's the way I like it for everyone. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's, and that's the way it should be. You shouldn't have to buy any access at all. Uh, so, Senator Scar, you are welcome at any stage to, uh, to pop around to my office and even uh, for us to, to go and have a dinner at some stage. I, and I'd, I'd, I'd likely enjoy—I'm sure I would enjoy that. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's what we have happening at the moment. We have people turning up to dinners, and the, and the price is reflective of who's gone to the— uh, you know, who's gone to the, uh, uh, or who's sitting at the head of the table? If it's the PM, it's a big price. If it's a cabinet minister, it's slightly less. If it's a uh, an assistant minister, less again. If it's a hopeful, it's uh, you know, it's less again. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing. Um, I'm not sure where, where Senator Scar's placing his price, uh, his price point. But uh, yeah, that's wrong, guys. You've got to. You, if, if that's going to happen, disclose it. Okay, that's what we need to have happen. We need to have uh, people. We need to have the rules in place that require disclosure. 
I'm not asking people to go outside the rules. I think the, the rules are established and everyone um, uh, is, you know, therefore plays within the rules, but the rules are wrong and we've got to change those rules. So I'll be giving the opportunity for uh, people to vote for my second amendment, which you didn't talk about yesterday because there was a gag debate after a dirty deal was done by the Labor Party. Actually, a dirty and, and actually really silly deal. One of the things they got out of the deal yesterday was to uh, get the political campaign or the, to, to get uh, voter ID knocked out of the, out of the uh, legislation list uh, it, at, at the expense of charities. At the expense of charities. That's what happened yesterday, if anyone didn't notice. The Labor Party did a deal with the coalition. To, uh, to, at great harm to charities, so that voter ID was taken off the legislative table. Now, actually, if they'd simply done the numbers, I had indicated I wasn't supporting it. Jackie Lambie had indicated, Senator Lambie had indicated she wasn't supporting it, and Senator Griff wasn't interested in supporting it this side of an election. That's for sure. So the the, the government didn't have the numbers. So the so the so the Labor Party sold out charities. They sold out charities to get something that actually was that, 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 that was already the case, and that was voter ID was not going to make it through the parliament. The voter ID legislation. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't talk about that last night because it was, it was all it was all gagged, and therefore I couldn't talk also about my my amendment. So just to describe what my amendment does, it basically says if you have a dinner. I'm not trying to stop anyone having a dinner. If you have a dinner and the, uh, the, the proceeds of the, the evening are uh, a reasonable margin above uh, what the cost of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the delivery of the service, then you have to declare the, uh, uh, the, the, co the ticket price as a... Uh, as the, as a um, as a political donation, and that's the way it should be. So let's bring some transparency to this whole regime. A whole bunch of people just lost confidence in in uh, in uh, this building, uh, both uh, here and the other place, because they feel as though uh, we can be bought. And uh, uh, part of the reason they feel that way is because of all the secret ways in which. Uh, political parties raise their money, and we've got to change that. Senator, mm. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Uh, Senator Askew, sorry, I'm Acting Deputy President. Uh, it would be re remiss of me not to, in this contribution, talk about the, the general issue of, of electoral reform. Uh, so I, I do commend uh, the government and I, I commend all parties who, who want to ensure that our democracy is, is the best that it can be. And, and I, I acknowledge Senator Patrick's contribution there and acknowledge his, his interest uh, in, in certain areas, in particular areas of, of, of transparency in relating to how government works, but also how, how you know, political parties operate. And I want to stand up in defence of political parties. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we talk about political parties, and this, this is the issue, is that everybody thinks that political parties are these powerful, well-oiled, well-funded uh, machines. When in fact, I can talk about the Liberal National Party in Queensland. And the Liberal National Party in Queensland has a membership of 12 or 13,000 people. That's the party. It's, it's voluntary members of the party. Our headquarters uh, in, in Albion has uh, less than 10 full-time staff in it. We've got a, a receptionist. Hello, Michelle. Uh, we've got, we've got a you know, state director. Hello, Lincoln. Uh, we've got someone who helps uh, you know, Lincoln. Hello, Declan. And we've got other people who work in compliance. Ten, ten staff. Now, I'm not going to bash the unions and pick on the unions. But every union in Queensland, every single union in Queensland, has more staff individually as a union than the Liberal National Party. So my party is not some well-funded, well-oiled, powerful electoral machine. It is a party of volunteers. 
It is a party of 13,000 individuals who have joined up. It is a party of, of tens of thousands of very strong supporters who may not uh, uh, sign the dotted line on a membership form but are happy to help out on polling day and happy to deliver material and spread the message. And it is hundreds of thousands of people who vote for the Liberal National Party. So I, I, I'm sometimes agog at, at, at sometimes other, and I'm not, at, at other politicians who represent parties in this place when they attack my party. And to me, it shows their, their failure to understand what it means to, to be a member of a political party. It means that I, as, a, as, as someone who has an interest in the future of, of my, my local area, I live on the Darling Downs. So I will go and join the Warwick branch of, of the Liberal National Party and, and I go to meetings that, that are held in the CWA Hall in Warwick. Uh, and occasionally I might go to Southern Electric Council meetings because we're in the State Electorate of, of, of Southern Downs, sort of with Stanthorpe, Warwick and, 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 and Gundawindi. And I'll go along there with other people with, with similar interests. And we're in the federal electorate of Maranoa. Now, Maranoa is 42 per cent of Queensland. It goes from, from eff effectively uh, Cunningham's Gap, uh, which sort of borders the Southern Downs and, and the Scenic Rim, goes from the border from New South Wales, goes to, to Kingaroy, and then goes straight up to, to Longreach. 42 per cent of Queensland. One electorate in Queensland is, is larger than, than many countries in Europe. And we have people there, you know, from Kingaroy and Warwick to Longreach, who are very different, have different perspectives uh, uh, on life, but share beliefs and values in relation to what they think is best for their country. So they join a political party. And I'm sure it's the same for, 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 other, for other political parties. And and what, what annoys me and frustrates me is that we want to burden this is a general comment we want to burden volunteers. We want to burden people uh, with all this compliance. You know what the worst job to do in a political party is as, at a branch level or at a state, state level? Thank you, Senator Scott. The worst job in any political party, in the Liberal National Party, in any party unit is to be treasurer. Avoid it at all costs. It is a nightmare of a job. And I'm not just saying that because I got four per cent in maths and, and can't add up. It is because it is because uh, thank you, Senator Payne. I'm going to ignore that. Um, um, I, I don't want to have to take my, my, my boots off to, to, to count. But it, it it annoys me that that how much burden, how much burdens are put on treasurers because it is such a terrible job. Suddenly, you have people who want to, to make their local community, Warwick, Southern Downs, Maranoa, a better place to live, and they've got to come to terms with, with legend, all these streams and pages and feet, full of, 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 feet high full of, of, of documentation. We should be making it easier for people to get involved in politics. We should be making it easier for people to join political parties and get involved, not making it harder. And what we're seeing across this country is this, this distaste for political parties, that the media think that anyone who joins a political party is in it for their own gain, uh, who is in it to, to make themselves richer and better. And I, and I look at—and Senator Scar is here, Senator Davey and, and, and Senator Payne—and I look at the branch members of my party units, I, I look at the, you know, the cars in the car park. You know, they're normal people. They run businesses. Some are retired. You know, some people want to become politicians. Some people want to run, run, to be, run for council. They're not rich people. They're not in it for themselves. They're in it because they want to make society a better place. And I think we should always support people who want to join political parties. Because unfortunately, a narrative has developed in this country where you can join a third interest group and suddenly you are, you are so holy, you are so pure, because you join this third interest group. You join some local um, green action group and suddenly you are the, 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 you know, the first cousin of the Dalai Lama. You know, whereas you join the local political party and you, you're seen as, as, as Satan's second child. 
and I think that is wrong. And I am proud to stand up for the political parties. I am proud to stand up for, for branch members across this country who join a political party. Now, I would encourage people to join my party, the Liberal National Party, lnp.org.au, if you're interested. Uh, download the membership form. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy to join. And come along to, to, a, to a branch meeting, uh, please. And please come back to a second one after that. Um, and, and get involved, because there is, a, there is a, a real fight on in this country in terms of the battle of ideas. And I know someone on the extremes, on the extreme right and on, on the extreme left, talk about the, the convergence. Well, they don't use the word convergence theory. I will. The convergence theory of politics, that the, 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 the Labor Party and the Liberal National Party are coming together. And I, I strongly disagree with, with that theory of politics. I think at the next election there will be a strong choice between who will be in the lodge. Now, I strongly, strongly oppose Mr Albanese becoming Prime Minister. I don't want him to get into the lodge. I don't want him to go to Curtin World and decide how he's going to redecorate uh, the interior furnishings of the lodge. And I, I don't judge him on, 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 on his interior decorating taste or his sartorial fashion or anything like that. What scares me about Mr Albanese is the policies that, that he will take to, to the next election. Because we heard here in the Senate yesterday, uh, we heard uh, Senator Rice talk about a, a power-sharing arrangement between the Labor Party and the Greens. Now that should scare people who are listening in, in uh, today. A power-sharing arrangement. So that's that's code for a coalition government. So the next choice of the, the the choice of the next election will come down to a choice between Scott Morrison leading a coalition between uh, the National Party. And, and the Liberal Party, a coalition that has served this country for, for so long and for so well, and particularly over the last two years, has kept Australians safe, or a coalition between Anthony Albanese and, and the Greens. And that is a real choice, because if you do change this government—we're talking about political parties here—it means that the Labor Party will be in power with the Greens. And, and this country will, will, will change, in my view, change uh, for the worse. So it is important that we do defend those Australians who join political parties. It is important that we allow people who want to get involved in politics to not be ostracised, to not be tainted, to not allow the media to, to say to, to Dawn Scrimmager, uh, who was an honorary life member, who, who Senator Scar will know well, to, to, to Dawn Scrimmager, who is the doyen of, of the Warwick branch of the Liberal National Party, to say to her that because you have spent the last 30, 40 years of your life supporting the National Party and the, and the Liberal National Party, you are a bad person. That is rubbish. I think Dawn Scrimmager is a good person. I think all people who join political parties, even those who, who, who join the parties opposite me here, I think they do so because they want the country to go in a certain direction. They're not doing it because they want to, gain, to, to, to personally gain. And, and I think we do need to redirect the conversation in Australia, Acting Deputy President, away from this tainting of, of party politics. We're not 17th century England, where you had very loose coalitions of, of people who would come together based actually on personal interest or on single, single issues. But we do have a choice between cohesive ideologies. On this side, it is of, of smaller government. It is of lower taxes. It is of, of greater freedom. Uh, I'll let the, the left uh, talk for themselves, but you know, on that side, it is for, for a government having an increasing role in, in people's lives. Essentially, it's we believe in freedom and, 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 and the other mob don't, is, is how, is how I put it in, in uh, McGrath speak. So I do, do support uh, you know, legislation that, that will, will, will bring about a, a level playing field between political parties and, and other, other interest groups. I will also you know, do support legislation that, that does improve transparency. 
but we need to, need to make sure that, that we're not thinking about some political party who have their headquarters in a, a gleaming high-rise you know, in Collins Street in, in Melbourne. It was big fact. That's not a political party. Thank you, thank you, Senator Scar. Yeah, the Liberal National Party headquarters are in Albion at the Albion Five Ways. They're above an Indian uh, restaurant. It's a good restaurant. It's a very good restaurant. Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Um, and yes, we did sell uh, Bjork Peterson House, and and we got a good return on Bjork Peterson House, and then we uh, bought a place. I'm not going to go into the property history of the Liberal National Party, Senator Davey. You've put me off. I think that was interjections always disorderly. Um, that was particularly disorderly. But the, the Liberal National Party. Uh, has a very, very basic headquarters. But what makes my party, our party, stronger on this side of, of the chamber is that it is the membership. Those people who will pay their $100 or so each year um, to, to, to come along to a branch meeting. And, and what it is, it's, yes, it's, you know, it's the ratification of the minutes of the previous meeting. Yes, it's, it's um, a discussion amongst people, but what it is, it's a coming together of, of people who have a shared belief system and a shared value system. And what we should be doing as a parliament is making it easier for people to stay in a political party, making it easier for people to join a political party and making it easier for them to want to stay in that political party and continue to participate in politics and continue to participate in party politics. I will always stand up strongly for party politics because I think it is through that stability of, of party politics, of, of that great split between those on the left and those on the right, of that there is a choice between who governs each state or, or, or territory or who governs this, this country, that there is a choice uh, uh, for, for Australians to make, there is a choice for Queenslanders to, to make. And, and that choice is one. That I, that I believe that the coming federal election is going to be so important for how this country go, goes forward. And, and I'm someone who is very, very strongly supportive of further electoral reform. You know, yesterday in, in this chamber, I, I did introduce a private member's bill on optional preferential voting and, and the Robson rotation, because I believe that will make uh, it fairer for voters so they can decide who to vote for or not vote for. I believe the Robson rotation will make it fairer for candidates, so candidates do not benefit from, from, from the donkey vote as such. And I hope that this Senate, I hope that this parliament will give due consideration to that bill because that bill will make the coming federal election, election that much more fairer for all Australians. And I also do hope that, that voter ID is brought into this country sooner rather than later. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank all those in this chamber who have contributed to this debate. And it's a bill that builds upon uh, reforms to funding and disclosure regime that have been applied over recent years to improve the consistency uh, of the treatment of all political actors. Uh, it will extend the application of the existing foreign donations framework to current sitting members of the House of Representatives and Senators from the period in which they have formally announced their intention to seek re-election through the full length of their parliamentary term. It will require parliamentarians who receive gifts for a federal purpose directly, and that is for the purpose of incurring electoral expenditure or creating or communicating communicating electoral matter to lodge an annual return to the AEC relating to gifts received during a financial year uh, and extend the period for which a person is taken to be a candidate by an additional six months for the purpose of the disclosure period for candidate and Senate group returns and for restrictions on receiving foreign donations. This will support the continued integrity of Australia's electoral system by ensuring that Australia's world-class electoral funding and disclosure regime is consistent uh, and it continues to provide um, appropriate balance of transparency for Australian voters. Uh, once again, I thank those for their contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bill be read a second at time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to electoral and financial disclosure matters and for related purposes. As there is an amendment moved by Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie, the Senate will now resolve into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. And Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I move uh, Amendment 1 on sheet uh, 1527. Uh, just uh, so that everyone understands that uh, 
what this amendment is about. I did talk about it in my, uh, in my second reading speech. This amendment basically uh, and very simply lowers the discretion, uh, sorry, the, the disclosure threshold from 13,800 to 1,000 dollars, and uh, uh, that I think is a proper transparency measure. I note that it is the Labor Party policy that there should be uh, disclosures below, uh, below, uh, or disclosures above $1,000. And so I'm looking forward to their support uh, when we divide on this. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity in committee stage to just make a few remarks about uh, the way that my party has approached the electoral reforms that have been before this chamber. Uh, over recent days before turning to the substance of the amendment proposed by Senator Patrick. Um, the government, of course, has had an entire term to uh, progress reforms to our electoral system had they wanted to, but they have, as is so often the case with this government, deferred, delayed, done very little and then introduced a set of bills very late in the piece. Now, the centre of those bills, as everyone will be aware, was a proposal for voters to have to provide ID at the polling booth. There were other measures uh, proposed in these bills, including reforms to the obligations for those who engaged in political campaigning. Labor was quite clear about both of those measures in particular. We did not support voter ID because of the impacts it would have on marginalised people. And our view is that Australian democracy is for everyone. It's important that everyone has an opportunity to participate. It is especially important that people on the margins of society have no impediments to their participation. And it was on that basis that we did not support the voter ID reforms proposed by the government. And we made that very clear, publicly very clear. And I'll come back to that. We also didn't support the approach taken to disclose disclosures for political campaigners for a range of reasons uh, which we set out at the time. Now, I make the obvious observation that, regrettably, I am giving this speech from this side of the chamber. It would be my preference to give the speech from the other side of the chamber and, indeed, at the next election, I hope that the Australian public looks at this lazy, tired government that are presently occupying the other side and decides to kick them out. Because if we want real electoral reform, if we want to protect our democracy through establishing a national anti-corruption commission, through improving disclosure arrangements for donations, through a raft of other measures to make sure that as many Australians as possible are enrolled and participating in our democratic system, then I'm afraid we'll have to wait for a Labor government because there's no energy or enthusiasm for that on that side of the chamber. But here we are. We're not yet at an election. We're here in this chamber. And the fact that I am giving this speech from this side of the chamber has other implications. Because when legislation comes here, we don't automatically have a majority in this place to stop it. It hasn't been at all clear what the position of many members of the crossbench has been on the matters that I've just referred to. And I'm not going to name individual crossbench members. How they behave here is up to them. But Labor will always do our best to get the best outcome for our democracy in this chamber, in this place for scrutiny and review. And we are pleased that after conversations with us and no doubt conversations with others, the government withdrew its voter ID bill. We are also pleased that the government agreed to change the threshold for disclosure for political campaigners and made other changes to that legislation. We don't like that legislation, but that is a better outcome than what was proposed by the government, legislation which we had said consistently we opposed. As I say, it really wasn't clear what the crossbench were going to do on that question. And I run through that because I do object to the characterisation placed on Labor's decision making by a number of contributors to this debate. 
there is in fact no shame at all in negotiating towards an outcome that enfranchises, enfranchises, enfranchises marginalised people. There's no shame in negotiating and advocating against a bill that would absolutely have excluded many First Nations people from participation. And there's no shame in negotiating amendments to a bill that imposes obligations on charities and not-for-profits to improve it. Because as far as we could tell, based on the stated positions from people up on the crossbench, those things were going to come through the chamber unamended. And it's on that basis that Labor seeks to improve legislation here. And it's all very well to, make, to throw barbs later, after the fact. But if people had wanted to really, really oppose and block these things, then they might have made their intentions clearer a little sooner. I'll turn now to the amendment proposed by Senator Patrick. Um, as Senator Patrick points out, we've always had an, a policy that supports increased transparency of donations and lowering the disclosure threshold. It was, in fact, a Hawke Labor government that first introduced a donations disclosure regime. Great example. Labor government improved transparency in democratic arrangements. And here's the contrast. It's the Liberals under John Howard that jacked that up, jacked up the level of disclosure and linked it to inflation. Tens of thousands of dollars to a political party and you don't have to disclose it under this crowd. And that's not our position. We have two bills currently before this Senate to lower the disclosure threshold to $1,000 and introduce real-time disclosure of, of donations. And that would improve things. That would make a difference. And we fully support the principle of amending the disclosure threshold. Mm -hmm. However, we won't be supporting the amendments of Senators Patrick and Lambie today. We believe that despite the election eve changes to the Electoral Act introduced by the government, Genuine electoral reform should be done in a consultative manner. It should be done by reviewing the operation of the Commonwealth Electoral Act more broadly rather than through these kinds of last-minute amendments, and it's on that basis that we won't be providing support today. Senator Patrick. Well, I'm very disappointed but not surprised. So, but let's summarise what Senator McAllister said, is that um, we support uh, Senator Patrick's uh, amendment in principle. We, we've got our own bills in this place that of course sit as private members' bills and won't, get, uh, won't necessarily get through this place, and certainly if they get through this place, won't get through the other place. Uh, we've got a piece of legislation here that the government wants to pass for which we can uh, attach this relatively simple amendment, lowering the, the disclosure threshold to $1,000. And there is a provision in this uh, amendment to make sure that the um, that, that doesn't burden people. If someone makes a $5,000 donation, they don't have to uh, themselves disclose it. Only the political party does. Uh, so it's been carefully crafted. Only if you uh, have a, a, are a person and you make a donation above $10,000 do you also have to uh, contact the AEC. Uh, the political parties have to disclose anything above $1,000. So, yeah, I just find it really difficult. There's, a, there's the proposition here that. Uh, we, we, we could change the disclosure threshold to $1,000. It is Labor policy. They've got bills in place, but they don't want to do anything because they're not in government. This shows why you don't deserve to be in government. You've got to stand up for what you believe in. You've got to cast your vote in a way that moves things in a better direction. Perfect is the enemy of the good. This is a good amendment. You say so yourself, you're going to vote against it, which just tells me you're disingenuous. You don't actually believe. And everyone who's looking at the Labor Party now and, and trying to work out whether they vote for them ought to understand that they don't have the courage in opposition to give effect to their own policies. Now, of course, when they get into government, what's the co what confidence do we have that they would then implement them themselves? What confidence do we have that the Labor Party who are shying away from supporting their own policy uh, when an opportunity arises would in fact uh, implement those policies in government. In order to be uh, in government, you have to demonstrate first that you are a strong opposition, and you are not. You are a weak opposition. You can simply vote for this 
and make a change. In a, in, in, it's not perfect, but it is a change that uh, brings about good and is your own policy. Duplicity, that's what we've got here. And weak, weak leadership. Mr Albanese ought to be uh, picking up the phone to Senator Wong and saying, you have to vote for this because this is good policy. This is the direction we want to take the country in. But no, we're going to sit, we're going to sit here and say it's all going to be much better when we're in government. You know what? I saw this happen in, in, just prior to the last election uh, in relation to ISDS. Uh, against its own policy, the Labor Party waves through some ISDS provisions on a trade um, a free trade agreement related piece of legislation saying we're going to undo this when we get into government. And guess what? You didn't get into government. You didn't get into government. And there's no guarantee you will this time now. But if you vote for my amendment, you will bring about change that, that uh, you know is good change. But you have no courage. You have no conviction. And what, what, what's happening here is people are seeing how hollow and how shallow the Labor Party is in opposition, and that would give rise to the question, why would they vote for you in, in, uh, in an election when you, when you exhibit those characteristics? When you exhibit those characteristics, there's no excuse for you not, not voting for this, Labor. There is no excuse at all for you not voting for this. And I, and, and I hope that, uh, that your colleagues, as they uh, are listening to this debate, because it will end up being a mickey, uh, for those that don't know what one of those is that is listening, that's when we know that uh, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party are voting together, so not everyone needs to turn up from their side on the vote. We saw that yesterday when this, when this vote was put. I think there were about two or three Labor Party people that were in the, that were in the chamber two or three Labor Party people that were in the chamber, because I think most of them are rightfully ashamed at the position taken whereby the, 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 the Labor Party doesn't even back its own policies. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, get on with this. Well, let's put this amendment to, to a vote. Let's see how the Labor Party uh, behave. Did you want to speak? Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. The, the Greens will be voting for these amendments from Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie to lower the donations disclosure threshold because we don't think that big money should be secretly running this place. And I share the concern that's just been expressed about the so-called opposition not actually voting for what is in fact their policy. Now, I can't stand this government. I think their agenda is woeful. I think it hurts communities. It hurts the planet. I want a change of government. It is very difficult when the opposition refuses to oppose and refuses to take a stand on what they say is their policy. I want you to be better. I think the whole country wants you to be better. I want to see you in government, but I want you to stand for something. This small, this small target strategy just means you actually don't stand for anything. And that, that's not what the country needs. We've got an awful government here that's used successive bills to try and silence uh, charities, to try to suppress candidates from running, to try to suppress voters, which thankfully they've now dumped because they weren't going to get it through because the crossbench uh, stood firm on that. And we now see a very mild amendment that just says disclose all of this money that's getting tipped into your coffers by big corporates. That all, that's all it does. It doesn't even say don't take the dirty money. It just says disclose when you get it. Of course, the Greens would want it to go further, and our bill says you shouldn't actually be able to donate massive wads of cash to political parties because it corrupts the system. But I'm extremely disappointed to hear that the opposition will not be voting for what is actually their own policy. That's exactly why you need the Greens and, frankly, the crossbench in here. It looks like we'll be in a minority government next election. I hope that's the case because I want this government gone. They've been absolutely awful. But you will need the Greens and strong crossbenchers to make sure that the Labor Party actually stands for something and delivers on something. They're choosing today to not even deliver on their own policy. A small target strategy means you stand for nothing. 
So the question is that amendment on sheet 1527 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. So the question is that amendment moved on sheet 1527 by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the no to the nose to the left. And I appoint Senator McCarthy for the nose and Senator McKim for the eyes. <laughs>
So the result of the division is ayes 9, noes 24, so the question is resolved in the negative. Senators, we remain in committee stage, so we will allow everyone to return to their seats, or Senator Patrick to move his next amendment. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, um, Madam Chair. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to find my running sheet. Uh, um, I move. Uh, uh, I seek leave to move uh, Amendment One and Two on sheet one five two eight together. Leave granted. Leave's granted. Thank you very much. Now, just to, again to give the detail of this particular amendment, uh, what this amendment seeks to do is make transparent when people turn up to a dinner and they pay a large fee, uh, a fee that well exceeds the cost of the dinner, then that must be disclosed as a donation. And the threshold is 115 per cent. So if you have 100 people turn up to a dinner and, uh, uh, and the Cost, the, 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 so the amount of money raised is uh, is, is ten thousand um, dollars. If they're paying hundred dollars each, then uh, the, the shared cost of that dinner would be would be hundred dollars. Just dividing it through. If in fact you make twenty thousand dollars, then the then the cost of the, uh, the then the, the people who participate who pay uh, more than uh, the, the, the the proper cost for the dinner. Will actually have to be registered as a as a, a donor to the party. Okay, so no more ten thousand dollar dinners with the prime minister without at least that being disclosed. Okay, Australians have a right to know um, if someone turns up to a dinner and are paying uh, to to sit at a table with the prime minister. Uh, you know, they they might have uh, ten or twenty people there, all paying ten thousand dollars. And no one can realistically suggest that, that those uh, people are receiving a meal that's worth that amount of money. They're actually buying, buying access, and that ought to be disclosed. Now, it may be the case that this is disclosed in its, uh, uh, through the political uh, system. Uh, of course, it wouldn't hit the current threshold of uh, $14,300, but this amendment would make sure that indeed it was disclosed. Okay, and that, uh, so I'm not suggesting parties may be doing something untoward in terms of, of, of not necessarily at least uh, registering these as donations, but uh, uh, the, the, the public have a right to know who is paying for access to prime ministers, ministers, influential senators and MPs. So I hope that uh, the chamber will support this. Uh, I hope, you know, again, the Labor Party says that they're interested in electoral reform. I note that in the last division, uh, which was about uh, voting for uh, Labor's policy, only three Labor senators turned up to vote because they're ashamed. They're ashamed of the conduct of the leaders uh, of uh, their party in this chamber in not supporting their own policy of saying, let's sort that out when we're in government. So let's just see whether or not there's a change in, in relation to this. Let's see how many uh, Labor senators stand up for transparency uh, in this next vote. Senator Waters. Uh, <coughs> Chair, uh, as for the last amendment, the Greens will be supporting this amendment. Anything that increases the transparency of the influence that money has on this building and the decisions that emanate for it is a good thing. We'd, we would like to see donations capped at $1,000 for everybody. We do not think that big money should play a role in our democracy. Um, this donation doesn't do that, but it Senator is a small Waters, step in the right direction. So the Greens will be supporting it. It being 11.15, the committee will now report progress. And I will hand to the president. Thank you, Senator Askew. Are there any notices of a motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Rolls. Uh, pursuant uh, to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number four, standing in my name for four sitting days after today. 
proposing the disallowance of the legislation exemption and other med matters amendment 2021 measures number one regulations 2021 and business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for 12 sitting days after today proposing the disallowance of the taxation administration data sharing relevant COVID-19 business support program declaration 2021. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. Mr. President, I pre present the 14th report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee and seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the report be adopted. The question is the Minister. Move. Um, I seek leave to move the two circulated government amendments together. Uh, and uh, um, is, we'll just see if leave yep. is granted for that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Senator McKim, yes. Leave. Just, if I could just be clear, um, President, we're not seeking to deny leave for that, but we will be asking that the vote put separately be put separately on those two amendments. Minister, leave is granted. Okay. Thank you. Um, I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add. And in respect of the corporation's amendment improving outcomes for litigation funding participants 2021, the bill be referred immediately to the Economic Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 3rd of February 2022. And I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add and the following bills be referred not be referred to committee. Religious discrimination bill, religious discrimination consequential amendments bill, human rights legislation amendment bill. Thank you. Minister Senator Rice. Yes, I wish to speak to, to that amendment and in opposition to that amendment regarding the religious discrimination bills. It is quite outrageous that here are we, the Senate, the House of Review, we have a Senate Legislation Committee that is set up to have legislation referred to it. And here is the government explicitly saying that an incredibly far-reaching bill a bill that would have impact on people right across the country, a bill that would increase discrimination, not reduce discrimination, is not being referred to committee. Of course, I mean, I have an alternative amendment to the selection of bills to once again say that we should be referring the religious discrimination bill to the Senate Legislation, Legal and Con Legislation Committee. It's a government-controlled committee. You know, we not, it's, it's not as if it's anything extraordinary. It is just what the government should be doing. We, we want a referral to the Senate Legal and uh, Con. Order. Senator Waters, are you on I your can't feet on hear a point of order? Senator, yes, the point of order is I can't hear what our speaker 30 centimetres away from me is saying over the interjections. I, I, I agree. There was far too many interjections in the chamber. I call all senators to order. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thank you, President. So, you know, just for the sake of the interjections, the position of the Greens is very clear that the religious discrimination bill should be referred to a Senate committee and the reporting date should be at a time that gives gives the community ample opportunity to engage with it. As we, know, as we know, since we discussed this this time last week, the Attorney-General made the decision to send it off to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, where submissions have to be in by the 21st of December, right in the lead up to Christmas, less than three weeks, and there are three hearings, one of which is on the 21st of December, the other two on the 13th and 14th of January. That is not the time for the community to be able to engage with a bill of this consequence. It is totally disrespectful. Right across the board, no matter which community member you are talking about, whether it's those that want to see um, this bill to continue or whether those like us who feel that this is very bad legislation. Regardless, it is important legislation and there should be ample opportunity for the community to be able to engage with it. And in particular, because we know from the commentary that has been about this bill over the last weeks is there is a lot of contradiction as to what this bill does. We have the government saying that it's not going to increase discrimination against people with disabilities, against women, against LGBTIQA plus people. And then we have got very eminent legal experts 
who say, yes, it will, and that it is the most extreme overreach of the government to be overriding state and territory anti-discrimination provisions. It is a very significant piece of legislation, and our reading of it, which we look forward we want to have discussed in a proper, um, appropriate committee process, is that it is it will have the ability to increase discrimination, and particularly through its overriding of state and territory anti-discrimination legislation. So what we are asking for is the Senate to be doing its job the way that it should be, to be having proper processes with proper timelines so that people get the opportunity to contribute to our work and to be able to show, to be able to, to then end up with legislation that everyone is clear about what it does and then we can decide where we stand for or against. So look, I ask the government once again, I mean, this is what the Senate should be doing. We should be having a referral to the Senate committee and it should be a, ref a referral that gives people the time to contribute. It is all that it is a, a, a small thing and it's what the community would be, would be expecting, Especially, I mean, whether it's people of faith, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's women, whether it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer people in Australia. There is going to be a huge amount of interest in this bill. When I spoke to the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights Secretariat yesterday, they were overwhelmed with the thought of how they were going to cope with the number of submissions in the short time frame that had been given to them. It is proper process for a bill like this to go to a Senate committee to be properly considered so we can be making sure that we are actually introducing legislation that is going to be decreasing discrimination rather than in increasing discrimination. I also now want to move my amendment as an amendment, uh, as an amendment to, the, to the government's amendment um, that is on the notice that has been distributed that is in respect of the Religious Discrimination Bill 2021, the Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill 2021 and the Human Rights time. Legislation Amendment Senator, Bill that Senator, the provisions Senator of the bill Rice, be re Senator Rice, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Just to make a, f a few comments, we've made it really clear um, about our unhappiness unha over the unilateral referral of the Religious Discrimination Bill to the Joint Standing Committee on Human Rights. Um, Labor believes there should be a genuine inquiry that allowed both. MPs and senators to participate, and our preference was for a joint select committee to examine this issue before it's considered further in the House or the Senate, but we um, were unsuccessful with that approach to the Morrison government. We also participated and supported various um, inquiry referrals to the Senate on several occasions during uh, this sitting period, and I think we've, those votes have been tied in every instance and lost. Um, so we, haven't been able to refer it to a, a Senate committee. All of those options were rejected by the Morrison government. We think it's really unfortunate that this resulted in deadlocked votes in this place and no results. Um, you know, but this is the approach that the Morrison government has decided to take on this issue. We do think that uh, we should have uh, been able to reach agreement across the chamber with everybody about how to proceed with an inquiry. And it's most unfortunate that the government has. Uh, been unwilling or unable uh, to work with the Senate on that. We don't believe this position is going to change. We have been talking, I think, across chambers um, and across multiple people to convince the government to take a different path, and, and the government is refusing to do so. And so uh, we will be supporting the non referral uh, amendment by the government, and we will also be working to make sure that the referral to the Joint Statutory Committee on Human Rights is a genuine inquiry and properly examines this very important issue before full consideration by the parliament. I will put the Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. I just wanted to um, state the Jackie Lambie Network's position on this is the state of Tasmania um, doesn't want to have a bite of this. They're very happy with the way uh, our, our laws are down there. They are concerned that the laws, whichever way you move them, are going to come over the top of um, Tasmania. Um, and I, so I can tell you, my, we won't be changing our vote. I will not be supporting this. Uh, and I've certainly haven't had any indication from the Premier of Tasmania that uh, uh, he supports it either, let alone the people of Tasmania. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, uh, with the indulgence of the Chamber, um, I am prepared to move an amendment to the Selection of Bills Committee to refer 
uh, the three bills that I have just requ uh, requested not be referred, the Religious Discrimination Bill, the Religi Religious Discrimination Consequential Amendments Bill, the Human Rights Legislation Amendment Bill, I am happy to refer to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee with a reporting date of 4 February 2022, as we now know the sitting calendar for 2022. Uh, if, the, uh, if the Chamber is so inclined to support that, I will move it. Okay, so we'll take that as an amendment to Senator Rice's date if it is agreed. You can speak to that. Well, Senator as Gallagher. I understand it, that is the government putting back the position where we, this started um, over a week ago. Um, yeah, we did, because it's not, it doesn't allow for a genuine and um, proper inquiry. That was the position we took then. And we, remember, put to you that we would like an extra fortnight so that the inquiry was not conducted during Christmas and New Year, and you rejected it. So I think you're trying to be a bit clever here. Yeah, and cute after a week of deadlock. If the government is serious about this, I don't have instructions on it myself. Um, we would, uh, I would just seek a bit of time. I think we need to consult with others, considering how this issue has been um, progressed and the level of interest in this referral. I don't think, without proper instructions and the ability uh, to consider this, that we can deal with this matter right now. I would ask that we come back to it at some point through the formal business or just before we start motions. Well, I'm in the hands of the chamber. There is a question before the chair, Senator Wright. Oh, look, I was just wanting to make a contribution. Similarly, um, the issue of the timing is critical because the 4th of February, as per the, you know, the, the inquiry that's underway, the, the Joint um, Standing Committee, does not give the time for people to be able to contribute because it means that all of the activity is happening during the summer period, during the time when people are on holidays and they deserve to be on holidays after the year that we've just had, and, including the Secretariat, absolutely. And so I think, I mean, I will, uh, if, you know, given Senator Gallagher's suggestion that we defer this, I would be happy to support deferring if we, if we could to seek further advice. But I think the problem of the, the 4th of February stands as it stood last week, which is why we felt that uh, I mean, the, a, a reporting date of mid-February is the absolute minimum that is needed for a bill of this import, and that's where I suspect that um, we will end up. Well, there, I mean, there is a question before the chair. I'm in the hands of the chamber. If anyone wants to seek to do anything different, otherwise I'm going to put the question. Thank you. We can deal with the other amendments. Um, I'm, I'm happy with that, and then seek to come back to that one if that's acceptable to the chamber. Okay. So the Senate has a, will uh, defer consideration of these particular amendments to a later time. Uh, and we will return to government amendment number one uh, uh, on sheet GOV1. So moved by Senator Rustin. Is everybody clear where we're at? All right. I will, unless there's any further contributions, I will put uh, that uh, motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now Senator Dunium. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Hanson, uh, I'll move the amendment circulated in her name, which reads At the end of the motion, add and in respect of the COVID 19 vaccination status prevention of discrimination bill 2021, the bill be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 7th of February. 2022. All right. I will move that unless anyone wishes to speak to it. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson, you wish to speak to that. Yes, I do. Th thank you, you very much. You have the call. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this referral of the COVID night vaccination prevention of discrimination bill 2021 that I've put up has been denied by this chamber on a couple of occasions. 
the people of Australia have shown that they do want to have a voice, they do want to have a say. I don't believe that the people of this um, chamber really understand the hurt and pain what they are causing the people of Australia. That is quite evident with the rallies that have been conducted around Australia. They've come out in their hundreds of thousands and will continue to do so. These people are not extremists. These are ordinary mums and dads, teachers, doctors, nurses, political work in the fire brigades, police, just ordinary everyday workers, those in retail outlet outlets, those who are construction workers. All these people have been denied their basic human rights to make a, a choice of having a vaccination or not. These people are now losing their jobs, their livelihoods, and are so distraught, distressed, hurt, because they are being told what to do with their own bodies. We don't have a pandemic. The last strain that they're saying has come into the country, the Omicron, is actually being brought in by someone who's been double vaxxed. That's right, double vaxxed. I don't know if you actually know the figures that's come out of Britain, is people who are in hospital with COVID are, are greater, those that have been double vaxxed by 192 to those with 112 who aren't vaxxed. So you see your push to actually have people vaccinated is only causing them more health issues. We've had 80,000 people that have actually recorded a adverse reaction to vaccinations through the TGA. We have got people that are actually have health issues now, especially young males who actually have myocarditis or pericarditis due to the vaccination. We have people who can't get to see a doctor or a dentist or a psychologist unless they have been double vaxxed. We have people that have left the, these um, armed services that need to see psychologists but can't be seen now because they're not double vaxxed. You are causing more stress and harm, suicides, break up of families and loss of jobs and putting people in this distress for what reason? We are elected to be a voice for the people and you are denying the people the right to have their say at a Senate Inquiry Committee, which I don't understand. Senator Rice got up and she was explaining, you actually have to, for the proper process, to give the people the right to speak on religious discrimination. You, so, you stood there, Senator Rice. You actually were voting, you know, saying, we must give the people this opportunity to have their say on such an important issue. Well, what is more important about the freedoms of people to make a choice for what gets injected into their bodies? You've shut down doctors from having a say. Doctors are leaving the profession. Nurses are leaving the profession because of the COVID-19. It's got nothing to do with the fact that they are anti-vaxxers. They are seeing the adverse reactions from this vaccine that's coming through in patients now. When hospitals are denying people Order. the right to go into emergencies because they haven't been double-vaxxed, I'm calling on this chamber, please give the people of this nation the opportunity to put in their submissions so that you can understand what is happening. You can't shut them down. That is not our job. Our job is to represent them, to hear their concerns. Let us make the right decisions on their behalf. And if my bill doesn't stand up, then so be it. What have you got to hide from it? <clears throat> Who are you protecting? This should not be political, whether you hate me or my, one nation <clears throat> or our policies. It's not about me. It's about the people and their rights, and you are denying them their rights. I plead to each and every one of you, give the people the opportunity to have their say, listen to them, and then make your final decision with it with regards to the bill. Don't kill more people in this country than what you already Senator, are by ignoring them. Senator Hanson, time for the debate has expired. Senator Patrick, you say Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave. Well, actually, I don't need to seek leave. Um, so I just want to make a, a short contribution in relation, in response to some of the things that Port Senator Hanson has said, and I, I, 
I just do this as unemotionally as, uh, as I possibly can. I'm a big believer in uh, people being able to uh, uh, utilise the committee process to express their views, but I will point out that uh, in this parliament, uh, in this parliament uh, Senator Hanson has in fact voted against 40 per cent of all committee referrals. Uh, that includes committee referrals in relation to um, domestic violence, in particular against women and children, uh, ministerial standards, model for government investment in early child childhood education and care, a um, uh, Northern Australia infrastructure facility amendment bill, a migration amendment clarifying international obligations uh, for removal bill. Uh, there's a uh, ministerial uh, suitability commission of inquiry bill, min again ministerial standards, the current state of scientific advice to parliament. There's been a number of bills that Senator Hansen has simply denied the opportunity for people to, uh, to engage in in terms of through the inquiry process for the Senate to, to examine uh, bills uh, and issues that were before the, before the Senate. Uh, and I just hope that uh, in uh, making your c commitment, and this is not the reason I'll be voting against uh, your referral, uh, I think your bill is is, uh, is a sledgehammer uh, in relation to dealing with some of the boundaries. Uh, I do accept that there are circumstances where uh, people are possibly crossing the line, and that, that uh, would be good to explore that. And I have made the offer that uh, if you were to soften your bill and recognise that there are cases uh, uh, for uh, restrictions on people who haven't uh, been vaccinated. Uh, Senator Lambie uh, mentioned some of those in her contribution uh, last week. You know, I don't want to see people going into aged care facilities that are unvaccinated. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that, that th there are reasons to have restrictions, but I also wonder about the lines that are drawn around uh, medical people refusing to pe see people who are unvaccinated. I think there are questions to be answered, but the bill that you've put up is just a sledgehammer. Um, and I just ask you to reflect on all of the times, uh, 40 per cent of the times that you have voted against the Senate conducting an inquiry into a particular matter. All right. I, if there are no further contributions, I will put the motion on sheet PHON 1 Hanson. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith to teller for the eyes. Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose. There being 21 ayes, 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now seek an Mr. indication Mr. from President. the chamber. Senator Mr. President. Senator Mr. President. Hanson. I seek leave to ask that one nation support at the motion um, be reflected in the journals, please. Uh, it, it will so be reflected, Senator Hanson. Sen Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. So we're we going back now to the matter. I, I would hope so. We can. On on the government's amend, amendment to their amendment. Government amendments to the Greens amendment. Okay. Well, I understood the president to say he, he considered that was an amendment to your amendment. So that's the question before well, the chair is an the amendment, amendment to, to the government's the, amendment. Well, it actually number. was an amendment to the Greens amendment. But yes. Right. So this is not the government amending government. Amendment two. It's the government amending Senator Rice's amendment number one. That is correct. Just to be clear. Yes. Okay. All so, right. And the amendment was well, the date. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to say, uh, if that is the government's intention, Labor will support a referral to the fourth of uh, February. But I would say, um, what a schmozzle this has been, and, and it does not appear, you know in terms of going back to where we were last week, where there was one, not one, but two, but three, I think four tied votes on this matter, and now we've ended up basically back where we were. Uh, we, will reluctantly, we will reluctantly support this. Uh, we do, however, believe it needs a genuine and proper inquiry that allows everyone to participate, which is why we will support the referral to the fourth, um, because it does allow other senators to participate Order. in it. Uh, but um, I would just again draw attention to the fact that this has been handled appallingly by the government on a matter that should be above some of the games that have been played. And I would urge those senators who want to participate to ensure that the inquiry that does go to Legal and Con is a proper and full inquiry uh, that allows full participation not only of senators but of all stakeholders who are invested in this matter. I will now. Senator Birmingham will get the call. Senator thanks, Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Gallagher for her statement, uh, Mr. President, and her indication of the opposition's position on this. Uh, I can I say welcome that uh, this will result in the precise referral that the government proposed last week actually happening uh, in terms of this bill and associated bills being referred to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee and reporting by the date and in the times that the government uh, had originally proposed uh, had the Senate Birmingham. passed this last week. Time for the debate has There would have been expired. one more week. I now have to put the question. Uh, so the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Rustin to the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. 
I'll ask for our position. Look, in the interest of time, and I know we've got a lot to get through, um, I won't call a division, but I, will, I do want to put on notice that the Greens' position on this amendment was to reject it, because we think that the 15th was a very appropriate reporting we date. We, uh, we will record that. Senator Patrick, the same? I'd, I'd like the same uh, to be recorded. I would have preferred the 15th. And I, and right. I would have voted against it this. It will be uh, so recorded, Senator Patrick. Any further? Uh, if not, I will put the amended motion. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move. So yes, I will now move uh, government amendment number two as amended, amended by Senator Rice's amended motion. Those uh, in support of that motion say aye. So everyone is clear. Okay, I'll put the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. And now we will uh, put the motion moved by Senator Smith as amended. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Rustin. Um, I move that government business orders of the day as shown on the order of business be considered from 12.15 p.m. Government business then be called on and considered till no later than 1.30 p.m. And general business notice of motion number 1296 be considered during general business today. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark, is there any postponements or extensions? Mr President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of General Business Notice No. 1301, postponed to the next day of sitting, and Business of the Senate Notice No. 3, postponed till the 8th of February 2022. Uh, the committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 7 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, I shall now proceed with the discovery. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Senator Urquhart. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Sheldon for the 2nd of December for personal reasons. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now proceed to the discovery of formal business. We will go as Per usual, we'll go through these in order. Um, uh, motion number one on a matter of privilege, Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President, and I seek leave to um, postpone this um, until the first day of sitting next year. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, now we'll go to business of the Senate number one, Senator Rice. Um, Thanks, Mr. President. And that I also, as per yesterday, wanted to debate at item 11. We will come back to it. Uh, item number two, uh, Senator Rice again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion. Oh, no, it's no. No, it's, it's been overtaken by events. It's been overtaken Sorry. by events. Yes. yes. Could you just <laughs> formally withdraw that for us, please, Senator Rice? I'm happy to formally withdraw it. Thank you. Uh, number uh, business of the Senate number three, Senators Wish, Wilson, and Weiss. That's also been postponed. Uh, government business number one, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that government business notice of motion number one, standing in my name and that of Senator Wong, uh, relating to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, related matters, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I move the motion standing in my name in the name of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Senator Waters. Yes, President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted for one minute? 
Thank you, President. We support this motion, but it's interesting that you had to seek leave to move it, because the effect of your temporary order, which you'll soon be seeking to make permanent, would be to stop motions like this from even being debated on the floor of this chamber. Now, under your temporary order, which no doubt you'll deny me leave to speak on later, you would stop the Senate from moving motions about uh, forming an opinion on something, you'd stop concurrence motions, you'd even stop censure motions. Now, people want us to be accountable on the issues that matter to them. They want us to come to Canberra and be clear about what we stand for. Speeches and debates are well and good, but until you actually vote on something, nobody really knows what you stand for. Motions have achieved so much in the past. We got the Banking Royal Commission, the Disability Royal Commission, the Veterans Royal Commission through an ICAC, we made, uh, through motions. We made progress on an ICAC because of motions. But you guys don't want to be held accountable for what your positions are. And that's why, once again, you're ganging up to silence the rest Senator of us. Senator Waters, your time has expired. I will put the motion. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now move on to government business number two in the name of Senator Colbeck. Senator Dunning. Uh, thank you, Mr President. On behalf of Senator Colbeck, I ask that government business notice of motion number two proposing the approval of the health Insurance Extended Medicare Safety Net Amendment Indexation Determination 2021 be taken as formal. Is there any objection? If not, Senator Dunning. I move the motion. The question is this motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, government business number three, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number three proposing amendments to the standing orders be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? We'll Senator do that Dunning. At the end. Oh, well, we'll do it. Do it now. Okay. Uh, at the request of Senator Birmingham and pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Question and has to be put question without. Be put. Debate. Oh, right. So I will put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Bells. The question is that the suspension be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes and Senator McKim teller for the noes. There being 27 ayes, 9 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dunningham. So I'm moving the you motion. Move the motion. The motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes and Senator McKim teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 9. The question is resolved in the affirmative. We will now move to General Business 1295 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. Uh, I ask uh, on behalf of Senator Wish Wilson that General Business Notice of Motion 1295 be taken as formal. Is there any objection? If not, so taken. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I didn't hear any voices at all. Uh, against say no. 
The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. One, two, nine, five. Stop the bells. Question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, and nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the eyes and Senator Dean Smith to tell her for the nose.
There being 22 ayes, 24 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I'll just give the senators a moment to get back to their places, and we'll move to 1297, Senators McCarthy and Dodson. Senator McCarthy, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1297 be taken as a formal motion. If there's no objection, it is so taken. Senator McCarthy. I move the motion. Question. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. <coughs> For one minute, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. The government does not support this motion as it would serve to damage relationships between the Commonwealth and the states. I will put the motion. Senator Patrick. Leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave granted. One minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This is somewhat procedural in nature. Um, I, I just noticed with the change of arrangements we've got for limitation on word counts and extra only, extra, extraneous uh, material that we may have placed ourselves in breach of uh, Erskine May back through, the, uh, through section 49 of the Constitution. I just want to read from Erskine May, the 1893 version, which applies to us. If, uh, but however, ample the power of each house to enforce production of papers, a sufficient cause must be shown for the exercise of that power. And if consideration of public policy can be urged against a motion for papers, it is either withdrawn or elsewise dealt with according to the judgment of the House. We do not put any context around these orders for production, and I think that that is a breach of the obligations placed upon us by Erskine May through our constitution, and it should be considered by the Senate. Well, I'm happy to have a look at that, Senator Patrick, but I will put the motion. Those in order. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. Four. All right.
stop the bells. The question is the motion be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes, and Senator Dean Smith, teller for the nose. There being 22 ayes, 23 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. It being passed 12.15, we will now move to government business orders of the day. And I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number five, health insurance amendment, enhancing the bonded medical program and other measures bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate. I'll just give senators a moment to clear the chamber. Senator Walsh will step into the chair and Senator Kitching will have the call. If senators could leave the chamber, please, if they're not participating. And I call Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Um, on the health insurance amendment, is that the right? Yes, thank you very much. This uh, pro program is designed to address the doctor shortage across regional, rural and remote areas, a shortage that has just grown worse under the Morrison government. The purpose of the health insurance amendment enhancing the bond and medical program other measures bill is to amend the Health Insurance Act 18, 1973 to improve the implementation of the bonded medical program and the administration of the medical rural bondle, bonded scholarship contracts under section 19 of the Act. Uh, the changes outlined in the bill are welcomed, but this bill will not address the difficulties Australians in outer metro, regional and rural areas have in accessing health care, including in, G in seeing a GP. At a time when the government should be investing in Medicare and delivering more services to regional Australia, this government is doing the opposite. A lack of doctors and other medical professionals in regional and rural communities across Australia is not a new problem, but it's an even more pressing problem in the context of the COVID pandemic, which is why Labor has established a Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee inquiry into outer metro, rural and regional GPs and other healthcare services, which will consider the performance of programs such as the bonded medical program. Labor has always fought to defend and strengthen Medicare and to make sure all Australians have access to a GP, and we will continue to do so, but we support the legislation. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. And uh, Minister. 
Senator, Senator Dunningham. Chair, whatever you would like, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank <laughs> Senator Gallagher for that contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, the question uh, now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. And I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Uh, I call Senator Gallagher. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I am. Oh, no, we're waiting. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, no, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Thank you. I the move minister. that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill uh, be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. So. I thank the clerk. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Electoral Legislation Amendment Assurance of Senate Counting Bill 2021 for concurrence, and I call the Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the motion uh, moved by the Minister be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to Senate elections in respect of scrutiny. Uh, the minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. And. And I call Senator Gallagher on, no. on electoral legislation okay. amendment assurance of Senate counting. Thank you very much. Labor will be supporting the electoral legislation amendment assurance of Senate counting bill 2021. The bill does two main things. It requires the AEC to commission an audit and risk assessment of the counting and scrutiny software used in a Senate election, and it amends the way ties between candidates in a Senate election are resolved. The bill has the aim of enhancing the transparency and integrity of our election counting system. We know that we have one of the best electoral systems in the world. The independent AEC operates with the utmost integrity and rigour and does everything right to ensure a fair and accurate election result. Nevertheless, there will always, unfortunately, be detractors and those who question the result, even when there's not a shred of evidence about anything but an accurate and transparent outcome. We remain concerned about the messaging that is coming from some in this place that is designed to cast doubts on the integrity of our electoral system and to undermine our democracy. The AEC already has a robust system for assurance and transparency of its software systems. However, we are satisfied that this bill will assist in providing increased confidence to the voting public and, indeed, to parties and candidates. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. This bill addresses an important issue regarding the transparency of the Senate ballot count. And it's an issue that's been consistently raised in submissions to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, on which I sit. Um, and it's an issue on which the Greens proposed amendments to address several months ago. I want to say unequivocally that Australia has an electoral system to be proud of. There is no evidence of widespread inaccuracies in the current count. However, greater transparency always leads to greater public trust that electoral processes are robust and best practice. We've seen recent international experiences where a lack of transparency and doubt has been weaponised to undermine confidence in election outcomes. 
We saw these very dangerous tactics and false narratives start to circulate around the government's proposed voter ID bill. It was fanned by conservative voices more interested in importing American unrest than ensuring that everyone gets a vote. We were glad to see the voter ID bill dropped from the program and hope that it never returns. The improvements to transparency and scrutiny of the ballot count proposed in this bill are welcome. They will help Australia to avoid seeds of doubt being used to destabilise public trust in democracy, which is already at an all-time low, um, and to reduce faith in election outcomes. This bill would be strengthened by requiring scrutineers to have access to digitised records prior to overseeing the audit and requiring audit reports to be tabled in parliament rather than just a summary published by the AEC, as our amendments would have um, earlier achieved. However, these are measures that can be implemented with the goodwill of the AEC, and the Greens will push for them to do so as the audit process is rolled out. We support the bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. I am looking perhaps for Senator. No, I call the minister. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I thank senators for their contributions, and I believe there are. Ah, oh, is he on this one? Uh, oh, well, Rob... he might be seeking the call, Senator... so I don't yes. thank anyone yes, for their contributions. Yes, he may. Senator... Senator Roberts, are you seeking the? Senator yes, Roberts, I am. Are you uh... seeking the call? Yes, I am, Madam Acting Deputy President. You have the call. Thank you very much. Uh, just a brief comment. Um, we want to acknowledge the government's work on this. And we also want to acknowledge some facts on the history of this, this bill, and we applaud the government for its work. We first raised this issue um, in, in the bill that I put forward, and that bill was voted down. And uh, we want to acknowledge that the facts of the matter are that we found that the Senate election has never been audited properly, and never been independently audited properly, and we had some conversations with the, with the uh, Senate estimates with the Australian Electoral Commission. They weren't satisfactory. We put together a bill and that was uh, defeated, but it went then to the government. And I want to applaud the government for taking up the bill and putting forward the bill largely in, in um, much the same format and content as we originally proposed it. So we acknowledge the government because it is very, very important that the Senate election, that people can have confidence in the, in the uh, result of the Senate voting. So this bill will now require an audit before the Senate election and immediately after the Senate election. And that way we'll be, we and the people of Australia will be very happy uh, or reassured that the, that the election is in fact representing of the, the people's will. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. The Minister. We'll take two. Uh, thank you all, Senators, for contributions and uh, commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the, bills, the bill now be read a second time. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to Senate elections in respect of scrutiny. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to Senate elections in respect of scrutiny. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Electoral Legislation Amendment Contingency Measures Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. I was too early again. Thank you. Uh, uh, the question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. 
I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of postal votes, adjournments and emergencies, and to provide for the application of the amendments. The Minister. Uh, I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time. And I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. Labor will be supporting the Electoral Legislation Amendment Contingency Measures Bill 2021. The bill has come about from a recommendation by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters from its inquiry into the conduct of elections during times of emergency situations. The coronavirus pandemic was the obvious catalyst for that inquiry, but we know that climate change means we will be increasingly be experiencing catastrophic bushfire and floods, and the Electoral Commission must be able to conduct elections safely in these times of emergency, and these bill, this bill assists them to do that. The Contingency Measures Bill will give the Electoral Commission additional flexibility in a way an election is conducted. It will allow the Electoral Commissioner to extend the pre-poll period, expand the reasons a person may exercise a pre-poll or postal vote, adjust the numbers of scrutineers and allow candidates and volunteers to travel for the purposes of canvassing for votes, handing out how-to-vote cards and putting up election posters. Providing the Electoral Commissioner with contingency powers will ensure that if there is an emergency situation, the core activities required for an election can still be conducted. It will also ensure the safety of the voters, candidates and their volunteers and the 100,000 AEC staff that will be required at the next election. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The Australian Greens support this bill, the Electoral Legislation Amendment Contingency Measures Bill of 2021, which will allow some flexibility for the conduct of elections impacted by emergencies such as bushfires or pandemics. Given the uncertainty regarding public health requirements and the increased likelihood of climate-induced emergencies in future, it is important to ensure that fair and democratic elections can still be held. We support the measures in this bill provided for that to happen. These provisions to accommodate emergency situations would also support the introduction of fixed-term elections. Fixed-term elections remove the strategic advantage that incumbent governments get when the Prime Minister has discretion to call an election when she or he chooses. Here we are on the last day of sitting for the year, and we're still not able to say with certainty that we'll come back before an election. Without fixed terms, governments can call an election when public opinion is most favourable to them. They can ride out scandals, or at least try to. When the election date is known only to the government, they can strategically ramp up advertising on key issues ahead of the official public announcement uh, of the election date. It's a strategic advantage that other parties, independents and new candidates, do not enjoy. Fixed-term elections help to level the, uh, level the playing field for smaller parties, for independents and third parties with less capacity to plan, prepare and fund election campaigns. With the changes set out in this bill, the benefits of fixed-term elections could still be achieved while still providing flexibility in emergency situations. The Australian Greens support fixed-term elections and we will continue to call for them. And we support this bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. The Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. Am I calling the clerk? Uh, the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that, op that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of postal votes, adjournments and emergencies and to provide for the application of the amendments. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. The minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill uh, be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect to postal votes, adjournments and emergencies and to provide for the application of the amendments. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment exempt, uh, exempting disability payments from the Income Testing and Other Measures Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the Minister. 
Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a first time. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans entitlements, military rehabilitation and compensation and social security and for related purposes. The minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. Labor will be supporting this legislation as it will improve and streamline assistance to veterans and improve their wellbeing. However, we know it's not what most totally and permanently incapacitated veterans want. Uh, we know most want an increase in the TPI payment. Labor condemns the Morrison Joyce government for its failure to accept the recommendation of the recent Senate inquiry that the TPI payment be increased, which would ensure our most disabled veterans are not left behind. The government's response to this bipartisan inquiry was a huge slap in the face for Australia's 27,000 TPI veterans, and it just show, goes to show that this is a government that's all about the announcement but never about delivery when it comes to Australia's veterans. The Australian Federation of Totally and Permanently Incapacitated Ex-Service Men and Women has been raising the issue of the TPI payment for several years, but the government has completely ignored their concerns. Before the 2019 election, the Prime Minister effectively promised to increase the payment, but since then he has ignored the pleas of TPI veterans and his own colleagues' advice and failed to raise the pension. After sitting on a review of the TPI payment for more than a year, Scott Morrison announced in last year's budget that he would only provide rent assistance to a small proportion of TPI veterans, leaving most disgusted that they would miss out. In response to Labor's questions in Senate estimates last year, it was revealed these benefits would not start to flow until September 2022, when they made changes to legislation, legislation and IT systems. It's good they've brought forward this to January 2022, following pressure from Labor and TPI veterans, but they are cutting it very fine to have them pass. So Labor will not stand in the way of this legislation, but along with many TPI veterans, we believe these tokenistic measures are just not good enough, and our veterans and families deserve much better. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting uh, De Deputy President. Look, um, as uh, Senator Gallagher has already mentioned, uh, Labor knows that our veterans need uh, more assistance. <clears throat> And while the changes being proposed today are relatively modest at best, as foreshadowed by my colleagues earlier, we will be supporting this bill on the understanding that uh, it is a positive step in supporting those who have served our nation. There can be no greater undertaking that a citizen can pursue for their country than to put their life in danger, to see its interests advance abroad and to secure the safety of their neighbour. And I'm certain that those who sit with us in this chamber, who have undertaken to provide such service to their nation, will attest, with their own personal experience, the sacrifice that is involved. A sacrifice that is made gladly, but a sacrifice nonetheless. As those who sit in this place, those with the responsibility of providing for these dedicated men and women post-service, it is incumbent upon us all to never forget the solemn debt which we owe these Australians. Indeed, some may say that this debt we can never hope to repay, and yet it falls to us to do whatever little we can to strive towards this most notable end. Now, this bill contains some common sense changes that will simplify and streamline assistance to veterans. Indeed, it addresses recommendations that were made by David Chun's 2019 review. Exempting disability payments from income testing, as is proposed by this bill, will simplify the payment arrangements for many veterans and dependents, around 14,000. It will also increase access to rent assistance for many in the veterans community, around 7,000 veterans and their dependents will benefit. But while any measure that helps our veterans is certainly welcome, it is hard not to see this proposed legislation as somewhat tokenistic. When TPI, 
their trends are asking for an actual increase in their payments. The Australian Federation of Totally and Permanently Incapacitated Ex-Servicemen and Women highlighted that the government's rent assistance changes in response to the Tune Review only benefited 10 per cent of veterans. They rightly argue that all veterans relying on TPI payments need a substantial increase. In response to the TPI Federation's concerns, Labor initiated an inquiry into the payment, which recommended an increase. But the government has also refused. Um, sorry, the government has refused. This has left many of us wondering why this government, the coalition government, continues to ignore the Senate inquiry's recommendations with regards to increasing such payments. Why is it that the, the, Morrison, the Morrison government is ignoring calls from our veterans community to increase these payments? Deep down, many of us already know the answer to these questions. Put simply, it's because this government thinks it can just simply walk away from the problem. The coalition appears to view our veterans, particularly those who are struggling through no fault of their own, as just another political problem, just another topic to spin an answer until the news cycle moves on or the election. We must condemn this government's refusal to accept the recommendations of the bipartisan Senate inquiry. It's an insult to the around 27,000 Australian veterans who depend on TPI payments. This government is so caught up in a crisis after crisis that it has forgotten why we're all here. We're here to serve. We're here to serve the Australian community. While we will, of course, have different ideas about how to solve the problems that our country faces, surely we can all agree that our national government must provide more support for those who have served and who have served their country, their families, and made the sacrifices defending our rights and liberties. Unlike the Morrison-Joyce government, Labor treats the concerns of our veterans seriously, not as a political problem to be, to be dealt with or managed. No matter the pol political challenges, no matter what other priorities a government may have, we must always put the welfare of our veterans first. We had a unanimous recommendation from the bipartisan Senate inquiry on July 1 of this year to increase the TPI payment. But every day that's passed since, it's just another day that this Prime Minister and his government has ignored our veterans. We are glad that the pressure from Labor and the TPI Federation has pushed the government to bring this rent assistance measure forward from their original commencement date on September 20, 2022 to the 1st of January 2022. Well, as I said, these measures are welcome and have Labor's support. It must be recognised that there is still much more for us to do in this place to improve the welfare of our veterans in this country. Thank you. The Minister. I commend uh, the Bill to the Senate in thanking senators for their contributions. Uh, the question is that the bill uh, be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements, military rehabilitation and compensation and social security and for related purposes. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' entitlements, military rehabilitation and compensation and social security and for related purposes. Electoral Legislation Amendment Annual Disclosure Equality Bill 2021. Resumption of debate in committee on the amendments moved by Senator Patrick. The, uh, just a moment, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Uh, the committee is considering the Electoral Legislation Amendment Annual Disclosure Equality Bill 2021 and the amendments on 
sheet 1528, moved by Senator Patrick, uh, and um, sorry, just a moment. Um, I think S Senator Patrick is wishing to to address this. So I'll, I'll, I'll call I'll call Senator Patrick. Thank you. I just remind the chamber that uh, uh, the amendment before the Senate is in fact an amendment to have disclosure around uh, uh, when people pay above. Uh, reasonable prices for having a meal with uh, a, a politician, be it a, a prime minister, a minister, or an influential um, shadow, something like that. Uh, people, I have no no issue with people going to dinner with parliamentarians. They shouldn't have to pay to do so. Uh, I think it's reasonable to recover the fee that uh, that is involved in in serving a meal, but uh, once it gets above. 15 per cent of the cost of, the, of the, the meal, the cost of the event, I think there needs to be some disclosure so that we uh, don't have people uh, dishing out large amounts of money just to be able to be in the presence of someone. I think that's, that's very wrong. It's very un-Australian. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. This is on the um Senator Lambie and Patrick amendment. Labor's uh, won't be supporting this. Our policy is for increased transparency through a lower disclosure threshold and real-time disclosure of donations, and we would wel welcome the support for senators for Labor's bills currently on the notice paper for real-time disclosure and a disclosure threshold of $1,000. All electoral reform requires consideration, and the issues raised by this amendment uh, requires further discussion and review. However, this amendment had not been discussed with the opposition before, and we hadn't had time to discuss it with uh, Senator Patrick or indeed uh, across um, consultations across the opposition, and we won't be supporting it. Uh, the Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the government opposes this amendment. The amendment is not required and reflects a misunderstanding of how the law currently works. Uh, the existing law already requires disclosure of fundraising through dinner events to raise funds for federal electioneering. If a ticket to a federal fundraiser event, fundraising event is higher than the cost of the event to any degree, then this profit element is already defined as a gift under the Electoral Act and must be declared. This amendment introduces a new concept of a shared event cost uh, that's not limited to events for electoral purposes. It would therefore apply to events that are completely unrelated to elections. And this goes beyond the scope of the Electoral Act and burdens organisations from holding events, for example, for non-electoral charitable purposes. Acting in conjunction with uh, other um, amendments moved by Senators Lambie and Patrick uh, of $1,000 disclosure threshold, um, attending a $30 morning tea with 50 guests could make the event go over the threshold and require every attendee's home address to be published online in perpetuity. This is frankly an impractical and it is unnecessary and overreaches outside the legitimate purposes of the federal electoral donation laws. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that the amendments be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. Uh, I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, is a division required? <laughs> is a division required? Is a division required? Uh, ring, ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the amendments be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Uh, and I appoint S Senator McKim, ah, McKim uh, for the ayes and Senator McCarthy for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 8, nose 22. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, the question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Electoral Legislation Amendment Annual Disclosure Equality Bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. I Call the minister. Uh, oh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. Call the minister. I move the bill be read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say uh, aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to electoral and financial disclosure matters and for related purposes. I'm seeking the call. Uh, government business order of the day. Oh, sorry. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is, uh, leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Thorpe for 2nd of December for personal reasons. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. Oh, I, uh, the question is that that leave of absence be granted. Um, those of that opinion say aye. 
Uh, those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government Business Order for Day Number Two: Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Facilitation Bill 2021, and a related bill. Resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. Um, I rise to speak in support of the Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme bills. And I start by welcoming the introduction of a Stolen Generations Redress Scheme for the areas of the Commonwealth where children remo were removed from their families. This bill is long overdue and Labor hopes to see its speedy and effective implementation. And I'm grateful that the government has adopted what has been a very important and long-standing Labor commitment to redress for the members of the Stolen Generation taken from families in Commonwealth jurisdictions. Labor took a Stolen Generations rep Reparations commitment to the last election on very similar terms to the bill before the Senate today. For more than 60 years after 1910, Australian governments took children from their homes in the wrong attempt to assimilate them into white society. It was the Bringing Them Home report, published more than 24 years ago, which elevated the experiences of the individuals affected by this policy, documenting the harrowing testimonies and submissions of removal and institutionalisation of First Nations children. These testimonies revealed the destructive impact of the child removal, which did not only go on for decades but affected families across multiple generations. In one testimony, Evie, a stolen generation member from the Northern Territory, told the Royal Commission how the removal of children from her family started with her grandmother, how it continued across four generations, causing permanent <laughs> scarring to so many lives and ingrained a loss of trust in the public institutions whose first duty is to protect. It's a harrowing retelling, and I hope I can give it the voice her story deserves. Evie's grandmother was taken from Tennant Creek to the bungalow at Alice Springs, a state home for the First Nations children taken from their families, where she had two children, my mum and my uncle, to the Aboriginal Protection Officer. She, she said she had no say in that, and she was only 14 years old. At 15 and a half, they took her to Hermansburg and married her up to an Aranda man. That's a no-no. When mum was three, they took her away from her home and put her in the bungalow until she was 11. Then they sent her to Mulgoa Mission in New South Wales, then on to Carlingford Girls Home to be a maid. Evie's mum tried to get back to the Northern Territory. She had a little baby and she wanted to get home, but she had no money because she wasn't being paid. Evie told the Royal Commission that her mum just kept asking the authorities for her wages. When initially refused, in the end, the authority She's told Evie's mother she would get her wages but needed to leave her baby behind. So she left her baby, Evie's brother, and went back to the Northern Territory where she had Evie and four other children. Each child was taken away almost as soon as they were born and sent south for adoption. Evie tells us one of them came back in 1992. He just had that many problems. The others, we don't know where they are. So it's like we've still got a broken family. I was taken away in 1950 when I was six hours old from hospital and put in, into Rita Dixon until I was two months old and then sent to Garden Point until 1964. Of her time at Garden Point, Evie says, I always say that some of it was the happiest times of my life, others it was the saddest time of my life. The happiest time was yippee, all these other kids there, you know, you got to play with them every day. The saddest times were the abuse not only the physical abuse, the sexual abuse by the priests over there. And they were the saddest because if you were to tell anyone, well, the priests threatened that they would actually come and get you. And just every day, you used to get hidings with the stock whip. Doesn't ma matter what you did wrong, you got a hiding with the stock whip. In 1977, I had three children. All those kids were taken off me. The reason behind that was, well, I'd asked my girlfriend and so-called sister-in-law if she could look after my kids while I was in hospital for three months. I couldn't get my kids back when I came out of hospital and I fought the welfare system for 10 years and still couldn't get them. I gave up after 10 years. And with my daughter, well, she came back in 88, but things just aren't working out there. She blames me for everything that went wrong. She's got this hate about her, just doesn't want to know. The two boys know where I am, but turned around and said to us, you're not our mother, we know who our real mother is. So every day of your bloody life, you just get hurt all the time. So even now, these past policies continue to have devastating effect on the lives of stolen generation members and their families. 
It was the final bringing them home report that included a recommendation on the need for rep reparation because it is the act of reparation that is the measure of genuine reconciliation and healing. The report also recommended a national apology from the Australian government. In February 2008, the Labor Prime Minister Kevin Rudd delivered on that recommendation and apologised 13 and a half years ago. In his apology, the former Prime Minister properly recognised the systemic abuses inflicted upon members of the stolen generation. The apology was a very important first step in formally recognising the extent of the pain and suffering inflicted upon the stolen generation. It served as a powerful acknowledgement of the past and opened the door for the reparations we see in this bill today. As a parliament and as a country, we had failed, and we had failed one of the most important duties as a country we can have to do no harm to our children. Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generations on behalf of the country and the parliament was a powerful recognition of that fact. There are still current members of this Senate who were present for that apology, and I hope I can speak for everyone here today when I say that we all remain truly sorry. Senator Bragg. Uh, Acting Deputy President, the, uh, I'd just like to make a couple of statements on this important legislation. And uh, of course, uh, one of the, the things that we've been doing in this parliament has been uh, to serve with uh, some important historical figures uh, like the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Ken Wyatt, um, and is a good friend uh, to many in this chamber and across the aisle. And I wanted to uh, acknowledge from our side uh, his significant contribution to Australia uh, and in bringing together this legislation. Of course, his mother, Mona, was uh, a member of the stolen generation and uh, she spent a large part of her life at the Rowlands Mission. Now, um, Minister Wyatt himself has talked about a Wiradjuri elder, Isabel Reid, who was born in Wagga Wagga in 1932. And the minister has said that one afternoon she was walking home from school with her brother and sister and she was taken from her family by the government. Her parents did not know what happened to their children. Uh, that is the most uh, harrowing set of words that I can imagine reading or hearing, uh, and it's a, about our government. It's about historical judgments made by the governments of Australia and of the states of Australia, and it is a great, a great shame, uh, and it is still having a big impact. Uh, and it is obvious when when you travel around a state like New South Wales, which has the largest Indigenous population of any of the states, that the intergenerational trauma and impact of these disgusting policies uh, is real. And so the least we can do is to make this small gesture, but important gesture, uh, at this stage, where many of these people will be elderly, but it is a, an important gesture no one is ever going to say that any amount of money is worth a life. But in this case, it was very important that we put in place this financial compensation scheme uh, to acknowledge for all time uh, the, the wrongness of the policies that were put in place many decades ago that are still reverberating today. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, all the work that's been done uh, on this and all the, the bipartisan support uh, that will come for this important bill and um, acknowledge again, uh, although I wasn't here for the, uh, the apology some 12 years ago, that um, it was a very important moment, uh, but there is still much work to do uh, and I'm personally committed to doing whatever I can while I'm in this place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Firstly, may I just take this opportunity firstly, to pay tribute and acknowledge the work of Harold Ferber, who passed away peacefully last month, surrounded by family. 
Mr Ferber was born in Alice Springs in 1952 and in 1957 was taken from his mother to the Croker Island Methodist Mission. He was taken along with his younger sister when he was only four years old and they were eventually separated too. Mr Ferber was instrumental in bringing together many voices of the Stolen Generations. His work with the Central Australian Stolen Generation and Families Aboriginal Corporation created a stronger, united voice for members of the Stolen Generation right across the Northern Territory. He was a talented footy player. He rubbed shoulders with the great players of his day at the North Adelaide Football Club in the early 70s. Determined to find his sister, he signed up with a Queensland footy team, which gave him the opportunity to search for her and he eventually succeeded and was able to attend her wedding. Mr Ferber worked tirelessly to advocate for survivors and had called for a reparations package for years. One year after former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd delivered his historic apology speech in 2008, Mr Ferber felt the apology was empty with nothing practical being done. He said there was a lot of euphoria and excitement after the speech but he felt as though the Commonwealth had quickly turned its back on survivors and the Northern Territory. Here today, Madam Acting Deputy President, we do see uh, that side and those concerns addressed in the best possible way for the moment. Clearly, as the previous speaker and senators have said, no amount of money can compensate really uh, for the incredible loss of so many members of the Stolen Generations not just in the Northern Territory, but right across Australia. Until now, Territory survivors haven't been given the same respect and recognition as survivors living in some states. In April this year, around 80, uh, 800 sorry, stolen generation survivors in the Northern Territory launched a class action against the Commonwealth Government. And this class action came after many years of federal government inaction on the issue. The lead litigant, Eileen Cummings, was only four when she was taken from her family in the 1940s. Backed by lived experience, survivors like Ms Cummings have shown great strength and bravery in challenging the government and all political members, whether in government or not, for recognition. And Without their fierce advocacy, I'm sure we certainly wouldn't have this scheme here today. Arnie Maisie Austin, the CEO of the Northern Territory Stolen Generations Aboriginal Corporation, has also done incredible advocacy work and will certainly keep a close eye on the rollout of this scheme. Ms Austin gave evidence into the inquiry into these bills and reminded us that many of these survivors are reaching the end of their lives or have already passed away before they could see this through. And yes, there have been so many Stolen Generations members who have passed away even from my home community, Arnie Hildish Muir, who I paid great tribute to, and certainly people like Barb Cummings, who was tremendous in forwarding the march towards equality for stolen generations. And there are so many more who I am unable to announce today, but I know those members and families listening will know who I mean. Ms Austin gave evidence into the inquiry into these bills, Ma Madam Acting Deputy President, and reminded us that many of these survivors are reaching the end of their lives. There's simply no more time to waste. The government has not publicly stated that participation in the scheme will be conditional on foregoing the right to make a civil claim, but I imagine this can be expected to be the case. In the Northern Territory, the exact number of children who were taken away may never be really known. But what we do know is that there are hundreds of families who have been affected. And I'm sure there isn't a community in the Territory that hasn't been affected in one way or another by the Stolen Generations. The Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's Bringing Them Home report put a face and voice to much of the suffering endured over decades. The Commission interviewed around 500 people who were affected, as well as speaking to institutions right across the country. These are not just statistics. They are very real stories, which are hard to hear and, I imagine, incredibly hard to tell in the first place. I'll read part of the testimony of one man who was left in the infamous bungalow in Alice Springs. and He said, and I quote, 
There was no food, nothing. We was all huddled up in a room like a little puppy dog on the floor. Sometimes at night time we'd cry with hunger, no food. We had to scrounge in the town dump, eating old bread, smashing tomato sauce bottles, licking them. Half of the time we got was from the rubbish dump. Half of the time the food we got was from the rubbish dump." End of quote. There are so many other stories of hurt and suffering at the bungalow, and many children were told they were unwanted or that their parents were dead. Another survivor recalled the trauma of lies and forced separation, and she said, and I quote, I remember this woman saying to me, your mother's dead. You've got no mother now. That's why you're here with us. Then about two years after that, my mother and my mother's sister all came to the bungalow, but they weren't allowed to visit us because they were black. They had to sneak around onto the hills. Each mother was picking out which one they thought was their child. And this other girl said, your mother's up there. And because they told me that she was dead, I said, no, that's not my mother. I haven't got a black mother." End of quote. Madam Acting Deputy President, I thank the many survivors out there for sharing their stories and certainly those who are no longer here. I also thank those who endured their suffering silently without being able or willing to tell their story for whatever reason. One of the most important parts of this scheme finally being established is that it gives survivors acknowledgement. Acknowledgement of what was done to them, acknowledgement that it was wrong and racist, and acknowledgement of each person's story. Under this scheme, a one-off $75,000 payment in recognition of the harm caused by forced removal will go some way in providing recognition to survivors who are still with us today. I also welcome the provision of a one-off $7,000 healing assistance payment and an opportunity to confidentially share stories with senior officials. As a parliament and a country, we failed in one of the most important and basic duties we have, and that is not to harm children. In fact, the complete opposite was done. The removal of children from their families, an almost centuries-long practice by governments across Australia, created a trauma that's transcended generations and will continue to do so for years to come. In some situations, the removal of children was a slow process that happened over the course of some weeks. In other cases, children were just taken immediately without warning. And many mothers didn't know it would be the last time they would hold their child. Many families didn't know it was the last time they would spend together. And many children never even knew their families to begin with. Madam Acting Deputy President, the separation of families and the destruction of communities on a systemic scale cannot simply be forgotten, and the fear and pain remain not only with members of the Stolen Generations, but their children and grandchildren too. And we continue to see the long shadow the traumas cast on relationships, on health and mental health, on people's economic prospects, on culture, language and identity. The Stolen Generations have haunted not only its victims, but also a national history and conscience. I'd like to think the Stolen Generations are a faraway memory, something that did happen a long time ago. Instead, it happened so recently, right up to where we are now. And if we're not careful, we continue to do the same thing by removing First Nations children from their families. The prohibition and loss of language has been connected with the loss of identity for those forcibly removed and their descendants. Many children were beaten for speaking their own language, and this loss of culture has isolated children from the supporting structures and identity of their culture. In the Northern Territory today, most children in out-of-home care are Indigenous. Although the scheme will be a relief for some surviving members, it is concerning and sad that many family members of those who have passed away will be left out. So for many families, this is too little and too late. The Healing Foundation has pointed out that many survivors are in poor health and virtually all will be eligible for aged care next year. Each year, more stolen generations elders are lost and the remaining survivors suffer significant distress. So I urge the parliament for there to be no unnecessary delay in rolling out this scheme. My thoughts are with the survivors in the territories who waited for too long and did not live to see this scheme come to fruition. 
Throughout this pandemic, we have seen far too many examples of poor messaging to Indigenous communities, and we do not want to make things any harder now. In this instance, with this particular area of the stolen generations. Let me also stress the importance of involving community organisations and elders in the decision-making process all the way through. The information needs to be available in languages early on and throughout the rollout of the scheme. It needs to be accessible to remote communities, although in language communication should have been a no-brainer in the rollout of the vaccine and the federal government did take way too long to get that communication out there. I certainly don't want to see this repeated in regards to the stolen generations. So it means working closely with stolen generation survivor groups at every stage, working with the Healing Foundation, the Northern Territory Stolen Generations Aboriginal Corporation and other groups in the NT, the ACT and Jarvis Bay. The scheme needs to heal, not re-traumatise. In April this year, Labor reaffirmed our commitment to a Stolen Generations Redress Scheme. Labor took a policy to the 2016 election, which was almost identical to the government's announcement—$75,000 in redress and $7,000 to help with funeral costs. The redress scheme we have is thanks to the dedication and tenacity of advocates, community groups and survivors themselves. I thank each and every one of them. Many survivors in the Territory are now in their 70s and 80s, and many of them never thought this day would come. I hope these payments will go some way in helping them enjoy their final days or help give their children and grandchildren a better future. Hopefully this scheme and the recognition of wrong it will afford go some way to, to the healing to those Australians who have felt so deeply betrayed. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank senators for their sincere and heartfelt contributions and commend these bills, which facilitate the operation of certain aspects of this redress scheme to the Senate. The objective of these bills is to ensure that receipt of a redress payment does not, first, affect a participant's access to or eligibility for any pensions, payments, benefits or services, however they might be described, provided by the Commonwealth, and second, require the repayment of an amount to the Commonwealth and to ensure that the redress payment is absolutely inalienable. They will also ensure eligible participants of the scheme receive the full benefit of their redress payment. Payments under the scheme are excluded from income testing for other Commonwealth payments or benefits and will facilitate the cross-checking of identity information. So I commend that too to the Senate. As a, as a group, this Senate should be honoured to be involved in this important and historic moment. We should also acknowledge the work that members of the Stolen Generations and their families have done in the past and that they continue to do to bring this scheme into effect. Thank you, Minister. Now, my understanding is that there was an amendment, sir. Before I go to that, we'll put the second reading, reading, reading speak. Could I ask um, that the second reading, amend, uh, second reading bill be uh, agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Facilitation Bill 2021. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. Thank you. Um, my understanding is there was an amendment circulated, but my understanding is that's not proceeding. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I can co confirm that we will not be proceeding with the amendments that were circulated uh, by the Australian Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the bills be now... Oh, I'll call the clerk, actually. I'll call the minister. It does. Thank you, Minister, and ask you to move the second reading, amend second reading bill. Okay. 
Um, I now Bill's. move that the bill be read a third time. Thank you. Um, could I ask, is that agreed to? Is that motion agreed to? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Call the clerk. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Facilitation Bill 2021. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Corporation's Amendment Meeting and Documents Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I'll put that question. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Corporations Act 2001 and for related purposes. I call the Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So, thank you. Uh, so I'll Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Um, Labor supports so making the most of the changes that were introduced to help public companies manage their obligations during the height of the COVID-19 period permanent. This support is not unqualified uh, with respect to the changes affecting the conduct of annual general meetings. Um, we have some concerns about the arrangements that are being proposed. And in Labor's view, it is very important that the sanctity of rights and shareholder rights be preserved, and we are concerned about the potential dilution of these rights as a consequence of annual meetings being held virtually. And that's why my colleague Stephen Jones, Mr. Jones, circulated an amendment to this bill in the other place, uh, and we are pleased that the government accepted those amendments. Um, in particular, these will cause there to be a review uh, of the effect of the bill, and also the paragraphs in the bill that permit wholly virtual meetings will cease to have effect if a report on the review of those operations for those provisions is not tabled in each House of Parliament within 30 months of the commencement of Schedule 1 of the bill. And with that protection on the, in place, I can confirm that Labor will be supporting the bill. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, at every available opportunity, the government has used the pandemic as cover to try and increase corporate power and decrease protections for investors and consumers. This bill is the latest attempt to capitalise on COVID for the sake of the rich and the powerful, and it would do that by making permanent the temporary dispensation granted to companies from having to hold in-person AGMs. Now, the Australian Greens accepted that that measure was necessary during the period of extended lockdowns. And we do support making permanent the capacity for companies to hold hybrid AGMs. However, we do not support the provisions in this bill that would allow companies to hold wholly virtual AGMs, because AGMs are one of the few occasions that corporations actually have to account for themselves publicly. They are an opportunity for investors to scrutinise what is being done with their money. But AGMs also serve a broader and legitimate public purpose. Public purpose. Just once a year, those who have the power to direct capital and shape economies and societies and people's lives with all of the protection of a limited liability corporation, have to sit down and front up to ordinary people and look them in the eye and explain themselves and answer questions. It is this humbling of the executive class that this bill is seeking to avoid. The pursuit of profit at all cost relies on those that run corporations being able to abstract themselves from any destruction that they are wreaking on people, on communities, on the environment or on the climate. For CEOs and chairpeople, the prospect of being personally confronted with the human or ecological co cost of their actions or simply being quizzed as to whether they really deserve their obscenely large executive bonuses can be just a little 
uncouth. They can find it just a tad difficult. Which is ex Senator Bikim, it being 1.30, we'll move to two-minute statements. Thank you. Could I call Senator Walsh? Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, one in three. One in three is the shocking number that headlines the Jenkins report on the workplaces of this parliament. One in three sexually harassed. That's 40 per cent of women and one in four men sexually harassed. Harassment that is experienced even more acutely for First Nations people and other people of colour, more acutely for LGBT people, with more than half sexually harassed in the workplaces of this parliament. Harassment that is experienced more acutely for people with disability. And of course, these are not just statistics. These are people. People who came to this place to build careers and make a meaningful contribution to their communities. This is shameful and it must end now. At the core of all of this is power, entitlement and privilege, a complete lack of accountability from those in power and a lack of diversity. And the worst thing about all of this for me is the message that this place is sending to those people who might hold a dream of one day building a future here, to the young people who want to come here and make their contribution to the future of our country, but who now might be rethinking those dreams. I want those people to come here and make their mark. I want them to experience the buzz that I still experience approaching this amazing building on the hill in the morning to experience that immense feeling of pride in taking their place right here. So to all of those people rethinking their dreams, I want to say from this chamber that you belong here, and it is the bullies who do not. Senator Bragg is not here. Senator Waters. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise today to remember and honour the 40 women who have been killed by violence in Australia in 2021. It is 40 too many, and we owe it to them to work tirelessly to eliminate violence against women. I'm going to read out their names. Mary Benedito, Ms Waterloo, Michelle Dara, Janet Dway, Bernice Dent, Dee Anir, Angela Silk, Dusty Rose, Susan Murray, Cherry Garant Ogar, Keong Yang, Rachel Martin, Maureen Miller, Michelle, 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 Gabby Marshall, Denise Bromeld, Stacey Klimovich, Kayla Golding, Tan Truong, Barbara Chowbard, Judy Bednar, Christina Laylor, Lordi Ramadan, Kelly Wilkinson, Mariam Hamka, Renee Lattimore, Min Sukamoon, Sandy Brown, Jasmine Kaur, Robin Beaver, Doreen Langham, Zhu Zhang, Michelle Norris, Adakrai Mitiang Ater, A Rubancha, Stephanie Lee Robinson, and four other women who are yet to be named. These women's lives matter. We need a national plan to eliminate violence against women that is fully funded, and we need a standalone, self-determined plan for First Nations women. These plans must address the drivers of gendered violence with expert-led prevention programs. They must provide for crisis accommodation and address the housing crisis that means women are forced to choose between homelessness or violence. This government must fully fund frontline services so no woman is turned away. Senator Grogan. The South Australian health system is in crisis and lives are being put at risk by the Marshall Liberal government and their neglect of the health system. We've heard deeply alarming reports from workers, including hospital orderlies, cleaners, sterilisation technicians and patient services assistants. And they're telling us the understaffing and a lack of training, PPE and infection control processes are putting patients' lives at risk. 
This public health crisis has been the subject of a campaign by South Australian public health workers and the United Workers' Union. And that campaign has ramped up today. These essential workers, our health heroes, if you will, are reporting major understaffing and safety concerns at four Adelaide major hospitals, the Women's and Children's Hospital, the Queen Elizabeth, the Royal Adelaide and the Flinders Medical Centre. These major hospitals are reporting major issues. And just one example that we've heard from sterilisation technicians is that they are being directed to reuse single-use face shields. At a time when we are trying to encourage people to take major precautions, it is unconscionable that our health system is advising workers to not do the same. Reports like this have prompted unprecedented action from the United Workers' Union in undertaking safety checks, and I commend them for this action. It does come amidst a wider action that's being taken, including work bans across more than 25 hospitals in South Australia, aged care facilities um, and other related health organisations. And it comes amid ongoing privatisation attacks and job security attacks on these essential workers by the Marshall government. I stand in solidarity with these workers and with the United Workers' Union. Senator Hanson, remotely. Senator Hanson, are you there? Okay. We will move on to Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to celebrate the incredible investment the Morrison government is making in homegrown Australian manufacturing. I come from a very proud manufacturing state, and one of the most important foundations of our $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy is to reinvigorate homegrown, sustainable, self-sufficient manufacturing in this country. And I know, Madam Deputy President, that so many Australians in the wake of the COVID pandemic want to see Australia become a more resilient and self-sufficient nation. And manufacturing is at the core of the concerns of so many Australians. So I just want to uh, commend the work of our government in contrast to Labor when Labor was last in power. One in every eight manufacturing jobs was lost, but we are seeing a, a massive boom in manufacturing, uh, getting the economic conditions right, making Order. science and technology work for industry, focusing on areas of advantage. Our six national manufacturing pro and priorities, including medical products and food and beverage manufacturing, and building national resilience. And I have to say, as part of our many, many grants that we are providing, incentives to Australian manufacturers, I was so proud to uh, join with the minister, Minister Taylor, in announcing a $4.8 million grant for uh, a company. Uh, which is manufacturing uh, its planet protector packaging uh, using sheep waste wool to manufacture wool pack, which is a sustainable packaging alternative. This is a wonderful initiative uh, driving new innovation in our country, and of course it's happening right in Geelong. I'm very, very proud of the work that we are doing locally. Thank you very much. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Many Australians agree that we have an obligation to support less developed countries. Some see this as a moral duty to help those less fortunate than ourselves. Others see it as foreign, a foreign policy tool to help build our reputation and support in international institutions. And some see it as pragmatic, a way to have a safer, more prosperous region. Whatever the motivation, many understand the importance of international development. This year, Australia will have spent over four and a half billion dollars on foreign aid. It sounds like a lot, but it is cut, a cut of almost half in real terms from a decade ago. And it is nowhere near enough. Given how little we spend, we must ensure money is being used effectively, that we are getting the most bang for our buck. But there are questions about whether this is the case. An example is tied spending. 
The government formally ended this practice where aid money goes directly to large Australian organisations. This approach helps Australian businesses but does little to help poor countries. So it was alarming to read a report from the European Network on Debt and Development, which found tying may be dead. But, but, 95% of our aid spending still goes to Australian organisations. 95%. How can we believe our foreign aid spending is doing as much as it can when it is not flowing to the less developed countries, but to a bunch of offices clustered around Parliament House. We surely can do better than this, and we must do better than this. Senator Ayres. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, Dylan Pugh is a giant of Australian conservation uh, and of the arts. Son of Clifton Pugh, the artist whose defining portrait of Gough Whitlam hangs in the gallery upstairs, Dylan was, was a founder of the Big Scrub Environment Centre and the North East Forest Alliance. His son, Azrin Pugh, is an environmental and labour movement activist. In his late teens, he was a founding member of the Labor Environment Action Network, together with Senators McAllister and Keneally. In the tradition of the two Bobs in New South Wales, Debus and Carr, embodying the Labor movement and the Labor Party's commitment to protecting the environment for all Australians. Azrin Pugh is Labor's candidate for Byron Shire Council, and if elected as mayor, would be a fresh start for a council with big problems, overcrowding, housing crisis, environmental challenges. Why then is the Greens political party preferencing, in their registered how to vote, the Nationals candidate for mayor in a sleazy, glubby, grubby, Greens national preference deal to try and stop an energetic young progressive. You can't trust the Greens political party not to do preference deals with their friends like Senator Canavan in the National Party. From Cape Byron to Mount Warning to the North East Forest to the, to the border ranges all the way south to Coffs Harbour. Those remnants of the big scrub rainforest have been protected by genuine environmentalists, many engaging in long protests, but in cooperation with Labor governments that have actually delivered national parks. Why is it that the Greens political party prioritise partisan, narrow self-interest in sleazy deals with the National Party in the Senator Ayres, your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Adam Deacon, Madam Deacon, President. I've got news for the charities, churches and advocates out there who wrote about complying with the donations rules for us through yesterday. I don't want you to worry about them. Nobody else does. They're completely optional. If you don't want to disclose your donations under these new laws, just leave them off the record. That's how the Liberal and Labor parties do it. A bunch of you charities won't have learned about this stuff before, so let me give you a short course on how it works. Say you've got a donor lined up who wants to help you out, but they're a little shy. They'd rather not let the whole world know they're handing you money. No worries, because that donor can give you 4,499 bucks every day of the week. Anything up to that amount gets you a free pass. Isn't that fabulous? Right on the Monopoly board. Even better, they can give you 4499 the next day too, and the day after that, and the day after that. It's fabulous. Every day, 365 days a week, and you can easily get away with not having to clear a set. But maybe you're thinking you want to take more than that in a day. Easy. Take your donor out to a fundraising dinner, charge whatever you like for a ticket. No need to make it public. Isn't this fabulous stuff? Can't be bothered to run a dinner? That's fine too. Ask your body to pay you from a trust fund. Just make sure you call it a blind trust. And you're getting the go here. You're right up there. If you need our help on how this works, ask the Libs to explain it to you. Let's say you mess up and accidentally follow the rule. Good news is there. You don't have to disclose anything for up to 19 months after the money's changed hands anyway. None of this is illegal. It's all within the rules. It's how these guys up here play the game, so you might as well play it right back at them. The bill yesterday doesn't give us more transparency. It doesn't stop, stamp out the power of money in politics. If Liberal and Labor actually wanted to do that, they'd strengthen the laws we put on ourselves. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Uh, we are constantly told that the government's responses to the coronavirus are guided by the science. Well, if, the, if we are 
adopting the science. Where are our rapid tests? Australia has been way behind the use of home, at-home rapid tests for a long time. Rapid antigen tests have been commercially available in the US since at least May, whereas our authorities had not even approved them until November just a month ago. Still, since rapid tests at home have been available, they have not been adopted for widespread use. Industries that require regular testing, like truck drivers, must still conduct invasive PCR tests that can take hours, sometimes days, before they get their results. This stops people from earning a living while they are waiting for test results and does nothing to make us safer. Why haven't we adopted rapid tests earlier? Well, in September, the head of the TGA said that one reason for the delay uh, was due to our low vaccination rates. It is all about the science. Other countries have been using rapid tests to provide an easy option to facilitate travel and business. The Queensland government will open its borders in the next few weeks, but it will require a negative PCR test for anybody seeking to arrive. Why wouldn't we allow the use of rapid tests so that we can make travel to Queensland easier and hassle-free? Rapid tests could help the Queensland tourism industry more rapidly find its feet. But state government and private companies are making a lot of money. Uh, off the PCR test, especially when the Australian government picks up most of the bill. So perhaps that is the reason why there seems to be an institutional reluctance to adopt rapid tests more rapidly. Rapid tests could also offer an alternative to the cruel and inhumane vaccine mandates that are spreading quicker than the coronavirus around what was previously the free country of Australia. I support those trade unions that are backing the use of rapid tests as a way to let people keep their jobs. Given that vaccinated people can still catch and spread coronavirus, rapid testing could be an even safer way to prevent coronavirus spread at the workplace, guaranteeing that every Australian should have a right to work. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. There's a saying, ageing is a privilege. But the, for those who participated in or have read the, the report of the Aged Care Royal Commission, it would be reasonable to think that when you're in aged care, Ageing is a punishment. It's almost a year since the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety handed down its final report. 148 recommendations were made to ensure older Australians could live with dignity and respect as they entered the residential aged care system. So just how many of these 148 recommendations have been implemented? Where's the government's urgency to implement these recommendations and improve the system to ensure older Australians live with dignity and respect. We have so few parliamentary sitting days next year. I can't fathom out uh, this when uh, there's so many important recommendations that the parliament could be implementing to improve residential aged care. For a start, the parliament could implement my, my bill to ensure that there's at least one registered nurse on call 24-7 in every aged care facility. Nursing homes, uh, nursing home residents, their families, the aged care workforce and the wider community cannot wait any longer. My bill will raise the, care, uh, the quality of care to residents. Having a registered nurse present will improve, uh, will improve quality. It will improve communication between the resident, family and other health care professionals. It will promote preventative health care and address wellbeing risks that contribute to the restorative care. The Morrison government need to stop pushing residential aged care reform into the too hard basket. It's not too hard. Like so many issues, the recommendations are there waiting for the parliament to act on. Senator Bilek remotely. Thank you. Dementia is one of the greatest health challenges facing Australia. With 472,000 Australians living with dementia and 1.6 million Australians involved in their care, Many Australians, including myself, have had some personal experience with the disease. Many people with dementia face stigma and discrimination, which leads to social isolation. And this, of course, has been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Dementia Australia is working to overcome this with their Dementia Friendly Communities program. There are currently 51 dementia friendly communities across Australia, including two in my home state of Tasmania. They involve activities which aim to improve knowledge and awareness about dementia, reduce stigma and discrimination, and promote social engagement. One aspect of the program is becoming a dementia friend. 33,000 Australians have so far signed up as dementia friends and have watched short videos and read resources to better understand how to engage and socially connect with people living with dementia. 
People with dementia have described dementia-friendly communities as life-changing. I congratulate Dementia Australia on this initiative, and I'll continue to work with the wonderful Kath Shearer and Di Carter from Dementia Friendly Tasmania to help them maintain a dementia-friendly community in Greater Hobart. And with the short amount of time I have left, I'd like to wish all my parliamentary colleagues a happy and safe Christmas and New Year, as well as all my constituents across the great state of Tasmania. This will probably be the last speech I make this year. I'm disappointed not to have been able to attend Parliament due to my health, but I thank every colleague who sent me well wishes. I'm hoping to be back next year all going well, fingers crossed. Also, thanks to my wonderful staff and my local community for their amazing support throughout the year. I'm looking forward to the new year, to the upcoming federal election, and to making my contribution to the election of Senator an Albanese Billick, your time has government. expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it is now nearly nine years since uh, thousands of people were exiled uh, to either Manus Island or to Nauru just because they reached out a hand to our country for help and asked to seek asylum in our country. And some of those people are still in prison today, nearly nine years down the track, having done nothing whatsoever wrong, having committed no crime whatsoever, and they remain imprisoned here in Australia today. Now, it's really good news that 10 more people from that cohort have recently been released from hotel prisons into the Australian community. But there are still 75 people from that cohort who are still imprisoned in our hotel prison system or in immigration detention. And these people deserve answers. And I asked the minister today, why is it that these people are still in detention, coming up on nine years now, where they've been brutalised, dehumanised, they've watched their friends die, they've seen um, murders, they've seen rapes, They've seen child sex abuse. They've seen children with resignation uh, syndrome who can't get out of bed in the morning and cease all communication with the world. They've been beaten by police. They have been absolutely had their, li their living human rights trampled over by the governments of Papua New Guinea, Nauru and Australia, and some are still in detention today. The minister must now release the last remaining members of those cohort of that cohort who are in detention in Australia release them into the community give them the freedom and safety they deserve Senator Van thank you uh, I'd like to end of the year with a little bit of lightness and joy um, and as the year draws to a close and the 2021 sitting period comes to an end I want to finish off by wishing everyone a very Merry Christmas. For the people in my home state of Victoria, 2021 and 2020 were very tough years with, the, with Premier Andrew's constant lockdowns. However, as we come into summer holidays, it's important to recognise that the future is looking bright. The Morrison government has done an amazing job over the COVID-19 period, and now with over 92 per cent of the population protected with a first dose, we have very much to look forward to. Travel is now back on the tables for many of us, and I hope that many of you in your holidays have the opportunity to travel around Australia, see, support the local businesses, see our great country, or now travel overseas. It is my hope that over the summer period uh, you all get to spend some time with your loved ones and your family. If COVID-19 taught us anything, it is how important it is to be able to spend some time with our loved ones. Time is precious and every moment with them counts. I would like to be able to get to uh, Western Australia and see my father-in-law or my parents-in-law uh, as he is not very well. This year has been a divisive year for some, so I encourage us all to take time to reflect on how we are get engaging with those around us and how we can all make more positive influence in people's lives. I wish everyone, particularly my colleagues here in the Senate, a healthy, Happy restful Christmas break. And I look forward to seeing you here again next year. Thank you. Senator Pratt, remotely.
Senator Pratt, our, we can't hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Our ABC is a critical national institution that's provided free, unbiased and quality news and entertainment broadcasting for nearly 100 years. Unfortunately, our Morrison Liberal National Government seems hell-bent on ripping it apart. Currently, the ABC receives its funding in three yearly cycles, and as we have seen over and over again, it leaves the ABC vulnerable to the political whims of the government of the day. The current funding arrangement erodes the ABC's capacity for impartiality and leaves it open to financial attack from the government of the day. And as we know, destroying the ABC is deep in the Morrison government's DNA. I remember the attacks from earlier this year from members of this place in the Senate, labelling the ABC a taxpayer-funded activist group at war with the mainstream of Australian values. Are these people serious? Just for a second, imagine being a person that wants to destroy the service that provides fire emergency broadcasting. Perhaps, though, this should not come as a surprise. We all remember from the experience in 2020 that our Prime Minister and his government couldn't give a flying fire truck about fire affected communities. Labor in government would grant the ABC the certainty that they require to make investments and go forward in a way that maximises the output they have and the services they provide and that we all rely on. For Christmas, I want to plan, and many other Australians want to plan, to end the attacks on the ABC and support our national public broadcaster. Thank you. Senator Hanson, remotely. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just like to put on record, my thoughts of being a senator. I think that I'm very privileged to actually have this position, and I'm very grateful for the people of Queensland voting me in. But I think it also needs to be noted how my feelings about one of the other senators in the chamber, that's Green Senator Lydia Thorpe. Her comments yesterday to Senator Holly Hughes, I think is absolutely disgusting. I wasn't in the chamber, but having read about it, it needs to be brought to you. To, Sen uh, Stop the clock. Senator Hanson, Sen we have a point of order in the chamber. Senator McKim. Um, thank you. Senator Hanson is reflecting uh, on a senator who is not in the chamber, and they are personal reflections that she is making uh, on that senator, and I ask you to rule her out of order for making those reflections. Sorry, that is not a point of order. Senator, senator Hanson, uh, I, I will give you the call back for one minute, 27 seconds. But I will remind you that it is not appropriate to make uh, personal reflections on other senators. Um, I can make com comments about the behaviour in that chamber. S S Senator Hanson, you have the call if you wish to take it, but please avoid reflecting on other senators. Comments and what has been said in this chamber is utterly disgusting. And the fact is that senators must take Stop into reflection. Stop the clock, reflection. Senator Hanson. Sorry, I didn't mention any names then. I'm talking Senator about Hanson. The senator Hanson, we have a senator on his feet on a point of order. Senator McKim. Th thank you very much, uh, President. It is the same point of order that I made before, and I submit to you that Senator Hanson is continuing to reflect on a senator. The context of her comments make it abundantly clear which senator she is referring to, particularly as just moments ago she did in fact uh, mention the relevant senator's name. And in doing that, she is actually in defiance of the ruling that you just uh, issued to her president. So I do ask you once again, please, to rule Senator Hanson out of order for the comments that she has just made, based on the fact she is personally reflecting on a senator. Sen Senator McKim, thank you for your point of order. Senator Hanson, I will give you the call back for 30 seconds, but once again I remind you that we must be within standing orders. Senator Hanson, you have the call. 
I just find it absolutely amazing that McKim would actually stand there and make references uh, Senator to— Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson. Senator McKim, resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McKim, resume your seat. Senator Hanson, we certainly do not refer to senators in that way, but it being 2 p.m., we will now move to questions uh, without notice. There are a bunch Senator, of Senator Hanson. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Two of Mr. Morrison's closest friends, Scott Briggs and David Gazard, were handpicked by the Morrison government to receive $80,000 of taxpayer money without any tender process to start up their own private sector quarantine business, Quarantine Services Australia. On their website, Mr. Briggs and Mr. Gazard boast of their close personal relationship with Mr. Morrison, sharing articles which say the pair are, quote, as about as close to the Prime Minister's inner circle as you can get, and revealing that Mr. Gazard, quote, speaks to the PM daily. Has Mr. Morrison ever spoken with either Scott Briggs or David Gazard about a private sector quarantine proposal? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally for her question. Uh, albeit it's another example of the mud raking and throwing that those opposite seek to engage in. Mr. President, the answer to the last part of the question, to the best part of my knowledge, is no, never. If there is anything to update in relation to that, I will check and provide it to the Chamber. But that is certainly my understanding because the Prime Minister had no involvement whatsoever in the decision of the Department of Home Affairs to award that contract. No involvement. The contract decision was entirely a matter for the Department of Home Affairs. As the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs himself made clear to Senator Keneally at estimates on 25 October, the engagement and the contract had nothing to do with ministers, their staff, or their offices and was personally overseen and managed by the department. Senate order. Senator McAllister. Senator Keneally, you have the call. A supplementary question. Thank you. According to a report by Sky News, Home Affairs Secretary Michael Pizzullo reportedly told business leaders that the Quarantine Services Australia deal was, quote, a really important project for the Prime Minister. Given this is a really important project for the Prime Minister, has Mr Morrison recused himself from any and all Cabinet discussions about the proposal? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, um, uh, the answer effectively is yes, uh, Mr President. Um, uh, however, uh, as I said, as I said Order. earlier, that is, that is only once he became even aware of the fact that anything existed in relation to discussions. Because, Mr. President, Mr. President, Order. Mr. President, these, this contract, this matter, was all, as I said before, executed by the department, by the department, without any engagement by the Prime Minister. Or ministers. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Can the minister confirm on what date the Prime Minister recused himself from any and all cabinet discussions in relation to Quarantine Services Australia? Minister. I'll take that on notice, Mr. President, but again reiterate uh, that in terms of uh, the uh, contract and the engagement there, that was a matter undertaken by the department with no discussion, uh, approval or otherwise, and by the Prime Minister. We'll now go to Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on the achievements of Australians throughout 2021 and how this Liberal National Government has had a plan to support Australian families and businesses throughout the challenges of COVID-19 this year. Oh, sorry. Call the minister, Minister Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Small uh, for his question, and in thanking Senator Small, uh, I want to, in particular, uh, thank uh, all Australians uh, who we are indebted and grateful to for all they have done throughout 2021 as a nation to stand together, uh, particularly in the face of the once-in-a-century global pandemic that our nation and the world has been grappling with, which has resulted in the largest economic shock to the world since the Great Depression. Australians have demonstrated their resilience and they should be congratulated and thanked for the efforts they have made, including coming out in droves to get vaccinated. More than 39 million doses administered nationally, more than 92 per cent of the eligible population over 16 having had a first dose and more than 87 per cent now having had a second dose. COVID continues to be an enormous challenge right around the world. Only a few months ago, the Delta strain was wreaking havoc here, as it has across so many nations as the dominant variant. But lockdowns and restrictions put in place uh, have helped to save lives and livelihoods alongside the strong economic policies and support measures that have been in place. Australia has fared far better than much of the rest of the world. On a per capita basis, the UK and USA have had over 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. By avoiding death rates such as in OECD nations, we've managed to save over 30,000 lives. We've also fared far better than most countries on the economic front. Whilst we saw a contraction in the September quarter, this was during the period of the lockdowns across New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. But our economy has been roaring back. Job ads are more than 30 per cent higher than they were at the start of the pandemic. In fact, they're at a 12-year high. More than 350,000 jobs have come back since the start of September. We're on a pathway to see unemployment at or below 5 per cent for a sustained period. Only the second time that's happened in 50 years. That's the strength, and that's thanks to the hard work of Australians. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Birmingham, how do the efforts of Australians in rolling up their sleeves to make Australia one of the most highly vaccinated nations in the world provide us with the confidence to safe, safely reopen, stay safely open and live with the virus as we look ahead to 2022? Minister. Mr President, our national plan for reopening that the Prime Minister drove and ensured we had the expertise of the Doherty Institute to underpin and took through National Cabinet has relied upon Australians rolling up their sleeves to get vaccinated, and we thank them for doing that. In fact, they've become champions at it, delivering such high, globally high uh, vaccine rates across Australia. It is this that makes possible the safe reopening across our country. It's the incredible outcome made possible by all of the health workers and those who have both risked their lives to help people suffering from COVID-19 but also helping to protect us all through the rollout of the vaccination program. That journey is not over. We are now one of the first countries in the world to roll out a comprehensive nationwide booster program to make sure people can be as safe and as protected as possible. We've got access to more than 151 million additional doses, and the boosters will be freely available to anyone who is fully vaccinated. This is something we can all look forward to Minister, in 2022. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Small, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will this government's plan continue to provide the confidence to sustain our economic recovery? And indeed, what are the risks to a stronger and brighter future for all Australians in 2022? Minister. Mr President, we entered this pandemic from a position of economic strength, having brought the budget back to the point of balance for the first time in 11 years. This provided us with the fiscal artillery to be able to re respond comprehensively throughout the pandemic with $311 billion in direct economic and health support. JobKeeper, the coronavirus supplement, record business tax incentives to drive more investment through the economy, introduce and extending temporary full expensing and loss carryback arrangements. All of them have helped to ensure that our economy gets through COVID strongly and comes out of it strongly. At the same time, $10.2 billion in tax relief flowed to 11.5 million Australians just during the September quarter, the largest tax cuts to flow in a single quarter in 20 years. We may have been able to do all of this because we've stuck to our plan, kept our economy strong, kept Australian businesses strong, and the world can only but wonder what it would have been like had the Labor Party and their higher taxes been there instead Minister, of the actions that we Minister, have taken to keep your time such strength. Has expired. Senator Ayres.
My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison claimed that Liberal Party ads aired during the national bushfire emergency were simply communicating government policy decisions, despite being authorised by the Liberal Party and the host page, including a donation button. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, um, all, parties, uh, all parties communicate uh, policies and messages uh, on behalf of uh, their uh, MPs and their representatives uh, and promote and communicate uh, those messages. There's nothing unusual uh, about that uh, and, indeed, using as many communication channels as is possible to get those messages out is the appropriate thing uh, to be doing uh, for all of us. Your party does it, our party does it, others do it. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Order. Mr Order. Morrison claimed that he had a comprehensive conversation with Zoe Salucci McDermott, a bushfire victim in Cabago, but video footage showed that the only words he said to her were, I understand, I understand, while he turned his back to her and walked away. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, I, I have faced enough opposition questions now to, uh, to know that the context of them can sometimes be uh, distorted in terms of what the quotes that might be being used are uh, or the basis upon which those quotes uh, are being used. Um, it, is, of course, it is, of course, evidence, as I said when I rose in response to the very first question today, uh, that yet again those opposite don't come in here to ask policy questions. They don't come in here to ask questions about uh, the issues facing Australians in their jobs, their lives, uh, the tax they might pay, uh, the threats indeed that uh, they might face, be they uh, domestic or foreign, or any of those types of challenges. No, they come in uh, just with an agenda uh, of muckraking, of Order. mud throwing. Order. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Ayers. I mean, self-evidently, it's relevance. The, the, the question Are you rising was about why he made a claim that wasn't true. And he hasn't remotely approached that question. Minister, Minister I will bring you back to the question. Uh, you have the call. You have 16 seconds remaining. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I don't accept the premise of the Senator's question in, uh, in, uh, in relation uh, to the assertions he makes. Uh, Mr. President, on this side, uh, we're going to proudly continue to not engage in that sort of muckraking, but focus outside of this building on Australians, their jobs, Minister, their families, Minister, their lives, and helping to make them. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary question. Mr. Morrison claimed that he took the bushfire preparedness advice of former fire commissioners, but they say he ignored their meeting requests for months and rejected urgent funding requests. Why did he claim this when it wasn't true? Does Mr Morrison still maintain that he has never told a lie in public life? Minister. Uh, Mr. Po Mr President, I'm, I'm sure he does, and I'm sure he does uh, because he engages comprehensively across public life in Australia with Australians from all walks of life. And I know uh, that the Prime Minister uh, is looking forward uh, to not spending so much of his time uh, in this building uh, answering Order. these types of grubby questions, but that he's looking Order. forward to returning to the ability to get out there and talk to Order, real Australians. Senator and talk to Senator real Australians about our job creation policies. Talk to real Australians about those policies that have created those 350,000 jobs since September. Talk to real Australians about the record numbers of new apprenticeship commencements lately. Talk to real Australians about the more than 300,000 people who have been, who've been helped into their first home as a result of the new home ownership policies our government has implemented. Scott Morrison has championed. Talk to them about what they're doing with the tax cuts that they've received and how they're using them to get ahead as a family. Minister, That's what we'll be doing Minister, for real Australians. Your time has expired. Senator Cox. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Minister Rustin. The International Energy Agency said we cannot open up not even one more new coal, oil or gas project to meet net zero by 2050. 
Under the National Gas Infrastructure Plan announced last week, the Morrison government wants to open up three massive new gas basins and up to 11 gas pipelines. This pl plan for massive gas expansion locks in the devastating global heating and pushes 1.5 de degrees beyond reach. Minister, can you, you can't— Continue, Senator Cox. Order on my right. Minister, you can't implement the National Gas Infrastructure Plan and meet net zero by 2050. Which one do you choose? The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Cox uh, for her question. Well, Senator Cox, I actually have to disagree with your uh, assessment of uh, the ability to be able to deliver the National Gas Infrastructure Plan. Um, at the same time as meeting uh, the targets that we committed internationally uh, to, uh, to make sure that we achieve a net zero by 2050. Uh, so in the absolute express answer and explicit answer to your question is I do believe that both are achievable simultaneously. But what I can also add to Order. that, Senator Cox, uh, through you, Mr President, is that this government absolutely remains committed to meeting all of its uh, commitments, all of its targets and all of its promises to Australia. And that includes making sure that we deliver affordable and reliable energy to support the economy, to support the economy so that the economy supports jobs and so that jobs are available for Australians so that they can have the opportunity to be able to access uh, the opportunities that are presented by our resource sector going into the future. But we also absolutely are committed to meeting our targets. I mean, our track record so far as a government in terms of meeting targets that have previously been agreed to is exceptional. We meet our targets and we exceed our targets. And, and there is every possibility uh, that you know, we will continue to do that. We certainly are intending to exceed our targets as we go through 2030. So, Senator Cox, um, through you, Mr Chair, um, we are, as a government, absolutely committed to the delivery of the National Gas Infrastructure. Structure plan because it is absolutely imperative to rural and regional Australia, the jobs Order. and the businesses Senator and the economies McKim. of people that live outside the capital cities. And I know most of you live in capital cities, but this is a program that not only supports all Australians, allows Australians to be able to benefit from the wealth of the resources that sit under our ground, but it supports our regional communities, their economies and the jobs for people that live in regional Australia. And I would have thought that that's what you would have wanted to Minister, Minister, your time has expired. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Uh, WA Premier Mark McGowan has said that he would do whatever it takes to come to Woodside's aid if it loses the upcoming Supreme Court case over the Scarborough project. Minister, will you also be supporting the blanket protection of the gas industry offered up by the West Australian Premier? Minister. Order. Thank, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, what this government will continue to do is to provide the appropriate protections to yeah, yeah. all Australian yeah, businesses yeah. that are afforded through the extraordinary amount of regulation that's put in place to make sure that we have a balanced response, but we also protect uh, our f our the future of this country. And the resource sector Order. provides Australia with an amazing opportunity for, for our growth and our wealth. And a responsible way of extracting those resources to the benefit of all Australians is what this government will do. But we have in place extraordinary regulation and extraordinary regulators to make sure it's done in a way that is appropriate, that doesn't damage our environment, but at the same time provides the economic development that Australia and all Australians deserve to be able to benefit from, which is our amazing resources sector. Uh, and, uh, and through you, Mr Chair, Senator Cox, um, rural and regional Australia has lived off the sheep's back and out of the resources that come out of our ground for many years, and it will continue Minister, to do so. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cox, a second supplementary. How does the government intend to offset the astronomical scale of emissions from Scarborough and the Beedaloo gas projects? Because to everyone else, this is simply not believable. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I, I think you know the, the statement um, that Senator Cox just made um, is is uh, is completely inaccurate, and I completely refute it. I don't believe everybody uh, believes the, the statement that you've just put forward to the chamber, Senator Cox. In fact, I think that most reasonable Australians actually understand uh, that that you know Order. good governments actually can balance out 
the, uh, making sure that we look after our, uh, our environment, but at the same time making sure that our economy is strong, because a strong economy supports all Australians, uh, and that includes people that live in rural and regional Australia as well as those that live in the city. But we know that our gas-fired recovery is extremely important for Australia. We will do it in a responsible way that doesn't damage the environment, and, and, but we will not do it in a way that damages Australian businesses, puts jobs on the line, and. Senator Rice, on a point of order. Thank point of you, order on, on relevant, Senator Cox's question was very clear. How are you going to offset the emissions? Uh, I, I, was, uh, I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I believe the minister was uh, being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, to the interjection uh, or the point of order, the same way we always do, Senator uh, Rice, and that is responsibly and via a regulated yeah. mechanism. Order. Thank you, Minister. And we now go to Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and relates to the implementation of the AUKUS agreement. Isn't it the case that to implement transfers of nuclear material to fuel any Australian nuclear submarine, it will be necessary for Australia to conclude a specific arrangement with the International Atomic Energy Agency in accordance with Article 14 of our 1974 Nuclear Safeguards Agreement with the IAEA. Isn't it a fact that in more than 40 years in which the IAEA have been implementing uh, comprehensive nuclear safeguard agreements, the agency has never concluded a paragraph 14 agreement? Uh, isn't this uh, required agreement unpre unprecedented? Isn't it the case that the approval by the IAEA Board of Governors will be required for the agency to agree to a paragraph 14 agreement with Australia. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Patrick, for uh, your question. And there are a number of um, issues that you have raised in that question. I'll try and canvas uh, as many of them uh, as I can. Uh, in the first instance, can I say that Australia has uh, been uh, very strongly engaged with the IAEA since the uh, notification since the announcement of uh, AUKUS itself. We uh, notified the IAEA uh, as soon as the announcement occurred. The Prime Minister himself met with Director General Grossi on the 2nd of November. Importantly, Mr President, Australia comes to this table uh, absolutely steadfast in our support of the nuclear non-proliferation regime and its cornerstone, the NPT. There is no change to our status as a non-nuclear weapon state, and we will comply with our obligations under the NPT. In fact, we have one of the best nuclear weapons non-proliferation reputations in the world. And go to that further, um, Mr. President. But let me also record for the record that neither the NPT nor Australia's Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement with the IAEA prohibit naval nuclear pro proliferation. Uh, we aim to set the highest possible non-proliferation standard and strengthen the integrity, indeed, of the non-proliferation architecture. Australia delivered a trilateral statement with the United Kingdom and the United States during the IAEA Board of Governors meeting last week, uh, from the 24th to the 26th of November. That statement emphasised that Australia does not and will not seek nuclear weapons, our willingness and intent to proceed in an open and consultative manner, especially regarding issues of nuclear material, facilities and, and activities relevant to the IAEA. Our cooperation will be fully consistent with the three parties' respective non-proliferation obligations and that this cooperation will be pursued in a, matter, in a manner that preserves the integrity of the non-proliferation regime. As is publicly known, Minister, many of the program Minister, specifics have yet to be determined Minister, across the next 18 your time months period. Has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, last week, Australian Ambassador Richard Sadler uh, sought to persuade the uh, IAEA board that consideration of AUKUS is premature. The board, at China's initiative, agreed to include the transfer of nuclear materials in the context of AUKUS and, and nuclear safeguards as an agenda item. Mr Sadler argued China's proposal to establish a spe special committee to look at AUKUS issues would politicise board deliberations. Is China trying to politicise these board deliberations? Minister. Uh, Mr President, uh, in relation to uh, whether the, the matter does or does not become an agenda item, 
Uh, our trilateral statement noted uh, that a board agenda item addressing safeguards related to an Australian nuclear-powered submarine program is premature. When there are significant developments to report and in the interests of transparency, we are happy, uh, indeed very keen, to update the board in the future under the AOB as we intended to do at this meeting. The statement also noted that there have been some mischaracterisations of the AUKUS partnership and Australia's acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines, and it clarified those. So I don't entirely agree with Senator Patrick's uh, description of Ambassador Sadlier's approach, but that is, uh, that is the way in which uh, the matter was dealt with uh, on the agenda, uh, Mr President. Can I say that uh, we have seen willful disinformation in relation to uh, the AUKUS announcement from a number of parties, and that disinformation um, compounds Minister, multiple Minister, offences of a similar nature Minister, this year. Your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a second supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Mr President. Minister, how concerned are you that China and Russia will seek to obstruct uh, IAEA board approval of the safeguard arrangements that will be required to implement the AUKUS nuclear submarine program. Are you concerned that AUKUS will be hostage to other issues on the IAEA agenda, Iran's nuclear ambitions and what to do with North Korea? What is your diplomatic strategy to overcome these risks? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Patrick for his uh, supplementary question. We expect all members of the IAEA board uh, and, in fact, members of the international community to act responsibly, uh, to engage in the uh, accurate, uh, uh, accurate dissemination of information, not disinformation or misinformation for that matter. That goes to these matters, Mr President, and, of course, many others, as I have stated repeatedly during the pandemic in particular, uh, and this is no exception. In relation to the IAEA, we will uh, continue to work transparently and openly within it and with the IAEA. We'll engage in the, uh, in, with the IAEA in a manner that is consistent with the established rules and practices of the IAEA. Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom will not be playing political games which undermine that very architecture. We know that it goes to the heart of the importance of this process, and we intend to work within that constructively, openly and transparently. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberals and the Nationals in government are delivering for regional Australia to provide confidence for small business and families for a stronger future in 2022? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Davey, for your question and your strong advocacy uh, for the regions. Mr President, the Liberal and National governments are the only governments that can deliver for regional Australia because, after all, we are the most in touch with the millions of Australians who actually live and work in these beautiful parts of our nation. Many of us on both the Liberal Party and the Nationals actually live and raise our families in these regions. Not the Greens, I must say, uh, who do their very best every single day in this place to shut down sustainable, best practice rural industries like forestry every single day, there are, or the Labor Party, who continually turn their backs on blue-collar workers slogging it out in our mining, resources and manufacturing industries. It is the Liberal and Nationals who have the track record of delivering for regional Australia and will continue to Order. do so. Based on the current investments Senator and previous investments our governments have made, we'll be providing over $100 billion to the regions to 2030. Over 2021, we've delivered a multitude of programs that have supported regional Australia in infrastructure, telecommunications, health education, Order. agriculture, tourism and resources sector. Senator We're supporting local businesses to create Ayers. jobs. More than 2,500 Australians have been employed in constructing the inland rail alone, which has seen more than 400 companies across the nation share in over $2.2 billion worth of contract for supplying. And we haven't stopped there. We're about getting people, produce and products where they are needed. The success of the regions that we're currently experiencing accelerated under COVID-19 didn't just happen. It took hard work and on-the-ground leadership. It's a direct result of the entrepreneurial spirit, the drive of the local people, infrastructure investment and government policy to connect regional Australia to enable our products to reach markets across the globe. 
and we wouldn't have all gotten through this year had it not been for our farmers, truckies, doctors, nurses, community pharmacists, teachers Minister, and emergency Minister, service personnel. Your time has expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and I too acknowledge that we got through the year on the back of regional industries. Uh, what is the government doing to ensure those living in rural and regional Australia will have access to quality 21st century telecommunications? Minister. Well, Senator Davey, Order. I can. As part of the Liberal National Government's wi wider regionalisation agenda, we want to see people living and working out in the regions, especially across northern Australia. We, but to do that, you actually have to have access to 21st century telecommunication, particularly the type of telecommunications that's taken for granted uh, by those people living in cities. And I, our government wants to make that transition easy uh, by increasing their digital experience. Connectivity helps regional businesses grow, creating jobs. It helps people in regional Australia to work remotely. It dissolves the distance. And today I was pleased to launch the second round of the regional connectivity program that supports unique place-based connectivity solutions to the tune of $112 uh, million dollars. $45 million of that will be quarantined for projects uh, to unlock that potential of Northern Australia. And it was great to stand and make that announcement with a champion for Northern Australia, uh, Matt Canavan. Under round one of the program, uh, we saw Minister, so many— pro oh. Minister, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Davey, a second supplementary. Too much good things to say. Um, given the high risk weather season that is currently upon us, how is our government ensuring that telecommunications in regional and rural Australia is adequate and resilient in times of need to keep people safe and connected? Minister. Firstly, I'd like to thank the thousand of first responders and volunteers who do so much for Australia and Australians at our time of need. And without them, uh, we would be in a very, very different place. And right now, we've got the floods in New South Wales. Uh, first responders have received over 5,000 calls and uh, have assisted in over 140 rescues uh, through this period. We know that increased connectivity can save lives, and because of our mobile black spot program alone that we've rolled out since coming to government, nearly 68,000 calls have been made to triple zero that wouldn't have been able to be made by regional Australians. That's real evidence that we're helping to save lives and livelihoods. Our government is delivering over $37 million to prevent, mitigate and manage telecommunication outages in natural disasters through our STAND program. That extends the battery backup uh, to our mobile black swap program. Better telecommunications for our rural and country fire service, depots and evacuation centres is one way Minister, we can say thank you to Minister, our first responders. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. It was revealed publicly today that when Liberal MP Bridget Archer told Mr Morrison's office that she was considering voting against the cashless debit card, two senior members of his staff literally stood over her in her office. Ms Archer spoke against the cashless welfare card legislation, then abstained from voting. Ms Archer has said that she felt bullied threatened and intimidated by these staffers Order. for almost two weeks. Is Mr Morrison aware of who the staff are? The, the order, order, order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Senator, uh, thanks, Mr President, and I thank Senator McCarthy uh, for the question. Um, the member for Bass is, uh, is somebody who I consider to be a good friend and I know is a powerful advocate for her community, and she brings um, strong principles and strong opinions to this place, like many uh, on this side of the chamber and all across the chamber, uh, brings strong principles and strong opinions in, uh, in their service. Uh, now, like all parties, like all parties uh, obviously, when people are looking to differ, uh, then discussions are had uh, ideally around those differences. In our side, ultimately, as Ms Archer did on that occasion, she was free as a Liberal Party MP uh, to not necessarily vote. Or, uh, Minister. On relevance, uh, the question is directly on is Mr Morrison aware of who the staff are? I, I, I have been listening to the Minister. I'm not 
uh, prepared to uh, uh, rule that he was not being directly relevant. I'm listening carefully. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, as I was saying, all parties would, you would expect to have those discussions. Uh, uh, in the Labor Party, if you were having such a discussion, uh, it would, of course, be an expulsion discussion. In our party, if you're having such a discussion, Minister, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong on the point of order. Uh, yeah, on point of order. Uh, I, it is a point of direct relevance, um, uh, and this is uh, these are the, Senator McCarthy asked about public reports that Ms. Archer said she felt bullied, threatened, and intimidated by prime ministerial staffers prior to the vote. So I, I, put, I put it to you that uh, a, a reference to what happens after a vote is actually not relevant to the question. This is about activity or behaviour by alleged behaviour by prime ministerial staff in the lead up to a vote. Senator Canavan, on the point thank of order. Thank you, Chair. Just on the point of order, that's not what the. Uh, minister was saying. He was clearly talking about the discussions that would happen before a vote, as he mentioned, an expulsion discussion. That would be the case in the Labor Party. Comparing, the question clearly goes to the appropriateness of discussions around a vote and therefore bringing in how that would be dealt with in other political parties, with other senators and members of this place, is clearly relevant to that question. I'm, I, I, Senator Wong, order. Order. The Sen Senator Wong has had the opportunity to bring the minister back to the question. Uh, at, I'm listening carefully to the answer. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, the, the point purely that I was making is that uh, robust discussions are had in this place. They're had right here in the chambers about people's position in relation to bills and votes. Uh, they're had in offices across the building about people's positions in relation to bills and votes. Uh, only one side of politics has uh, a structural threat Order. in place as part of their rules uh, that says you know, very clearly in terms of what the threat is, if you go against us, you're out of here. That is not what happens in our party, but of course discussions Order. are had, Mr President. Order. I will not give Senator McCarthy the call until there is order in the chamber. Order. Senator Gallagher. Senator McCarthy, you have the call for a supplementary question. Uh, with allegations of bullying, threats and intimidation of one of his female MPs by his own staff having now been made public, what action has Mr Morrison taken? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, Mr, Mr Morrison has made clear uh, his respect for, uh, for the member for Bass, his support for her, uh, and, uh, and very much uh, his, uh, his ongoing engagement and discussions with her. Order. Um, once again, as has been the case through many of the questions I've faced today, and it's not uncommon, um, what is put to me as assertions or direct quotes are not always uh, completely direct quotes uh, that, uh, that apply. Order. Mr President, as I've made clear, you know, discussions you would expect happen between party leaders and their members or senators and their officers. These are commonplace across the building. Uh, of course, you can have strong disagreements. They should be done respectfully. That's the way the Prime Minister always expects them to be conducted. Senate order. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary question. Mr President, Brittany Higgins, Grace Tame, Christine Holgate, Bridget Archer, Julia Banks, Gladys Berejiklian and Zoe Salucci McDermott. Why have Order. all of these women publicly complained about Mr Morrison's behaviour and attitudes towards women? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I don't accept the premise of all of that aspect of the question. I know there are many names to mention there, uh, many individuals who have been very courageous in public statements that they have made and who have played a role during the Order. course of this year, in particular in relation to driving some of the change that we have discussed and that the Prime Minister has discussed very clearly this week. The Prime Minister has made clear that change is necessary Order. in the Parliament uh, to ensure we have the reforms that are necessary the reforms that are necessary for this place to operate effectively in the future. But, you know, Mr President, there's all manner of 
conduct that could do with improvement at times, and we want to make sure those reforms occur to drive that change. Uh, but frankly, you know, conduct elsewhere in terms of uh, the type of smearing, Order. the type of scaring, and so on that those opposite like to engage in could also do with helping to lift. It's going you know, well. I, I, I reckon when you go out deliberately trying to scare Australia's pensioners, Senator Wong, when you go out trying Order. to deliberately scare Australia's pensioners as you Order. like to do election after an election with many scare, pensioner scare, it's pretty obvious Minister. you're out to try to threaten Minister. or intimidate them. The too. time for the answer has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. With tomorrow being International Day of People with Disability, how is the Liberal and National government's, Nationals Government continuing to support people with disability in all elements of their lives? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for her question. Well, tomorrow is International Day for, um, of People with Disability, and tomorrow we recognise the contributions and achievements of 4.4 million Australians who live with disability across our nation. And I want to particularly uh, acknowledge the, the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic has had on people with disability and to acknowledge the extraordinary resilience um, of carers, their families and people with disability, the way they came together to support each other through this difficult time. I also would like to acknowledge the frontline disability workers who have demonstrated incredible leadership and courage throughout the pandemic. You know, whether it be someone um, who was taking a person with disability to get that all-important COVID-19 vaccine, whether it was the way people changed how they undertook their care arrangements uh, during lockdown. All people who uh, have been involved in this space, we certainly acknowledge the contributions that you made to help people with disability get through the pandemic. Um, but this government is all about making sure that we also encourage people with disability to meet and encourage them to meet their aspirations by providing opportunity to them and making sure that they are able to access the rewards um, so that they can fulfil their full potential. So tomorrow I will be launching Australia's Disability Strategy 2021 to 2031. It is a commitment of all levels of government, state and territory, local government and the Commonwealth government, to make sure that we constantly understand our role in improving the lives of people who live with disability. And this comes on top of more than 3,000 consultations with people with disability, peak bodies, carers, families. Uh, academics to make sure that the next national disability strategy, Australia's disability strategy, actually recognises the need to have a foundation to create generational change, a society where all people with disability can reach their potential. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government supporting people with disability into employment? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we know that a job in anybody's life is a game changer, and that should not be any yeah, different yeah. for somebody who lives with disability. So that's why tomorrow, alongside Australia's disability strategy, I will also be launching the next national disability employment strategy, which is part of our overall strategy to improve the lives of people who live with disability. Um, our employment strategy is aptly named Employ My Ability. And it will be a very much a focus on the abilities of job seekers with disability. My goal is to make sure that we give people with disability access to the full suite of opportunities that every other yeah, Australian yeah. enjoys. We've consulted widely, and can I just acknowledge the Disability Employment Advisory Committee that was chaired by Dylan Alcott and Simon McKeon, who have put in such an extraordinary amount of work to make sure that our next national disability employment strategy meets the needs of job seekers who live with disability. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you. How is the government helping people with disability access support services and up-to-date advice? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we are committed to ensuring that, that people who live with disability have information about policies, programs and supports that are available to them to make sure that they are able to get, uh, have, a, have, have a life of accessibility. And that's why we have invested so strongly in the National Disability Gateway, which assists people, not just people with disability, but their families, their carers and the wider community to have a, a single source of uh, trusted information, advice and referral services. Um, and I'm proud of all the work that we have done uh, to support Australians with disability 
Uh, and this year we rolled out the I Can campaign to encourage Australians with disability to make sure that they are accessing the information that we hope will improve their lives. The ad campaign features people who have live with disability. Uh, they're not actors, they're real people, and it has been a tremendous success. So we will continue to work to make sure that we provide people with disability the same opportunities that every Minister, other Australian takes for granted. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Senator Gen uh, Jared Rennick has said of the Pfizer vaccine, and I quote, When are these snake oil salesmen going to be called out? The Pfizer shot doesn't deserve to be called a vaccine. When asked during Senate estimates what action this minister would take in response, he assured, and I quote, I'm happy to follow up personally with my colleague. Has the minister spoke, personally spoken with Senator Rennick about these comments? If so, when and what did he say? The minister representing the Minister for Health Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Sen uh, um, uh, I have Senator Colbeck, you have Thank you, Mr. President. I have had conversations with Senator Rennick about the efficacy of vaccines uh, on a number of occasions, Mr. Order. President, uh, because the data is very, very clear. The vaccines are safe and they work, Mr President. Uh, and so those are the, the, it's, it's those statistics, it's that information uh, that I've put to Senator Rennick, Mr President, because I'm firmly of the belief, I'm firmly of the belief because I look at the information every day, I read the data every day, and the data demonstrates, Mr President, the vaccines are effective. They are effective. Yes, that's exactly right, Senator. I look at the data every day uh, because it's important that we understand that, the, that, that, that that's the case, Mr. President. Uh, and it shows in the data, Mr. President, in the fact that uh, last year, Mr. President, without a vaccine, 7% uh, of cases in this country, Mr. President, uh, were in aged care. This year, with the workforce vaccinated and the residents of aged care vaccinated, the number of cases as a proportion of the Senator aged Keneally. care cases is 0.7 per cent, Mr President. Ten times less. Ten times Senator less McAllister. the number of people in aged care as a proportion of cases this year compared to last year, Mr President. So the, the data is very clear. And those are the points that I put to Senator Rennick, Mr President, because I want him to understand what I know by looking at the data. Uh, that the vaccines that we have for oh, Australians ah. are not only safe, uh, but they are effective, Mr. President. Uh, and I will, at every opportunity, continue to repeat that message, not only for people like Senator Rennick, who has some questions, but I'll also repeat that for other Australians to convince all Australians that they ought to take up the opportunity for a vaccine, Mr. President. And over 92 per cent of Australians have now had a first dose. Uh, and approaching 87 per cent have had a second dose. That's a great result, Mr President, and I congratulate Minister, Australians for going out and getting Minister, vaccinated. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Senator, Senator Rennick has also set up a taxpayer-funded website undermining COVID-19 vaccines, which Australian Medical Association Vice President Chris Moy has described as, and I quote, conspiracy theory push polling. It's about as anti-scientific as you can get. Does the minister agree? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I agree with uh, Mr Moy. Uh, we, we want to ensure that the information that's provided to Australians Order. with respect to, vac to vaccines is factual. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and, we, and we as government, uh, and, and particularly as ministers in, in the government, continue, uh, as I said, to look at the data. The, the Therapeutic Goods Administration continues to assess the data on vaccines globally so they can make sure that the appropriate decisions are made. So does the TAGI, Mr President. Uh, they continue to look at the data and the information on vaccines so that they can provide the appropriate advice to Australians with respect to uh, achieving vaccine. And Mr President, I would urge all Australians, I would urge all Australians not to look at what's on Facebook, not to, to look at on what those sorts of sites, but look at the ATAGI site, look at the um, TGA site, look at the Department of Health site if they want to get High quality information about the efficacy of vaccines and the fact that they work in the interest of keeping Australians safe during COVID-19. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. President, given Senator Rennick has continued to post content on social media, which he has admitted may not be a hundred percent right, will the minister publicly condemn Senator Rennick's use of taxpayers' funds to spread vaccine disinformation and conspiracies? Order, Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I've urged Senator Rennick to ensure that the information on his website is factual and is true, and, he, and I acknowledge that he's admitted that it isn't. But, Mr. President, uh, one of the jobs, one of the really important jobs that we all have here in this place, is to give a voice to our constituents. That's one of the things that we do. It's a really important thing we do. But in, in the circumstance of an issue that is so important as this, so important the, as this, it is our responsibility to ensure that the information that, that we are sharing, we are, that the voices that we are giving. Uh, elevation to by the fact, virtue of the fact that we are public figures and have a platform to be able to do that. We need to make sure that that information is true, Mr. President. And I've had that Order. conversation. And I, Mr. President, have had that conversation with Senator Rennick because it's a principle that I believe is extremely important. We want to make sure that Australians get access to information that it's true. We want them to get vaccinated, and we want them to understand the vaccines that we have in this country are safe uh, and that they work. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister provide an update on the number of Australians accessing a home care package and how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting senior Australians? The Minister for Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. And particularly, Mr. President, uh, thank you, Senator, for your interest in improving the lives of senior Australians and their families. Uh, Mr. President, it's been clear over a period of time now that people want more choice. They want to stay connected to their communities. They want to stay uh, in, as independent as possible. They want to remain in their own homes. Mr. President, and our government is delivering on that. The government announced in the budget as part of our response to the Royal Commission a further $6.5 billion uh, as an investment to release eight. 80,000 additional home care packages. That's 40,000 packages this financial year, Mr. President, and a further 40,000 packages next financial year, Mr. President. That is the single largest investment in home care packages ever. The new data shows that in the three months to the end of September this year, the number of people with access to a home care package grew to over more than 204,000 people, which is an increase of over 41,000 in the last 12 months. Mr President, since the 2018-19 budget, this government has now invested a record $11.9 billion, $11 billion in new funding to deliver an additional 163,000 new home care packages. By June 2023, there will be around 275,000 home care packages available to senior Australians every year. And every year, under our government, home care packages are up, residential places, care places are up, and every year, Mr. President, aged care funding has been up. Mr. President, Labor went to the last election with $387 billion in new tax proposals. Not a single dollar for a home care place, aged care quality and case, uh, care safety or workforce, and nothing for aged, uh, Minister, mainstream aged care services. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. How is the rollout of home care packages, Minister, expected to further reduce wait lists and wait times? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Mr. President, the number of people waiting to receive a home care package continues to decrease, decrease as we work to ensure more Australians can live at home for longer, as more uh, Australians are choosing to do. Mr. President, under this government, there has been a significant improvement in the number of people waiting for their home care, approved home care package, with a 25 per cent decrease in the 12 months to September this year. 25 per cent decrease to September this year. Uh, Mr. President, those assessed as a high priority, um, of a high priority need at any level of home care package are now receiving their packages in less than 30 days. 
less than 30 days. 99 per cent of senior Australians waiting for a package at their assessed level of need have also been offered support from the government, including an interim package or CHSP, uh, and continue to have access to Australia's world-class world health system. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline the design phase of the new home care system? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. In the government's response to the recommendations of the Royal Commission, Mr. President, we announced a commitment to establish a new supported home program. This will replace existing Commonwealth Home Support Program (CHSP) home care packages, short-term restorative care, and residential respite programs. Mr. President, we continue to consult on the critical design of this new program, including elements of improved assessment arrangements that are more consistent, more accurate, and recognise that not all consumers need in intensive assessments, a modern classification and funding system to ensure support seniors, uh, the support senior Australians receive aligns with their assessed care needs, an increased choice of providers across all types and levels of aged care, focus on aged care management in assessment and funding arrangements, better support for informal career, uh, carers and, importantly, Mr. President, more support for early interventions to help me, uh, people remain independent and home for longer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When asked about the pace of the vaccine rollout back in March of this year, the Prime Minister said uh, it's not a race, it's not a competition. Has the minister asked the Prime Minister why he said that when it wasn't the case? Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I think the Prime Minister subsequently said, and the, the Labor Party are very want to go back to, to historical statements and forget about what's happened in, in the intervening period. Mr. President, they, Order. Mr. Mr. President uh, but Mr. the Prime Minister also said Order. the Prime Minister also said that it's not ha it doesn't matter Senator how you start the race; it's a matter of how you finish the race, Mr. President. And Mr. President, Senator what is quite clear, what is quite clear, and what is quite inconvenient for the Labor Party, what is quite inconvenient for the Labor Party, Mr. President, is that we have one of the best vaccination rates in the world now, Mr. President, uh, in the world, Mr. President. Because of the hard Order. work that was done by members of this government, Mr. President, to ensure that we did Order. have vaccine supplies, to do the hard work to ensure vaccine, vaccine supplies came to the country, uh, and we always Senator said Keneally. that the rate of vaccination would increase as the vaccine Order supplies were, right uh, uh, came into the country, and Mr. My President. Left. And that is exactly what we, that is exactly what has happened, Mr. President. We said that we would like to be able to offer every Australian a vaccine by the end of the year, and we've done that, Mr. President. We've done that in spades. In fact, we've got ample supplies. We are one of the first countries in the world, Mr. President, one of the first countries in the world to have a whole of population booster program underway, Mr. President, and close to half a million Australians have already taken up the opportunity for their booster, Mr. President. So, so, despite the fact that we did have some difficulties with the vaccine rollout at the, out, at the outset, Mr. President, we now have the equal tenth highest first dose vaccination rate in the OECD, Mr. President. Higher than the UK, higher than the US, higher than oh, France, higher than Germany, higher than Israel, Mr. President. And so, Mr. Senator President, I think thanks to the Australian people. Thanks to the Australian people, we can say that we have one of the most successful vaccine rollout programs in the world, Mr. President. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. The, Order. the Prime Minister Senator repeatedly Ciccone has said just, it's not a race after Senator the vaccine. Senator Ciccone, do you want to just restart? I did not hear the start of your question. The Prime Minister repeatedly said it's not a race after the vaccine had been approved by regulators. But when asked why he said the vaccine rollout was not a race, he claimed he only said that in relation to the approval of the vaccines. Has the minister asked the Prime Minister why he said that when that also was not the case? Minister. Well, Mr President, it's really sad that the Labor Party continue to live in the past when, in fact, we have run one of the most successful vaccination programs in the world, Mr President. Australians understand that. They understand the importance of vaccination program and Mr President they are turning up in their droves Mr President to get vaccinated Mr President and in fact they're turning up to get their booster shots now that those have become available because we have have said to the Australian people and they've come with us uh, we have good vaccines 
Uh, we have a range of supplies of vaccines, uh, and Mr. President. They trust the vaccines overwhelmingly, and they're turning up to get vaccinated. Uh, and, and, and I thank Australians for showing that confidence in our vaccination program Order. and turning up to get vaccinated. Senator Ciccone, a second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, on April 6, the Prime Minister appeared to blame the European Union for a lack of vaccine supplies, which the EU has denied. The very next day, the Prime Minister claimed he never blamed the EU. Has the Minister asked the Prime Minister about his criticisms of the Euro European Union? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, I'm doing what the Prime Minister is, which is looking to the future. Uh, I'm not living in the past, as the Labor Party are doing. We're looking to the future. We're looking, forward, we're looking forward to opening the country up. We're looking forward to the economic recovery that comes along with that, Mr President. And we're looking forward to Australians having the opportunity to travel and be back together for Christmas and into 2022, Mr President. So the Labor Party can live in the past. They can look, in, can look at the future in the Order. rearview mirror, mirror, Mr President. But we, we're getting Order. on with the economic recovery. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how Australia is working with our Pacific family to secure our region's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for International Development, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, and I, I can. Um, our region's health, prosperity and security is absolutely vital to Australia's, and we have been working closely with our partners across the Pacific to address our shared challenges. Now, in, in response to the pandemic, Australia is investing more than $1 billion above and beyond our ongoing development support in our region. And despite some of the messages from those opposite, particularly the Greens, we've already shared over 9.2 million doses across the Indo-Pacific as part of our commitment to deliver 60 million doses to our neighbours by the end of 2022. Now, in addition, Australia is investing $130 million in the COVAX facility, which has distributed over 100 million doses to Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and more than 400 million doses globally. Vaccination means more than just doses, and Australia has allocated $623 million to get vaccine doses in arms, including vaccine procurement, distribution, administration, training and planning. Now, beyond the health impacts, this pandemic has also posed serious economic challenges across our region. In 2020-21, Australia provided $361 million in direct financing to support economic growth and social protection in our region. This investment has helped governments in our region to expand social protection schemes to support more than 150 million people. Australia is also extending loans worth more than $2 billion to Indonesia and PNG to help address their economic needs, because the economic resilience of these two great democracies is absolutely vital to Australia and to the region. Now, throughout the pandemic, Australia has continued to invest in quality infrastructure through a lending pipeline of more than $1 billion. Already, we've finalised deals to finance renewable energy in the Solomon Islands and undersea telecommunications cable in Palau and upgrades and maintenance at Fiji's airports. Finally, through our Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme, almost 19,000 workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste are in Australia Minister, and helping to help meet Minister, critical workforce shortages. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question? Thanks, Mr President. Minister, could you uh, update the Senate on how Australia is working with our Pacific partners to ensure stability and security in our region? Minister. Uh, thank you. Australia and our Pacific neighbours share fundamental values, including respect for sovereignty, the rule of law and democratic processes. And all our Pacific family were concerned by recent unrest in the Solomons. As part of our joint efforts with PNG, Fiji and New Zealand, Australia is proudly supporting the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force through a deployment of Australian Federal Police, Australian Defence personnel and diplomats, and we thank them for their work. In my recent visit to Fiji, I saw firsthand the impressive Blackrock Peacekeeping and Humanitarian Assistance Camp that Australia is helping Fiji to redevelop. BlackRock will provide a regional hub for peacekeeper training and bolster Fiji's capacity to respond to humanitarian crises and natural disasters. Our defence cooperation program with 12 countries across our region, as well as our $2 billion Pacific Maritime Security Program, is supporting the national security priorities of our Pacific family. This combination of defence cooperation and economic development is helping maintain security and stability Minister, across our region. Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary. 
Thank you, Minister. How is Australia backing our partners in the Pacific to support their economic and their development priorities? Minister. Well, while I was in Fiji, I was delighted to launch a new partnership between Australia and Tourism Fiji to help Fiji and tourism safely welcome back international visitors. Now, this certification scheme will be delivered by Aspen Medical, a great Canberra company. Now, with tourism representing around 40 per cent of Fiji's GDP and Australian tourists contributing over $50 million a month pre-pandemic, this is a critical sector for Fiji. And yesterday, Fiji celebrated their reopening to international tourists, another important milestone in their economic recovery, made possible due to Fiji's world-class rollout using Australian vaccines. Another key Pacific export is Carver, and yesterday I was very pleased to announce phase two of the Morrison government's Carver pilot. Pacific Carver farmers and producers will now have direct access to the Australian market. Carver has enormous potential, enormous cultural and economic importance for the Pacific. The excitement across the Pacific and here in Australia is palpable. The Morrison government is proud to be supporting business-led economic growth across our region. Senator so, thanks, Mr. President and Senator Silger. I'll drink to that. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Just allow a little time for senators to quietly exit the chamber. Pursuant to order, I call on Senator Colbeck to provide an explanation. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, in response to uh, the um, notice passed in the chamber, uh, I advise the chamber that the government maintains its public interest immunity claims advanced in response to the COVID-19 Select Committee's request, Mr. President. Uh, um, Mr. President, can I say I? Thank the Select Committee for its important work this year in overseeing the government's response to the economic and health challenges of the pandemic. Coalition senators acknowledge the important role of parliamentary oversight in our system of government, which has been even more important during the COVID-19 crisis. On both the economic and health fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. Australia's critical response has been underpinned by a combination of extensive testing and contact tracing, high vaccination rates, quarantine of people returning from overseas and measures to control community transmission. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has the second lowest number of COVID cases on a per capita basis. And by avoiding the death rate seen in the OECD, uh, we have saved uh, it's estimated that we've saved over 30,000 lives. Commendably, 87 per cent of the eligible population aged over 16 are fully vaccinated, and hence we are one of the most highly vaccinated societies in the world, with a national booster program already underway. While Australia has been doing it tough, our economy has proved to be resilient. Australia was the first advanced economy to have more people in work than prior to COVID-19. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May 2020. The RBA has recently revised up its forecast for wages and now sees the unemployment rate reaching 4 per cent by the end of 2023. After last year's recession, Australia's economic uh, uh, economy, the GDP, recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world. While Australians have experienced uh, public health restrictions year, this year, uh, the federal uh, government— uh, Sorry, Senator Colbeck. I think Senator Patrick is on a point of order. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, on relevance, uh, the purpose of this, uh, of this explanation is to, to explain why a document hasn't been provided to the Senate, not to rattle off a bunch of stuff about, uh, about uh, uh, performance of government. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. And you can seek to take note of the minister's uh, comments afterwards, if you so choose. Minister, please continue. Thank you, Deputy President. While Australians have experienced public health restrictions this year, the federal government has supported 2.19 million individuals who have been paid out of a total of 12.5 $9 billion in COVID-19 disaster payments. Deputy President, in 2021, the committee has held the COVID-19 Select Committee has held 17 public hearings, which includes nine appearances by officials from the Department of Health. 
This year, the committee has sent out approximately 470 questions on notice to both government and non-government witnesses, and of those, uh, 260 answers have been returned to the committee. Since the com commencement of this inquiry in April 2020, more than 2,000 700 questions to witnesses have been put on notice, and more than 2,160 responses to those questions have been received. The committee's public hearings have been held in addition to the regular parliamentary sitting weeks and appearances of government departments and their agencies before Senate estimates hearings. It is clear that parliamentary scrutiny is operating as normally as possible and that parliament is fulfilling its duty to keep government accountable even when challenges have arisen due to, due to public health restrictions across the country. It should be noted, Mr uh, Deputy President, uh, the parliamentary scrutiny of the federal government's response to the pandemic has been far more extensive and robust than any state parliamentary oversight. Given the most onerous restrictions to the liberty of citizens during the pandemic in the name of public health have been imposed by state governments, they should at least have as adequate oversight as the federal parliament has put in place. It is regrettable that in many jurisdictions parliamentary committees have scrut uh, scrutinising the performance of state governments have only been put in place temporarily, have had few public hearings and have often been chaired by government chairs. Um, Senator it, Colbeck, I am actually going to draw your attention. I have been listening and you did make reference, but there are three orders for um, you to provide an explanation. I've got the document here in front of me of the minister's failure to table the information. And whilst you did start to go some way towards that, you have deviated from that, and that is the requirement of the order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a long-standing view. Of, governments bo of both persuasions that the deliberations of Cabinet should remain confidential because disclosure may impact the government's ability to receive confidential information and hence make appropriate and informed decisions for the Australian community. This is especially so, Deputy President, when the responsibility of protecting the health and welfare of the Australian people during a pandemic is at stake. As stated in the second interim report, the relatively few disagreements between this committee and the government regarding a small number of public interest immunity claims should be viewed in light of these facts and the committee's business, uh, busy workload. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the uh, statement from mm -hmm. the minister. Um, and I'm not actually sure that the minister addressed uh, the issues that have been raised in the third interim report by the Select Committee on COVID-19. It seemed to be a whole lot of excuses about the actual fact that scrutiny was occurring um, and continuing to occur. But the real issue here, if we cut to the chase, because it's the final sitting day of the year and I know there's a lot of other business to get through, is that the Select Committee was established with the support of, of the government and other senators in this place. It was a unanimously uh, agreed to. Uh, the terms of reference were agreed. They were broad. Uh, it was clear that this committee was going to travel um, through the pandemic. And the specific terms of reference are to monitor the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not entirely sure why the states and the Commonwealth's now concern over the lack of scrutiny of the state's role is, is being raised as an issue. It was very clear terms of reference. Yes, we've had a lot of hearings. Yes, we've put questions on notice. And the minister actually made the argument for me pretty well when he said, oh, yeah, and we've answered at least half of them. You know, like that's part of the point, that uh, while the scrutiny process from the, Senate, uh, from the committee side is working, the problem we are having is with the government refusing to either answer the questions or be in very lazy in how they answer them with these by well there's another subset where they actually answer without actually relating that to the question so it's an answer about another matter that wasn't asked and then there's this blanket refusal to answer things that they have decided a cabinet in confidence and they just go there's this this I'm sure it goes around the ministerial liaison units of every department because they use the same language. Uh, the government has decided that this information is cabinet in confidence, in line with long-standing conventions. Blah 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 blah, and it's 
And it, you know, they don't refer often. Departments don't even bother referring it to the minister for a formal claim of public interest immunity. The committee has had to do that. So we get the answer back, and then the committee has to chase them and go back to the department and say, no, that's not how the process works. If you are not going to answer this, then you have to refer it to the minister, and they need to go through the process of making a formal public interest immunity claim, and then you might get it done. But the chasing and the, the pushing of government only to have the government reply, well, we've considered it again, and the arguments we made last time, which were uh, not in accordance with the Cormann uh, motion of 2009, uh, remain. And then when we bring it to the Senate and we force it through here, as we did with the second interim report, it's exactly the same thing. So <laughs> we report to the Senate that the government is making that the, the committee has not accepted public interest immunity claims for whatever reason and call for the order of production of documents that the government has ignored the request of the committee. The Senate passes it and then uh, requires the documents to be uh, provided or the minister to come and make a statement. And then the minister, so the documents are never provided, and then the minister comes and makes a statement, which is basically to say what they said originally to the question on notice. Like it, it is simply not acceptable. It's not how this place should work. It's not how this chamber was set up to work. And the longer this tired old government, eight years in, goes on, the worse it's going to get, because there is seemingly no consequence to this. And the job that the Senate asked us to do, and me as chair of the committee and my colleagues, including Senator Patrick, who has attended most of those hearings, which is to scrutinise the response, is impacted because of this government's unwillingness to provide information. And when, I, when people hear what the information is, it is things like the Doherty modelling and presentation that was provided to First Ministers. Like, why on earth should the Australian public not have access to that information? AHPPC minutes, when the first lockdowns happened, the advice that was given. Again, why are the Australian public not entitled to that information? I mean, these are important decisions that were taken and information that has been withheld. We've asked for the, I mean, this ridiculous one, the presentation by the Productivity Commission to National Cabinet on the economic recovery, I presume, because we haven't seen it. No, not allowed. And when we've again asked that following Senator Patrick's successful case through the AAT, when we put it back on notice, saying, OK, well, the, uh, Justice White has found that National Cabinet is not a committee of Cabinet, and therefore your blanket Cabinet in confidence argument is tossed out, so please provide this document. It comes back, no, not providing it. When you do an FOI on any, doc any correspondence that was engaged in about how you came to that decision, you see it's all coming from the Prime Minister's department. Nice. All these departments are going, oh, the committee's after those documents again, what do we say? And it's a coordinated refusal to provide that information. Oh, we can't, we, you know, it comes back from PMNC, they've got all their hands over. Health admitted as much that they had consulted PMNC about their response before refusing again to provide the information to the Senate that was called for by the Senate. And the, the thing is, like, when you are in opposition and you are trying to do this, we will remind you of this, the fact that you are trashing convention and practice of the Senate. You know, so we have to stand up for it. We have to argue for transparency and accountability, and not just what you choose, because it seems to me that the approach the government's taken is we will choose what access Senate committees have to information. And that's not how the system was set up to work. It was that the Senate was the powerful. It, it had the power to call for documents, to require documents, to order documents if they weren't provided. Not executive government deciding, well, you know what, you can have half of this and a quarter of that and none of that, which is what's happened and which is why the Senate committee has reported for a third time rejecting public interest immunity claims by this government, accepting one. We have accepted one because the argument was made and we accepted that. 
But on the other ones, access to important information, we haven't accepted it, and the Senate yesterday voted to require the government to provide it, and we got this. We got a, a, a speech about how great the government's been, how great it's going to be, how great it's always been, but by the way, you're not getting access to anything. It's, it's just not good enough. And um, I, I'll leave some time for Senator Patrick to make some other uh, comments. Uh, but it is impacting on the work that we are able to do, on the job that we have been given by the Senate, and it is an arrogant, out of touch, conceited government that treats the Senate with such disrespect. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Did you wish to make, uh, take note of the same matter? Thank so you, I do, and I will, uh, but I still also reserve yes. uh, my rights in respect of uh, 745. Yes, of uh, um, just in relation to uh, this, this particular matter, I want to sort of touch on uh, perhaps three areas. The first of those is just the disrespect of the executive, uh, and I'm talking about ministers, in uh, making claims, making claims which uh, now I might point out is not just uh, in, in uh, defiance of Justice White's decision that National Cabinet is not a Cabinet, but now also in defiance of a Senate resolution that says that particular public interest immunity in relation to National Cabinet is not to be advanced. Is not to be advanced. That is what the Senate has decided, and as officers of the Senate, uh, indeed, uh, people need to look very long and hard at themselves in advancing those sorts of immunities. Look, I'll give you another one to try intergovernmental relations, because that may uh, actually constitute a reasonable uh, uh, public interest immunity. But stop lying. Stop uh, de deliberately misleading. Stop uh, basically uh, confronting uh, what is law in Australia. Accept the law as it is, and that National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. The second point I would uh, uh, touch on, and that this goes to what um, this goes to what uh, uh, Senator Gallagher was was talking about, and that is, you know, public officials turning up and uh, basically making public interest in community uh, immunity claims as well. Not also knowing full well, because it's been quite highly publicised, the matter in the AAT against the Prime Minister by myself where Justice White established that there was a, a, um, a, uh, uh, that the National Cabinet was not a Cabinet. And I'll just go back to the law as it is in Australia. Okay? Not, this is not me suggesting uh, what should happen. This is the law. Under the Public Service Act, um, uh, uh, under Section 10, there are certain values that the APS holds that include uh, that they act uh, with, in a professional manner, in an objective manner. They act with integrity. And indeed, uh, uh, section uh, 10 in brackets 5, the APS is, an, is apolitical and provides advice that is frank, honest, timely and based on the best available evidence. That is the obligation placed in law upon public servants. And what, what's happening here, and I've named a few of them, uh, and I might point out there's another one that's, uh, that I've just got back uh, in the last uh, day, day or so from another public servant. I'll come, come back to that when I deal with, uh, uh, with uh, late questions on notice. But in effect what happens here is the secrecy uh, obsession of the Prime Minister drives down through the front bench, who don't have the courage to stand up and say, uh, sorry, Prime Minister, I'm going to recognise principles uh, in respect of the rule of law, and I'm not going to say to the Senate what you want me to say, which is that National Cabinet is in fact a Cabinet, when we know that it is not and the Senate has resolved that it is not. So that's the first problem. We've got uh, ministers not standing up to the Prime Minister, perhaps more worried about their own uh, position, their own personal uh, position, and perhaps the money that flows from that rather than their obligation to the public. And what happens is they push this down uh, through, the, the, through the public service where, in effect, they, they force public servants to breach the law, to act in a manner that is inconsistent with the APS uh, values. 
and the APS Code of Conduct, also enshrined in the Public Service Act. Now, I'm not actually making any excuses for those public servants because they, particularly the senior ones, ought to stand up and say, sorry, Minister, I'm not saying that. I'm not doing that. And sadly, we've seen some examples, led by Mr Gaitchens, uh, as to where they just cast that aside and say, no, I'm going to hoist my, I'm going to hoist my, my, uh, my Liberal Party spinnaker because whilst uh, the, the Liberal government is in, in charge, I'm going to do everything that they say. That's what Mr. Gaitchens does. Okay, and then, uh, you know, and I, I'm hoping that the, Liberal, the Labor Party, should it get into government, looks very long and hard at some of these people and looks at their moral fortitude, looks at their courage. And again, I'm not talking about some very good people that work in the APS doing a really good job. I'm talking about the very senior people that are uh, corroding what, uh, what would otherwise be you know, the confidence that we're supposed to have in the public service. So that's the second problem. The third problem is actually our problem. It's the problem of the Senate, who simply allows this to happen. And I'm going to go to the, the, again to the report of the Privileges Committee uh, in the last uh, few days, where we had a lawful order of the Senate, a lawful order of the Senate, not complied with by a statutory officer. And in actual fact, somehow the Privileges, Privileges Committee finds that that's not a contempt. It's no wonder there's only half the questions getting answered in this place. Now, I'll go to the matter, and, and I know uh, Senator O'Neill uh, raised this yesterday, but I'm not convinced, and that is the referral that took place in relation to the lack of provision of documents to uh, the Economics Committee, the referral made on the 15th of June this year. Six months later, we're, just, you know, we're likely to end this parliament without that matter being resolved. Now, I'm happy to inform the chamber that there at least has been some agreement in respect of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the provision of information to the Economics Committee, and that's a good thing, but it's taken six months. It's taken six months. And nothing, nothing that happens from now will undo the fact that the minister and the secretary has frustrated this, uh, this Senate from being able to conduct its, its uh, job. Uh, we'll, um, I'm absolutely sure we'll get to a point now where that committee will not report properly. Sadly, we've lost the chair, who had so much passion in relation uh, to this particular issue. Um, but the Senate will, may, not, may not end up reporting on this, certainly not doing the job that it wanted to do. And whose fault is that? It's the fault of the Senate. Uh, I'm sorry, but the, the fact that the Privileges Committee has taken six months to get to this point is atrocious. I invite the chair um, uh, of the Privileges Committee and Senator, Senator Abetz uh, as the, as the uh, deputy chair, both senators who I respect gratefully, very, very tough senators in normal circumstances. I don't understand what's happening here. I invite them to go and read uh, Machiavelli's The Prince. That will show you how um, you can deal with these sorts of circumstances. Just a couple of fines, just a couple of jail uh, terms would stop this instantly. We wouldn't be having these debates. We wouldn't be having these discussions. But unfortunately, as I've found out, the, the Privileges Committee is weak. The Privileges Committee of the Senate is weak. If any journalist ever uses the word the powerful Privileges Committee, I'm going to correct them. Okay? <clears throat> this is the fault of the Senate. It is the, no, it's not the fault of the government. The government, are, the government are in breach. The government are in breach, but we do nothing about it. It's within our power to do something about it, and we don't. Order. We don't Order. do anything about it. <coughs> And that's the problem. I mean, Senator O'Neill is welcome to stand up after and, and, and uh, take note as well. But here's, this is the problem. And we don't, we don't get to go and look to somebody else and say, hey, guys, it's not fair, they're not playing the game. We're at the top of the tree. We, we sit at the top. It's up to us to do it. It's up to, up to us to stand firm. The powers are there. 
They flow through from section 49 of the Constitution. There is no question. We know the House put a couple of uh, journalists, and that was, uh, in my view, was wrong, but put a couple of journalists into the Goulburn jail for a little while. Okay. The power exists. The High Court affirmed that. The High Court affirmed that power. Just as the High, uh, just as the, um, high Court in Egan and, and, and Willis affirmed the powers for us to produce documents, just as uh, in Egan and Chadwick, uh, the, the New South Wales Court of Appeal uh, affirmed the ability to uh, receive uh, documents that were legally privileged. But it is up to us. I'm not saying the government's doing the right thing, and I'm not saying the public servants, the senior public servants, are doing the right thing. They're in fact breaking the law. But we're not doing anything about it, and that needs to change. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe that's carried. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, Madam uh, Deputy President, I, I um, uh, pursuant to uh, section uh, Standing Order uh, 74.5, I seek an explanation from uh, the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why, and this is the third time I've asked in this sitting fortnight, um, that uh, question number 3985 has not been answered by the, the, the Department of PMC. Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. I thank Senator Patrick uh, for his, uh, his question. Um, uh, processes around finalising uh, those answers have not been able to be finalised uh, at this, uh, this point in time. Uh, it has been a, uh, a very busy period for all involved, as I've indicated to the Senate before. Uh, through the life of this parliament, uh, there have been uh, record numbers uh, of questions asked across questions on notice to the Senate chamber, across parliamentary estimates uh, uh, proceedings. Uh, indeed, uh, I think the questions uh, total something close to um, uh, to uh, that experienced in the previous two parliaments combined. Uh, the government's worked hard to try to provide answers uh, and has delivered answers to record numbers of questions. Uh, I apologise to Senator Patrick in relation to this one that, uh, that I don't have a further update for him. Senator Patrick. Take note of the minister's answer. Uh, again, uh, this, uh, this question relates to uh, a request, a simple request, as to how much money was spent in my case against the Prime Minister in relation to National Cabinet? Because you know what? I'm interested in finding out the answer. I'd love to know why whatever money, amount of money was spent, we spent that money when the government was just going to not, uh, not comply with uh, the, the, the principles that uh, Justice White has put. And the second one goes to the cost of uh, looking at a Section 37 uh, certificate uh, to censor the Auditor General, uh, an Auditor General's report um, that was issued by uh, Attorney General Porter, again an AAT matter where the AAT overturned uh, the Attorney General's um, uh, censoring. Uh, all I've asked for is how much did the proceedings cost? That's an accounting system question. And it's not like I stand up here every question after every question time and, and surprise the minister. I actually do the right thing in accordance with the president's guidance in, re in relation to the standing order. I contact the relevant minister's office and I advise them that a particular question hasn't been answered and that I may choose to exercise my rights under the standing orders. It's not like I, uh, that uh, somehow I surprise the minister in, in doing this. And so all I can, all I can think, you know, I go back to last week, and uh, uh, Senator Birmingham stood up and said, "Look, um, I think it might have been Senator, Senator Dunningham on, on, on his behalf, stand up and said, "Look, uh, we're trying to get to this answer." But after the second time I asked the question, and now the third time I seek an explanation, I would have thought that the minister would have picked up the phone to the prime minister and said, "You know what?" Can we just give Senator Patrick his answer? But no, that's too hard. Again, this question goes to costs around the proceedings in the AAT in relation to National Cabinet. And it, 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 does, it does disturb me um, because, firstly, I don't think uh, 
on, on the evidence that was supplied uh, to, the, to the tribunal by Geoffrey Watson SC, eminent barrister, and I thank him for his pro bono work on the issue, uh, it would have been obvious to anybody that uh, there was no argument to be had, that National Cabinet did not meet any of the requirements of a Cabinet, didn't have Cabinet solidarity, didn't have didn't have, didn't have cabinet responsibility, wasn't even formed by the federal cabinet. It wasn't a committee of the cabinet because it was, it was uh, proposed uh, by COAG. It was a committee of the COAG. And uh, uh, all of these things, you know, the fact that a cabinet consists of uh, members of parliament and uh, members of parliament or was responsible to one parliament, not to nine, as is the case with the, with the National Cabinet. You know, the, the, the Prime Minister had said in his own words, he said, you know, we have these cabinet meetings and, and uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes some premiers disagree, but, but the bus leaves the bus station and you either get on or you don't. That's not allowed in a cabinet system. In a cabinet system, the principle is you go in, you have your argument, but when you come out, everyone sings off the same hymn sheet, such that there is uh, a, a, a confidence in, uh, in those decisions of cabinet, and uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's clear, it was clear going into those proceedings that there was no chance that, uh, that Justice White would find in any other way than that, that, that there wasn't a, um, that it wasn't a, a committee of the cabinet, and yet. Today, sadly, in the last couple of days, I've got yet another FOI decision that's come back. Another FOI decision, not not after cabinet minutes this time. After um, the, I, I seek access to the following information relating to the Infrastructure and Transport National Cabinet Reform Committee established in October 2020, I want the minutes of all meetings and the action items for all meetings. So I'm not after. Uh, in this instance, even the meetings of the, the, of the National Cabinet. I'm after some peripheral committee that they've established that might feed in and provide advice. If you look at where National Cabinet uh, extends to, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's almost, you know, it could, it, it, half of the, 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 the government could well be covered by nas a National Cabinet claim if it were permitted under law, which it is not. But again, I've got a, an official here, uh, in this case Petra uh, Gartman, and I am going to continue to name people. I, I point out I've had over, 20, uh, over 200 FOIs and I've never come into this chamber and named uh, uh, a decision maker. I normally simply appeal them. That's the normal process. But in this instance, it's so offensive that the claims, uh, in respect of the claims that are being made against such a prominent and weighty judgment from Justice White. Um, uh, I, I get an answer that says, acknowledges, I am aware of and have considered the Administrative Appeals Tribunal decision delivered on 5 August 2021 by Deputy President Justice White in Patrick and the Secretary of Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet 2021, AAT, uh, AAAT uh, 2719. Then goes on to say, that in addition to the, to the decision in Patrick, I have considered the National Cabinet's terms of reference of the 15th of March 2020, made public after the, the decision in Pat Patrick, and a joint statement by, made on the 17th of September by the Prime Minister, State Premiers and Territory ch uh, Chief Ministers on the importance of confidentiality to relationships between the Commonwealth and states and territories. I have formed the view that National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act, above and beyond the law. Above, that's, a, that's an official. Well, it is. It is a. I'm, I'm accepting those. I'm accepting those interjections. It is, in fact, a mandate driven down from the very, very top, from a prime minister who says, "I am addicted to secrecy, and the Australian public will not find out what it is that we're up to." And uh, it flows down through Mr. Gaitchens and now down to the next level, where sadly 
Those officials are acting in, in breach of the law. It's not that they're, you know, they're making a, a, an FOI decision uh, that, that's wrong. I mean, that's not, not punishable. Okay? It's appealable but not punishable. But they are breaking uh, the law in that they breach the APS uh, core values and the code of conduct, which requires for that objectivity, that it requires, requires professionalism, requires fearless and frank advice. And in the case of independent decision makers, it requires the decision maker to consider all of the facts, uh, consider the law, and to make a, de a determination. Now, I've got three of these decisions, and I've seen one from another constituent that use a template format. That tells me that the department is not taking the, the issue uh, seriously in terms of their uh, approach to freedom of information. They're doing what Mr Morrison tells them. They're supposed to independently, each one of them, look at the matter, look at the cases, not look at the hymn sheet produced by Mr Morrison. And it brings them into disrepute, sadly. It brings them into disrepute. The way this works, and, and I, just, I would go back to, just to make it very clear to the chamber, what these officials are saying is, is that there's new information that Justice White didn't consider, and they then mentioned some terms of reference. Except if they read the decision of Justice White, I think it's para 189, uh, I, may be, uh, I may, be, may be mistaken there, but if you read the decision, Justice White read the terms of reference and read the terms of reference in the context that the decision maker was concerned about, saying that, that uh, uh, these are the terms of reference established by COAG. They were actually part of the FOI documents that were provided to me. And Justice White saw them. He looked at them, and then when he was making his decision, he, made some, he made, raised some serious concerns about PM&C, which is supposed to be the preeminent uh, government body. He raised concerns that they hadn't put on any evidence other than secondary, other than hearsay, uh, as to the forming up of the National Cabinet. So he said, you know what, I'm going to take the terms of reference that were in the documents and I'm, going to, I'm actually going to include them in my decision. Because, and then he said, but it doesn't change the fact, because the terms of reference were generated by COAG. So that's the first point that these decision makers are, are trying to hang their hat on. And it's wrong. It's simply wrong. The second one is they say that since that decision, the Prime Minister and the Premier has all stood up and said, we want National Cabinet to be confidential. Except that's not how, the way, how this works. Justice White was asked to, to, to make a legal determination on the statutory expression of Committee of Cabinet. Okay? What, he was asked to interpret what was in the statutes. No amount of statements outside of this chamber as to what, is, uh, what Committee of uh, Cabinet means, whether it's the Prime Minister, Premiers or even a, a, a legal expert, can override what Justice White has said. If the Department and the Prime Minister thought that, he, that Justice White was wrong, they could have appealed it to the full bench of the federal court. And they didn't. They didn't. And so, what do they go off and do now? They now just come out with this, this approach that says, let's just ignore what the judge said. And that's why I stand up in this chamber upset. That's why I'm having a go at uh, public servants directly, noting their seniority and their, the, 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 the need for them to respect the law of this land. That's why I stand up and say what I do, and I'm doing it on a regular basis, because it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to the Australian public. I mean, just the principle in general that, uh, that Australians are not allowed to see some of the really important uh, decisions that were made by the National Cabinet that affected their liberties. We weren't allowed to see the AHPPC's advice as to whether children should go to school or whether we should have lockdowns or what constituted a hotspot. All of that sort of stuff ought to have been made available to the public. It should have been made available to the public and the, and the, the, the Prime Minister should have recognised that the release of that information 
was important. It was important for, the, the, for public confidence. But he failed to do so. He failed to recognise that. Um, so um, that's why I'm, I'm disturbed about what's happening here. We've got another official who simply has not had regard to, to her obligations. Petra Gartman, again, uh, uh, basically trimming her sails to the political will of the Prime Minister. And you know, it is quite appropriate for me to walk in here, uh, noting that uh, the government spent money. They spent money on a QC uh, to challenge uh, me in the AAT. They spent all that money. I want to know how much it is. And the minister, Prime Minister, is refusing to provide me with that information. And that's why I come in here week after week and day after day, and I'll continue to do so uh, in the very few sitting weeks that we have uh, next, next year, to press for this answer. Gee, I hope by February I've got an answer to this question. It's just, just, the government needs to understand our role is oversight. Our role is to inquire, to inform ourselves as to what government is doing on behalf of the people and to question what they're doing on behalf of the people. And that's exactly what we, we, we do when we ask a question on notice. We're not doing it for ourselves. We do it for our constituents, the people who we represent and the people who actually pay the minister's salaries and the public servant's salaries. And it's completely disrespectful that, you take, that the, the government takes uh, uh, you know, more than the, the, the 30 days in the standing orders to answer these questions. Uh, I hope uh, the next time I stand uh, I will not be uh, needing to exercise uh, standing order 745. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to take note of answers to questions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move on to taking notes. Senator O'Neill. Very much, uh, Deputy President, and I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham and Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher, uh, Senators, uh, Senator Ayres and Senator Ciccone. Uh, and before I go to my prepared remarks, can I just indicate that we would normally be finished this part of the day, but we've had 45 minutes of hearing about what it's like in this building, the stench of a place. It's like swimming in a sewer. And the king of the sewer rats is Mr Morrison, leading them along a path of deception. What a way to end the year. What a way to close out this year. Another year of scandals. Another year of jobs for the mates. Press releases with no policy. Rorts botched vaccine rollouts, backflips and lies after lies. And they delivered the same performance again at question time. The government of Liberal and National members and senators had two major jobs this year. They needed to establish proper quarantine and they needed to roll out the vaccine. They still have not established proper quarantine and people are facing Christmas going, are we going to be okay? And they're worried because the government hasn't done its job, and they should be worried because this government has not done its job and it does not deserve to be re-elected. They had to roll out a vaccine. Instead, we got a stroll out and, oops, I forgot to order. That's the quality of the government. They need to be kicked out. Even the cabinet have just been as hapless. The government have had an NDS, NDIS minister constantly undermine the scheme. Call it welfare for life. That's what they call it. The government have had an industry minister at war with Australia's car industry and allegedly with her own staff. The government has a communication minister more interested in attacking online critics of the government than building the NBN, the fix of the whole piece of infrastructure that they totally stuffed up across the country. And of course, we haven't seen any legislation to establish a Federal Integrity Commission. And you can see why, in their answers to questions today, the debate that has ensued since question time finished and this litany of failures of a corrupt and incompetent government. It's been a significant year for the Liberals and National Party. 
to hide their dirty deeds behind public interest immunity claims, hiding the dirty deals that they do, saying it's not in the public interest to put it out for, for critique, for the Senate to overlook it. They've blacked out FOI requests. They've constantly rorted government funds, using taxpayers' dollars as their own personal re-election fund. When it comes to accountability, it's only ever silent night for those opposite. In these historic times, the government's fallen far short of the ambition that the moment requires. This is a listless, drifting government. It has no integrity and no vision. It's a government that's been characterised throughout all of 2021 and the years that preceded it, the long seven years before we've had to watch this shameless display. It's completely, completely and totally let down the women of Australia. Mr Morrison and his cabinet, his cabinet have fallen short of even my ever diminishing expectations of what they might be able to do. When it comes to the treatment of women in this place and outside, they have abjectly failed 50 per cent of the population. They do not deserve another term. They deserve to be kicked out. Mr Morrison's failure to meet the moment, his pettifogging, his refusal to hold his own ministers accountable are a shame on this entire place. And I only hope that the women of Australia remember how those opposite, the Liberal and National Party members here, have let them down at every opportunity. Here are the 12 days of Scott Morrison's Christmas for the Australian people. 12 jobs for his mates, 11 months of policy and action, 10 days of sitting until next August, nine glossy blue brochures, eight sitting days of chaos, seven vaccine targets missed, six car parks cancelled, five backflips at least, four ministerial resignations, three fewer senators to count on in this chamber, too many lies, one big botched rollout. Australia, that's your Christmas present from Mr Morrison. He's no Santa. Instead of good governance, we've had zero integrity commissions, zero women's budget statements, zero action on housing affordability and zero accountability from those opposite. It's been a year of power without glory. Do not give them the chance to continue next Thank year you, in the same way. Your time has expired, Senator Askew. Well, Madam Deputy President, once again we've had a series of misquotes, vague references and accusations against the Prime Minister from the opposition in our question time today. What a way to finish the last week of another very difficult year. Surely there were questions of policy that they could have asked, but no, only innuendos and wild accusations, including around quarantine proposals loaded with implications. Quarantine Services Australia is a not-for-profit company established by the private sector to support industry, and it's important to note that the government has not and is not funding QSA in any way. Of course, we do have an interest in the work they, they do or they're proposed to do because we want Australian businesses to be able to bring in the skilled workers they require to grow and create more jobs during our pandemic recovery. We know there's a skilled workforce shortage in Australia and travel restrictions during the pandemic have presented particular challenges. That's why we've flagged skilled workers are our next stage in the border reopening, which as we know was due this week but has been paused until the 15th to give us time to understand the new Omicron variant. That said, our vaccination rates being among the highest in the world means we're now in a very strong position. That's why the New South Wales, ACT and Victorian governments removed the requirement to quarantine for fully vaccinated international travellers from 1 November. And in my home state, Tasmania, it's due, we're due to follow on 15 December. Dependent on vaccination rates, the remaining states and territories have flagged their intention to remove the requirement for fully vaccinated international travellers to quarantine by the end of this year or early next year. So the large-scale quarantine services we thought back in July that may be necessary are unlikely to be required in the future due to what we've achieved with our vaccination program. However, we do know that quarantine arrangements will likely continue to be necessary for certain groups of people coming into the country. So the formation of Quarantine Services Australia is a positive thing, an industry-led solution to help industry bring in the workforce they require. 
The Department of Home Affairs engaged DPG to facilitate a model capable of developing a quarantine approach that was private sector funded, scalable and acceptable to the states and territories. The model was required to be operational in the absence of any federal government financial support. And on the topic of quarantine facilities, I remind senators that during the course of COVID-19, this government has successfully worked in partnership with the Northern Tasmanian government to utilise the Centre for National Resilience at Howard Springs and indeed doubled its bed capacity, expanding the facility's capability to 2,000 beds. We're also looking at Victoria's Mickleham facility, which has a 100 bed capacity and the first stage should be complete shortly. We've also been working with the Western Australian Government on a new centre for national resilience, and we're in talks with the Queensland Government for a federal quarantine facility there too. These new centres for national resilience, which are fully funded by the Commonwealth, will increase capacity to repatriate Australians. However, afterwards, these facilities will also be available for other important long-term resilient, use, resilient uses, such as supporting responses to natural disasters. Madam Deputy President, today is our final day in this place for 2021, and later today we'll be undertaking a time of reflection and thanks for the year we have had. We will be wishing those around us a great break, a lovely holiday and a joyous Christmas season. So with that in mind, Madam Deputy President, how can we justify the behaviour we've seen in this place, not just today, where those opposite have once again launched an attack on the Prime Minister, but over recent days where unparliamentary behaviour and comments have been made against each other? The Jenkins report was entitled Set the Standard, and that is something that each and every one of us in the building, and particularly this place, should reflect on, particularly over the coming weeks. Too often there is language used, there are remarks made with the sole purpose of inflicting pain, and blatant disrespect is evident. We should be attacking the policies of our opponents, not the person. Madam Deputy President, I hold the Institute of the Senate and other senators in high regard and believe that when we return in 2022, we must hold each other to even greater account. This is not a gender or sexuality issue. It's not a political or a race issue. We are all here as equals, and we need to show due respect to that fact and to each other. I look forward to seeing everybody in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, here we are at the end of Parliament for the year, and after eight years in government, three years under Prime Minister Morrison, what are we left with? A government in shambles, a government that is divided, a government that is coming apart at the seams, a government who can't keep their own people in line a government who can't pass their own legislation, a government that Australians simply can't trust, a government that is led by a Prime Minister who can't seem to determine what is fact and what is fiction, a Prime Minister who says one thing one day and something completely different the next. From Cabago to Paris, our Prime Minister he is known for being loose with the truth. That is his reputation. Uh, and this is a government and a prime minister, the people of Australia, cannot trust to deliver for them. Because with Prime Minister Morrison, every problem is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. And instead of action, what we get from this prime minister is excuses. It's not my job. It's a matter for the states. I don't hold a hose. Whether it's bushfires or whether it's a global pandemic, Australians just can't trust this Prime Minister to lead. Australians couldn't trust him to roll out the vaccines. They couldn't even trust him to buy the vaccines in the first place. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister. The Prime Minister who said, we were at the front of the queue and then said it wasn't a race. A Prime Minister who said one thing one day and something the next, and Australians paid the price this year. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister to lead this country in a crisis, and they cannot trust this Prime Minister to lead the country at all. 
Australians can't even trust the Prime Minister to run his own government or even to run his own party. This Prime Minister is distracted by division in his own ranks. We have members of parliament, senators crossing the floor, left, right. We are uh, in a situation in this place today where the government is held hostage by one nation, held hostage by the extremes of its own party room. We are in a situation today where we have a Prime Minister who is showing no leadership whatsoever to rein in the members of his own party, his own government, who are spreading fear and misinformation about vaccines. He can't even shut down the misinformation of Senator Rennick. This Prime Minister cannot keep his own party in line. So how can the people of Australia expect him to deliver for them? This is a Prime Minister who won't rein people in who are spreading misinformation and mistruth, even when their actions threaten to undermine the advice of the public health experts, even when they threaten the efforts of the millions of Australians who have gone out and done the right thing and got themselves vaccinated, even when they put the health of Australians at risk. It is completely unacceptable and shameful. But instead of providing leadership when we need it, instead of building on the values that saw us come together over the course of this pandemic, we have a Prime Minister seemingly happy to benefit, to benefit from the division in our community, playing a dangerous game of double speak in a desperate scrounge for votes, a desperate ploy to distract the people of Australia from the fact that after eight years, they don't have a plan for the things that matter to Australians. They have no plan to deliver the things that matter. A plan for good, secure jobs, the jobs that people need. They've got no plan to grow wages, the flattest on record. They've got no plan to fix our broken aged care system and value our aged care workers. No plan to rebuild manufacturing and make more of what we need here. No plan to act on climate and bring green energy jobs to Australia. And at a time when wages are going backwards and the cost of everything is going up, they've got no plan to make people's lives any better. No plan to make it easier. No plan to build a better and brighter future. This government can't even imagine that future, let alone deliver it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Walsh, and I call Senator Hughes. Deputy President, well, all I can say, honestly, is wow. Like, seriously. Sen I Senator thought... Hughes, just hold for a moment. I don't believe your microphone is on. Mm. I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I'll come back to the beginning, and I just want to say, guys, wow. I really did think there might have been some people on the opposite side of this chamber with a little bit of EQ, a little bit of emotional intelligence, might have been able to read the room. We had an incident in this chamber last night that was absolutely disgusting. The most vile of comments was made by a Green senator towards me that has been widely reported as one of the most vile things that has ever been said in this chamber. So what are you coming here today with? What are you coming here with? Smears, personal attacks, misinformation, lies. It is absolutely pathetic. Is that all you have? I mean, we know Albo's running a small target strategy. He's beyond small target. Order. He's not Order. there. Senator Hughes. Apologies. Uh, please refer to members of the other place by their correct title or full name. Apologies. Senator Hughes. The member for Graindler. No, he's running a small target strategy, but there's no such thing as a no target strategy which he's trying to achieve. I mean, they are, you have no policies on anything, and that is reflected in the fact that you come in here day after day making personal smears against the Prime Minister that are based in absolute mistruth, misinformation, distorting the facts. And I'm going to come back to COVID a little bit later. But listening to some of the responses and the comments that are coming from the opposite side of the chamber, I'm not sure we live in the same country. Australia has the highest vaccination rates amongst most countries across the world. We are at such a significant rate of vaccination, and this might be one for you to take a little note of. That's why we don't need quarantine centres, because once we're vaccinated, we're not quarantining. 
So we understand that you guys like to just throw money around, like, you know, because it's the taxpayers and you just chuck it where you can. There is no need for them. You guys wanted to give people 300 bucks to get the vaccine. They've gone out and got it willingly for nothing. Six billion dollars you were prepared to just up the wall. Six billion dollars of taxpayers' money to try and pay people to get a vaccine. Did not need to, do, to, to even think about it. But I would actually just like to point out to this place that not only in this chamber do we hear vile comments, but in question time today in the other place, when the uh, Minister Hunt was answering a question for the member for Chisholm, an ALP, ALP member screamed across the chamber, go and get a room. Well, we know you can't read it. Someone screamed out, go and get a room to Minister Hunt when he was answering a question from Gladys Liu. Seriously, has it, have you been sleepwalking through this week? The Jenkins report has been released on a week where we have seen the behaviour in this place to descend to new levels. Now, I haven't heard from one member of the Greens, and I'd like to say if Richard needed, Senator Di Natale and Senator see what were here, they were absolutely decent people, and I have no idea the Leader of the Greens, when it was Senator Di Natale, would have come and spoken to me about the vile behaviour of his colleague. He would have come and talked to me. He would have come and seen me. Rachel C. what I can guarantee would have done that and messaged me after the many years I've spent with her on committees and knowing what a decent person she is. But not a word, not a peep from someone at the end of this chamber. Absolutely shameful behaviour. The words are, I apologise for my colleague's conduct. But on top of that, just to rub a little extra salt in the wound, this morning the member for Sydney, who ironically is my local member, when was asked a question about the vile comment directed at me, started her sentence with, if it's true. If it's true. So we believe her, believe all women, oh, 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 except for conservative women, they deserve it. They should have got it. It's fine to speak to conservative women in that way because we're treated differently by women of the left. So it's not just what was said in this chamber, but the reaction that has been demonstrated by the highest profile woman in the ALP responding with, if it's true. Well, it was true. There was an apology given because it was so true. And you, all you women in the Labor Party should be ringing up the member for Sydney and asking her to apologise, because that is disgusting and disgraceful. And if you've got nothing but personal smears against the Prime Minister going into this election, do you honestly think Australians who've had their jobs saved, who have incredibly high vaccinations rate, who have been supported through this pandemic is such a good way that you think your smears are going to have any impact on the result? Thank you, Senator Hughes. I call Senator Grogan. Thank you. Australians were truly disgusted to see the Prime Minister's behaviour last year, and that is not a smear. That is a fact. This is not a grubby attack, as accused by those on the other side. It's a fact. Mr Morrison was off on holiday in Hawaii when the bushfires hit, and when he finally got back, finally decided he should maybe do something, he made the whole thing about himself. One of the things that shocked people about Mr Morrison's behaviour was his conduct towards Zoe, the young woman that Senator Ayres was talking about just before. And he referred questions to Minister Birmingham about that exchange. She's a young woman, young pregnant woman at the time, who had lost her home. And the Prime Minister grabbed her hand to shake it. That's a fact. Patted her on the shoulder. That's also a fact. And when she turned around to plead with him for help, he walked away. That is also a fact. They are not smears. They are facts. Senator Birmingham implied that Senator Ayres was out of line when he brought up this exchange. And that is outrageous. Those opposite said it was grubby that we would raise such things. It's not grubby. These are facts we're addressing here. Zoe, in her own words, said, I have lost everything. My house is burnt to the ground and the Prime Minister had turned his back on me. 
That is outrageous to say that those things are slurs. They are not. They are facts. In my home state, South Australia, was hit especially hard by the bushfires last year, the bushfires that Mr Morrison handled so atrociously. Again, that is a fact. Kangaroo Island, Cudley Creek, communities across the Adelaide Hills, homes and businesses were lost. Livelihoods were ruined and lives were lost. Mr Birmingham has accused us of muckraking for raising it. It's not muckraking. The courage, strength and commitment shown by people across Australia has not been matched by their Prime Minister. He showed his, two, his true character in the heat of that crisis and he let us all down. The bushfire season started yesterday in South Australia, and we're worried. We are worried about a repeat of last year, and we are worried that once again we'll be abandoned by this government. Mr Birmingham says we should all be talking about policy, not people, that we shouldn't be raising these points, we should be just talking about policy. Okay, so let's talk about the Emergency Response Fund. The government has spent just 0.37 per cent from a $4.7 billion fund, an emergency response fund. Now, you'd imagine from the name that it is about responding to emergencies. But two and a half years after it was established, a minute amount of money has been allocated. So let's talk about the fact that this fund can allocate up to $200 million a year for disaster recovery and resilience, things such as constructing evacuation centres, fire breaks and other mitigation measures that this country desperately needs. But by failing to invest this $4.7 billion fund, this government has again failed Australians, and this Prime Minister has again failed Australians especially those who live in the bush. The Prime Minister has ignored very clear warnings by former New South Wales fire rescue um, head Greg Mullins and 23 other fire and emergency chiefs back before the 2019-2020 fire season. He refused to invest in a national aerial fire firefighting fleet. Again, that is a fact. And when Australia was on fire, he went on holiday to Hawaii, fact, and posed for gratuitous selfies on the beach. What we need is real action. We need properly resourced fire services. We need help for our communities to prepare for future fire, um, for bushfire risks. And we need a prime minister and a government that acts and listens. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And the question is that the motion moved by Senator O'Neill that the Senate take note of questions by Senators Ayres, Gallagher and Ciccone of Minister Birmingham and Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the responses of Minister Rustin to the questions asked by my colleague Senator Cox. Um, it is Australia's shame that the Liberals are propping up coal, oil and gas by funneling endless taxpayer dollars to these dirty industries. The world is moving away from digging up fossil fuels, but the Liberals are pouring tens of millions of dollars of public money to frack the Beetaloo Basin and plunge us further into the climate crisis. The Liberals live in some parallel universe where there are no consequences for mining and burning fossil fuels. Or you have your heads buried in the sand because it fills the coffers of those who line your pockets with cash. Or you just don't care because you have the luxury of being able to afford to protect yourselves from the deadly consequences that marginalized communities will have to face. The Pacific, Pacific Islanders don't have the luxury as their homelands sink underwater. The people on the subcontinent where I come from don't have that luxury as thousands die every year due to brutal climate-induced heat waves. First Nations people don't have the luxury as you destroy their land and water. 
Traditional owners do not consent to fracking on their land. Beetaloo Basin's traditional owners have already condemned the Morrison government for ha handing out millions to gas companies. Tax dodging companies, big donors and billionaires will profit from the destruction of First Nations lands. All this while local communities are struggling for basic infrastructure like health and housing. And what for? For the profits of climate wrecking corporations. 70% of the Northern Territory land is earmarked for fracking. If the Beetaloo Basin is opened up and fracked, Australia's emissions will rise massively, and this will be a ticking climate bomb. This is ecocide. The International Energy Agency has warned us to reach net zero by 2050, there should be no more coal, oil, or gas projects. The Greens will not stand by and watch the Liberal Nationals destroy country and plunge us faster into a climate emergency. We know that Australia must take responsibility for our role in the climate crisis with a serious plan to bring down Australia's carbon emissions. And that means no more coal and gas. And which side is the so-called opposition party taking? In August 2021, the Morrison government, supported by Labour, voted to give 50 million of public money to oil and gas corporations to open up the Beetaloo. No amount of actual science or the climate disasters that we have been witnessing in our own backyard, the fires, the floods, the heat waves, nothing seems to convince the Liberals and Labour that digging up fossil fuels is dangerous in the extreme. It is killing us. It is destroying our livelihoods, our communities and our planet. The Beetaloo slush fund stinks of corruption and will be deadly for our climate. This gas rot has already given millions to Minister Taylor's mates. Empire Energy was handed out 21 million to drill at three sites in Beetaloo, despite still waiting on environmental approvals for the Northern Territory government. Surely Labour can see the problems here. Surely Labour can see the stench of corruption, the influence of big corporate money here. It's clear that the Liberals don't give a damn about climate change, or democracy for that matter. But I expected better from Labour. But sometimes you do wonder why you expect better from Labour, because you are let down every single time. If you don't want to stop fracking the Beetaloo Basin, if you can't support an end to coal and gas, then you don't really want to tackle the climate crisis then all the rest are just empty words. It's all mere theatre. And through you, Acting Deputy President, in the last minute that I have, I do want to wish everyone a restful, rejuvenating and relaxing holiday season. It has been a very tough two years, so I hope that we can all enjoy a little break with our loved ones. And happy Festivus, everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Faruqi. And the question is that the motion moved by Senator Faruqi that the Senate take note of questions asked by Senator Cox of, of Minister Ruston be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No? The ayes have it. We're moving now on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I present a dissenting report relating to the inquiry by the Community Affairs Legislation Committee into the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Participant Service Guarantee and Other Measures Bill 2021. And I probably should seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Ayres, you seek... No, I think I'll go to Senator Davey. Uh, just quick ones, yes. <laughs> um, I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates. Um, thank you. And on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present the 487th report of the committee as well as an executive minute on the committee's 484th report. Are you seeking leave to continue your remark? So the question, question is then that the Senate take note of the document. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against? No? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present, uh, firstly, uh, the uh, lessons to be learned in relation to the Australian bushfire season 2019 to 20 report of the Finance and Public Administration References Committee, listed at item 16 of today's order of business, together with accompanying documents. And I move that the Senate take note uh, of that report. I, I have a subsequent report uh, to deal with, but. Um, the, the, do you want me to put the question, or do you want to make I, I some remarks? I want to make some comments in right. relation to that. Continue then, thank you, Senator. Um, this is, uh, I think, a very significant report of the Finance and Public Administration References Committee. It was my wish that the inquiry would go to South Australia, the New South Wales, South Coast, and the North Coast, and the Northern Tablelands, South East Queensland the Tumut, Batlow and Tumbarumba regions of New South Wales, Gippsland and North East Victoria, indeed to Kangaroo Island, to give those communities an opportunity to be heard. Sadly, COVID-19 outbreaks prevented us from doing so, but I want to thank all those communities that we couldn't visit, to, and I want them to know that we've had them in mind throughout the inquiry. We received 192 submissions and had held 10 public hearings, mostly by video conference. We heard from some of the people most devastated by the fires, from New South Wales South Coast communities where in the darkness of New Year's Eve 2019, the Badger Forest Road fire tore through the Wandella, Cabago and Korma communities in a firestorm that nobody could possibly have previously imagined. We heard from communities in the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury regions west of Sydney where fires raged for 79 days until it rained. We heard of the experiences of communities like Walwa and Koryong in northeast Victoria, who made the best of the limited resources they had to keep people safe. We heard from experts in emergency management and fire response, from experts in fire behaviour and forest ecology, and from local government authorities who are doing the on-the-ground recovery work and whose knowledge and experience have persuaded us that there is no point in fighting old battles over hazard reduction and a new consensus is required if we are to keep people safe. Fires take their names from their places of ignition. Over the months of the black summer, the obscure names of remote places where blazes started, Curroan, Dunn's Road, Postman's Track, Big Jack Mountain, Wingan, Green Wattle Creek, Mile Creek Road, Good Good, Ruined Castle, Long Gully Road and many others became the names of unwelcome summer holiday visitors who wouldn't leave. The communities they threatened listened to their radios, watched their phones and received the escalating alerts of advice, watch and act, emergency warning and the dreaded, it's too late to leave, you must shelter in place. Communities along the eastern seaboard spent a summer in the heat and smoke, anxiously clearing away ignition points from around their homes, doing that long overdue run to the tip to get rid of all those lengths of old timber uh, and all the household rubbish. Now all they were good for was fuel. As people were prepared for the worst, the catch cry was, hurry up and wait. It is predominantly their stories that have led the committee to make the recommendations that we have. It's the stories of evacuation and stories of seeking help over and over again. Stories of trauma and frightened kids that have shaped our recommendations around making the task of domestic disaster response and recovery more keenly focused on the humanitarian nature of what disaster response and recovery is all about. If Australian aid workers turned up in a foreign disaster zone with a competitive grant program, I'm fairly sure that we would be asked to leave. It's the stories of people feeling helpless as fires that had burned remotely for weeks emerged from the bush to devour farms, houses and whole towns that shape our recommendation for a better national air aerial firefighting fleet. It's the stories of homeowners and businesses in fire-affected areas who can't afford insurance that have shaped our recommendation for the ACCC to investigate insurance affordability in bushfire-prone regions. Ms Therese Carney is a grief counsellor with Catholic Care. She described her experience of visiting schools in Gippsland after the fires. She said, 
In February, I went to the primary schools around Orbist, Bairnsdale, Mallacoota, and the feeling that I got from entering the school was quite eerie. The children were very repressed and depressed. There was no joy there. There was no children's noise in the playground. Even in the play, it wasn't play. These children had such heightened levels of adrenaline that they didn't know if they were afraid, if they were angry, if they were just wanting to go away and hide up or curl up in a ball, or all of those things. Mr Graham Friedman lost his house, along with everything above and below ground at his home and property at Wandella in what he described as a fire tornado on New Year's Eve 2019. He spoke to us about having to re-identify himself and his family every time they needed help from a different agency or charity. He said, we are sick and tired of re-identifying ourselves as bushfire impacted. Every program across all of government loses us half a day of our time and induces further trauma, retelling our story in the re-identification process. It breaks people mentally, he said, and virtually takes you to tears every time it occurs, Mr Friedman told us. Tony Jennings has been a rural firefighter with the Candelo Brigade in the Bega Valley for over 45 years. He told us of his efforts to get post-trauma counselling for himself and his colleagues. He said, I heard volunteers on the radio because they were crying out for help. I decided to try and get help for them but I ran into a brick wall. I had two phone counselling sessions. I didn't realise I needed counselling. It was because we lost two very good staff, and that angered me and upset me. Unfortunately, I couldn't arrange counselling for other people. He went on to say there was a young guy, about 17, who had not long ago joined the brigade. I don't know what's going to happen to him in the future, whether he's going to have some mental issues. Hopefully he won't. Hopefully he's OK, but we won't know. Ms Sandy Greaves, CEO of the Walwa Bush Nursing Centre, told us of the stress and strain of communities having to make applications for financial assistance in the competitive grants process. She said having to make grant applications, potentially missing out on those grant applications, having to change expectations and planning around what you get and what you don't get, and then having to actually project manage carries with it a significant degree of stress for a farming community who are already attempting to undertake three jobs. Ms Greaves' evidence about the stress of traumatised communities making grant applications for basic needs was reflected in every community that we heard from. These are just a few of the stories of the Black Summer fires. In all of these stories is a common thread. We weren't prepared and we should have been. The warnings were ignored or downplayed. Not just the warnings of the winter and spring of 2019, but the warnings of the past decade. Had we been prepared, people probably wouldn't have been driven into the sea at Malakuta and Browlee. The death toll would have been lower and property loss losses would have been less. As a country that will suffer the worst impacts of climate change, we need to lift our game to keep people safe. That's what this report is all about. Finally, there is one thing that truly bothers me and I think bothered members of the committee. How is it that $4 billion sits in an emergency response fund announced after the bushfires with up to $200 million a year available? for disaster recovery and resilience building, yet two years on from the fires, a mere $17 million has been spent by the Commonwealth Government. How is it that there are still hundreds of homes to be rebuilt on the New South Wales south coast and people are still living in makeshift shelters? How is it that with the vast resources of the Commonwealth and with the billions of dollars have set aside that these needs have not been addressed. 
Something is seriously wrong, and the next parliament needs to fix it. Senator Ayres, oh, I see. Okay, Senator oh, Rice, are you speaking to the same yes. report? Yes. Lessons learned in relation to Australian bushfire season 2019-20. Yes. Thanks, Acting Senator Deputy Rice. President. And I participated in this inquiry, and I wish to thank Senator Ayres for his work on this inquiry and leading this inquiry. It was an incredibly important. Um, <sighs> experience, basically, listening to people from around the country as to what their experience of going through the trauma of the fires of the 2019-2020 Black Summer fires were. And I wish to associate myself with the remarks that Senator Ayres has just put on the record of all of the stories of how people were so deeply affected, the trauma that they experienced and how some of them are still experiencing that ongoing trauma. I won't repeat that any much to do with that those experiences, but absolutely hear them and know just what a significant impact those fires had on people's lives, and what needs to be done so that such experiences we can reduce the possibility that they occur again. The report outlines a number of recommendations, including making sure that we've got you know getting to fires more quickly, better. Um, aircraft support for them, better uh, understanding of fire hazards, um, a whole range of things, and then being better prepared for disaster, better communications, a whole range of things that we can do better. But fundamentally, the point that I want to make and what the Australian Greens made in our additional comments, that these sort of disasters, these sort of traumatic, extraordinarily awful experiences that so many people went through in the 2019-20 summer are just going to keep on coming and just get worse unless we do something about our climate crisis. It is, the science is so clear. I was briefed just this week by lead authors of the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, the sixth assessment report, which brings together the knowledge of climate science from all around the world. These Australian climate scientists, leading climate scientists, we covered the whole ground of things, but I was particularly interested in what they had to say about fire. And the story is devastating. Essentially, even at one and a half degrees of warming, which we are trying our best to keep under, fires like we saw over the 2019-20 summer are going to become more frequent. They are going to become more intense, and the fire season is going to be longer. They told me in particular the fire season is just going to keep on starting earlier and we're going to be having more intense fires from earlier in the summer, earlier in the spring, and they are going to continue for longer. This is the reality. And of course, the world is not on track for staying beneath one and a half degrees of warming. We are far from it. At the moment, we are on track for three to four degrees of warming. And Australia, of course, is a complete, completely cl complicit in this devastating scenario. That's what we are looking for. So there's nothing that we can do. We can do all of the pre-planning. We can do all of the fighting the fires. But if we get to a world of three degrees or more of warning, of warming. The sort of fires that we saw in 2019-20 are going to be like a walk in the park, and more of Australia is going to be subject to those fires. And the fire weather that we saw occurring for the first time um, in, to any great extent in 2019-20 of the pyrocumulus clouds, basically the fire feeding its own behaviour, that was noted by the, the, the fire scientists who were studying the fires after they occurred and said this was unlike what had been seen in most fires across Australia ever before. This is just the beginning. So I urge the Senate, I urge the government, I urge everybody in this place, no matter what party you, you are from, to be taking these warnings seriously. We've got to listen to the, the stories, the tragedies that people experienced during 2019-20, and we've got to learn from them. And learning from them means doing all of the sensible pre-planning and the mitigation that we can do. But to learn from them seriously, we know that we've got to be serious about taking the urgent action of reducing our carbon pollution in line with the science. And that means at least a 75 per cent reduction by 2030. And absolutely fundamentally, it means that there is no way 
that we can afford to be continuing to expand coal and gas mining in this country. For us to play our part of keeping warming below 1.5 degrees so that we are not ending up in a scenario where these types of fires are just more and more prevalent, we need to be getting out of the mining the burning and the export of coal and gas and oil. That is just the fundamental reality. You cannot argue with the physics. That's what needs to occur if we are really going to be paying proper attention to the lessons that we have heard and the lessons that we've learnt from the 2019-20 Black Summer fires. Senator uh, Rice, are you seeking to continue your remarks? I to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, no other speakers on that report. Senator Ayres, I think, are you, you. wanting to speak on the next report? Uh, I present the second of the Finance and Public Administration References Committee reports, um, the report into the Urban Congestion Fund, as listed at item 16 of today's order of business, together with accompanying documents. And I move that the Senate take note of the reports. This afternoon, thousands of Australians will be struck in traffic. Even as Australia recovers from the pandemic, the traffic has started again in our major cities. Before the pandemic, Sydney siders spent an average of 71 minutes a day commuting. Those figures to highest in outer suburbs. Rouse Hill, for example, saw its average commute jump by 60 per cent in the five years to 2019. That is time away from family, hours of our lives spent waiting, unproductive in economic or family or community terms. At a campaign rally before the 2019 election, dripping with mock marketing sincerity, the Prime Minister said this about the construction of commuter car parks. Yes, it's cement and it is bitumen, he said, and it's all of these things. But what it is really about is how we are really committed to families, to ensure that people get home sooner and safer in this big city of ours or in the big city of Melbourne or Brisbane or over in Perth or wherever it happens to be. This report outlines a broken promise to those Australians, how the government saw that desire to spend more time with our families and exploited it for their short-term political advantage. Commuter car parks should serve a purpose, particularly in our outer suburbs, where bus links to stations are spread too far apart to make long car commutes inevitable for too many Australians. But this government wasn't interested in achieving a policy objective Mr Morrison was only interested in using public money to sandbag vulnerable Victorian seats. It wasn't built on a coherent plan to manage growing Australian citizens. They didn't consult state and local governments, which has left the federal government exposed to the full cost of these ventures, guaranteeing inevitable cost overruns and delays. Contrast this to the Victorian Level Crossing Removal Initiative. Premier Andrews said he would remove 50 level crossings by 2022. As of last week, he had delivered all 50. The commuter car park was $660 million of taxpayer money for Liberal Party campaign announcements. The money was administered through a process in which coalition MPs and candidates canvassed the now former Minister Tudge's office directly. Former Minister Tudge's office, with the direct involvement of the Prime Minister's office, then finalised announcements for projects based off the interests and the timetables of coalition candidates and campaigns. There was no consideration of a project's merits. There was no evaluation of a project's feasibility or costs. The only metric that mattered was votes. It was a rort. It remains a giant rort from a corrupted government that has learned nothing and shows every sign of doing it again next year. No wonder they won't deliver a real National Anti-Corruption Commission with capability and teeth. But this practice wasn't limited to car parks. The evidence before the committee demonstrates that the entire $4.8 billion urban congestion fund has been used as a vehicle for the selection of projects with the same process. As the Australian National Audit Office made clear in their evidence to the committee, the canvassing process that determined which projects were funded did not distinguish between car parks and other infrastructure. There remains $890 million 
of unallocated funds in the Urban Congestion Fund, ripe for rorting ahead of next year's election. Several of the report's recommendations are for immediate action. The committee recommends an urgent ANAO audit of the entire Urban Congestion Fund. The report recommends that the Department of Infrastructure release the investment principles and policy objectives for the, urgent, for the Urban Congestion Fund by no later than 31 January 2022. This report recommends that the Prime Minister table to the House of Representatives a full explanation to the parliament of the role that he and his office played in the allocation of funding under the Commuter Car Park Fund. That report should be tabled no later than Friday 17 December 2021. Prime Minister, you have 15 days to explain to the Australian people the role that you played and that your office played in the Commuter Car Park Fund with Minister Tudge and the Liberal Party campaign. Don't hide behind former Minister Tudge. Don't hide behind Mr Gaitchens. Don't hide behind self-serving interpretation of cabinet confidentiality and public interest immunity. It is time for this Prime Minister to be straight with the Australian people about how he has spent their money. The Australian people should view this deadline as another test of this Prime Minister's honesty and of his truthfulness. Questions of transparency and accountability here are not limited to the Prime Minister. I would draw the Senate's attention to the Department of Infrastructure's failure to cooperate with this inquiry. They refused to respond to a number of questions on notice from the committee's inquiries. They refused to respond to two separate orders for the production of documents passed by this chamber on 23 August and 20 October, respectively. This reflects poorly on the ministers and public servants responsible for a department that is entrusted with billions of dollars of taxpayer money. The administration of this fund by former Minister Tudge and this Prime Minister was corrupted. The Prime Minister deliberately perverts a critical distinction between decisions of government and the decisions of political parties seeking government in an election campaign. The government frequently raised Labor's election commitments on commuter car parks, another dishonest deflection. Those decisions were clearly those of a political party seeking government, still subject to the mandate of elections, the processes of government and engagement with delivery partners. The decisions in relation to the commuter car park were clearly decisions of government, authorised by the Prime Minister. Funding commitments were included in the pre-election economic and financial outlook, and they were referred to as government decisions in the department's own materials. The distinction between party interest and public interest is critical to our rule of law and to protections against partisan corruption. And this is just one more example where this Prime Minister and this government don't understand that vital distinction. It is the basis for our Westminster system of government. It is what distinguishes our democracy from kleptocracies overseas. Additionally, there are outstanding questions about how these decisions were consistent with the relevant legislation, particularly the Public Covenants, Performance and Accountability Act and the National Land Transport Act. And with another federal election around the corner, the abuse of caretaker conventions and protections against the misuse of public money to approve these projects is a particular concern. When this Prime Minister goes to communities promising developments, they should reflect, voters should reflect on the corruption of these processes before. Finally, the report recommends that the government establish an independent commission against corruption at the Commonwealth level. It's been vital in New South Wales to restoring public confidence, cleaning up the New South Wales police force and the public service and rebuilding good political culture in the parliament and cabinet for Labor and Liberal governments alike. Today, it is being resisted by the same self-serving arguments that were levelled against the introduction of the New South Wales ICAC 
by then Premier Nick Greiner. Those arguments were wrong then and completely redundant now. As uh, Senator Fearavanti Wells said, Madam Acting Deputy President, this week, in her blistering and comprehensive demolition of opponents of a federal ICAC within the government, she said, are they conflicted? The answer is, of course they are. Of course they are. That's why a decent, fair income National Anti-Corruption Commission with capability and teeth, with the capability to clean up government, will only be established by a fresh start with an Albanese Labor government. Senator Rice on the same point, uh, yes, same report. Thanks, Thank Acting you. Deputy President. And I'll be quick given the timing. So I just wanted to say three things which to summarise the recommendations of this important report into the car parks wrought colloquially. The first, which is reflected in the first recommendation, is that the Prime Minister was up to his neck in it. That this, as the report says, that the, uh, the commuter car park scheme and the urban congestion fund was being used as a vehicle for political purpose. Basically, we had a systematic, coordinated scheme, not just car parks, but also going across sports routes, community development grants, building better regions fund, basically systematic, coordinated scheme to be spending taxpayers' money for political purpose, to buy votes. The Prime Minister was in up to his neck in it, and he needs to come clean. Hence the first recommendation of this report asking that we need to have a full explanation to the parliament of the role that the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's office, the Deputy Prime Minister's office and any other ministerial officers and staff played in the allocation of funding under the Commuter Car Park Fund. The second really clear suite of recommendations here reflect the fact that in terms of the overall purpose of the Urban Congestion Fund of tackling urban congestion, the whole process of determining where the money went did not come close to that. In fact, there was a double removal from urban congestion. First of all, the department has done zero work on determining what sort of projects you should be funding if you're serious about tackling urban congestion. And certainly very, very little evidence that commuter car parks are actually are at all useful for ta tackling urban congestion. But even if you accepted that, then that the process of deciding where those car parks should go was not based on any assessment of, um, based, uh, of any assessment of their efficacy in tackling urban congestion. Essentially, we had coalition members of parliament being canvassed to say, where would you like a car park, basically, for where you could buy votes. That was there's such clear evidence, both from our report and the investigations we did, of course, building upon the important work that the Auditor General did into their report into the car parks fund. And the third point, and I think the, probably in terms of going forward, the most important point is, well, how are we going to make sure this doesn't occur again? And essentially, when we asked the integrity experts as to, well, how, you know, what can we change to make sure this doesn't happen again, and they came back to us resoundingly with the same answer that we needed a federal anti-corruption commission, an integrity commission that had teeth. That's what is needed to make sure that this sort of corruption, these rorts, do not continue into the future. The Greens, of course, we've had. Uh, a bill we've had a bill that's gone through this place it's been sitting down in the house of representatives for 2 years now 2 years we had a government that had promised that in this term of their government they were going to introduce legislation for an anti corruption commission which they've decided now in these last weeks of parliament just hasn't been a priority We've had priorities of you know, moving on um, religious discrimination law that's going to increase discrimination against people, an awful lot of other legislation, but the anti-corruption legislation has not been a priority. Fundamentally, that's what we need. We need an anti-corruption body with teeth. And frankly, I do not trust that this government is going to deliver it. The only way that we're going to give, uh, deliver it is to kick this government out. So I'm really looking forward to my last speech in this place for, for this year, looking forward to next year, looking forward to an election, looking forward to kicking this government out and then having 
you know, what we would very much like to see and what I think has got, we've got a good chance of achieving, seeing the Greens with shared balance of power pushing the next government to be able to go further and faster on issues of corruption as well as tackling the other important fairness and sustainability issues that we as an Australian community face. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator M uh, McCarthy. Might help if I take the mask off. I know. <laughs> um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I present the final report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Act 2021, together with accompanying documents. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the um, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee's report into the Inspector General of Water Compliance. As a participating member of the committee, I just wanted to um, make a couple of general points and uh, I will endeavour to be brief. Um, the Nationals very much welcome the committee's recommendations and the ongoing monitoring role that they have for the next few months over the uh, responsibilities and the implementation of the Office of Water Compliance and the Independent Inspector General. Um, the one thing we do note, however, is that the committee has failed to reflect other opinions of the witnesses that would relate to um, any other matters as referenced in the terms of reference for the committee's responsibilities. The committee heard from several witnesses about the significant social and economic impact of water recovery and the view that sourcing the remainder of the water recovery targets from productive use will make their communities unviable. But this is not the first time this parliament has heard that view. Since 2010, when the Guide to the Basin Plan was first released, there's been at least 40 plus inquiries into the Basin Plan. And each and every time we have heard of the significant economic impact of untargeted, non strategic water buyback has had in our regional communities. In one area close to where I live, the area of Warcool, more than 50 per cent of the water entitlements that were on, a, on issue in that district were purchased by the government. And yet, amazingly, the region continues to be pro productive, but at a cost. Increased water use charges, increased infrastructure costs, costs, increased costs of doing business because there's less farmers in the district. That's just one example of the many that have been put forward time and time again to this parliament. And I don't know how many times I have to rise in this parliament to say there are better ways. In fact, in 2004, a parliamentary committee looking into the Living Murray program actually made a recommendation. They identified that water, just add water, is not the solution, that you need a holistic approach to improve and achieve environmental outcomes. So yet again, the nationals are recommending that a mechanism be established to account for outcomes that can be achieved through complementary measures as an alternative to water entitlement recovery to meet the Basin Plan objectives. And I just want to bring to your attention some of the things we heard from some of the witnesses, and not just witnesses from the irrigation industry. I want to acknowledge Healthy Rivers Ambassador Mr Robert Newman, who identified that we need to focus on the interaction of agencies and the interaction of the delivery of programs, because when one component fails, the whole thing is put at risk. And he identified the fact that things like constraints relaxation, with the constraints, in his words, 
If you let one program slip, such as the constraints relaxation, it does create big deficiencies in the delivery of other outcomes. And he went on to say, and I quote, without that outcome being constraints, the whole basin plan is jeopardised. Now, the constraints management strategy is not just add water. It is not buying more water, but it is entering into agreements with landholders and farmers. It's addressing issues such as infrastructure issues, because without it, you'll flood private land, public infrastructure and uh, vast swathes of land. We can do better. We've done better. There are programs throughout the Murray and even in South Australia where private irrigation infrastructure is used to target water to environmental refuges to make them resilient and drought-proof them. So that when a natural flood event happens, which will happen, those refuges are ready to boom. But it also gets them through during the drought. In fact, it is far better to use that sort of infrastructure to benefit our environmental wetlands in times of low water availability than to farcically think that without rain you're still going to be able to achieve a 120 gigalitre flow event. You can't do it because the environmental water holders' entitlements are the same as farmers' entitlements. So if a farmer is on zero per cent allocation, so is the environmental water holder. So they also have no water to give. I am so passionate about this issue. The executive officer of the National Irrigators Council summed it up perfectly when he said the basin plan is an adaptive document, but the stringent focus on volumes over outcomes has created rigidity which doesn't address the physical constraints and limitations of the system and the actual outcomes we're trying to achieve. So I implore the Senate, the government, my South Australian colleagues, you've got wetlands down there, uh, you, you've got innovative irrigation communities in South Australia who've been at the forefront of some of the stuff I'm talking about. I implore you all to stop focusing on a number that has resulted from a computer model and start focusing on the outcomes we want to achieve, the frogs we want to breed, the birds, the fish passage we need to address, the cold water pollution we need to address, the aeration of the system and addressing blue-green algae. That is what will improve the health of the Murray-Darling Basin. We have enough water. Now focus on managing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Davey. Um, Senator Chandler. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Fawcett, the Chair, I present the interim report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on advocating for the elimination of child and forced marriage, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I seek leave to incorporate the tabling statement into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Minister. When I present the government responses to reports of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee on the accuracy of information provided to the Defence Force Retirement and Death Benefits members and the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters on the Future Conduct of Elections Operating During Times of Emergency Situations, in accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents. Oh, not yet. Let me read the screed first. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on page 12 to 14 of the notice paper. Any document to which no Senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Let's start on page 12. Senator McCarthy. Very eager. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Our documents 1, 2, 6, 8 and 9 on page 12. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. We'll now move to page 13. Any documents on page 13? Yes, Senator McCarthy. Uh, numbers 10, 11, 14 and 20. 
And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you. And uh, 22 to 25, do you seek leave, uh, Senator McCarthy, in relation to any of those? Uh, this is sorry, I'm on committee reports and government responses. Uh, no, not yet. Yes, we'll proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses, and order to general's reports, which are listed on pages 14 to 15. Thank you. The notice paper. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, numbers one, four, and eight on page 14, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Yes, thank you, Senator McCarthy. Are there no other, no other senator wishes to take note of any other document. Thank you. We now move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements, Minister? Thank you. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the government response to the Environment and Communications References Committee report on shark mitigation and deterrent measures, the review of packaging covenant and other measure, the Water for the Environment special account, the National Gas Infrastructure Plan, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, the Three Capes Track Project and the Select Committee on COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Biosecurity Amendment Enhanced Risk Management Bill 2021 and uh, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill 2021. Minister. If these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the question that the bills be now read uh, a first time. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to human cloning and research involving human embryos and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the mitochondrial donation law reform MOVES law bill 2021 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Oh, sorry. Oh, Senator. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 8 February 2022. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. All those in favour, aye. Good. Uh, Minister. I'll put the question that the uh, bills be uh, made an order of the day. All those in favour, aye. All those against, the ayes have it. The President uh, has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Investment Funds Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister? I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bills be now read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to the Future Fund, the Medical Research Future Fund and the Emergency Response Fund and for other purposes. Minister. I move this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Uh, Messages have been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the following bills without amendment. Autonomous Sanctions Amendment Magnitsky Style and Other Thematic Sanctions Bill 2021, Crimes Amendment Remission of Sentences Bill 2021 and Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021. Uh, the President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills. Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Economic Empowerment Bill 2021, Agriculture and Veterinary Chemicals Legislation Amendment Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority Board and Other Improvements Bill 2019, Electoral Legislation Amendment Political Campaigners Bill 2021 and Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 5 Bill 2021. 
The President has also received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. The President has received a letter requesting a change in the membership of a committee minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I move that Senator Pratt replace Senator Carr on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for the committee's inquiry into the Religious Discrimination Bill 2021 and related bills. Thank you. All the Yes, or do I have to put that question? I put the question. All those in favour say aye. All those against, the ayes have it. I think we now move to you, Senator O'Neill, to tell us about your delegation report. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. As Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to present a delegation report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the 142nd Interparliamentary Union Assembly, which took place virtually from the 24th to the 28th of May 2021. And I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the document. Um, and I would just like to make a few brief remarks uh, about the background for this a remarkable organisation, which is actually um, about parliament to parliament contact, parliamentarians actually uh, getting together, uh, understanding more and more the way the world is, is working and how we can work together to improve things. It's an international organisation of parliaments of sovereign states, and it works to essentially promote democratic governance, institution and values, uh, and aims to improve the lives of, of people right across the world by building strong national parliaments that can deliver better outcomes for citizens. Um, originally, the 142nd Assembly was scheduled for Geneva, Switzerland in April 2020. But of course, like so many uh, of our communications across the world, that was profoundly interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, in its wake, the um, IPU, the International Parliamentary Union Executive Committee, decided that the 142nd uh, IPU assembly would be held in the week of the 28th, uh, 24th of May 2021 in a virtual format. Um, can, I, can I just say that uh, when the virtual format runs on the time of a European country, it's a little challenging in terms of the representation. But nonetheless, um, my fellow uh, delegates to that uh, that virtual IPU assembly uh, were Ms Lucy Wicks, MP, uh, Member for Robertson, the Senator uh, Hon Honourable Sarah Henderson, uh, myself and uh, Mr Julian Hill, MP. And uh, between us, with the support of a remarkable secretariat, and I just really want to acknowledge the incredible work they do for us, we, um, we attended quite a number of sessions between 11 p.m. at night and three o'clock in the morning to do our bit to stand for the people of Australia, to understand what's going on in other contexts and represent our great country. Um, it was a shame that we, weren't un we were unable to join the actual 143rd Assembly, which is occurring in this week and over the last week uh, in Madrid, uh, to be uh, active participants because uh, the IPU decided that it would be by, only by attendance and we were no longer able to meet them between 11 p.m. and 4 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, it turned it turned into a different sort of a experience. Sadly, we were unable to make a contribution, but we'll be able to secure the documents and see what we can do. The IPU um, has taken uh, this year to really renew its strategy for 2017 to 2021, and I think the eight objectives that we've uh, agreed to sign up with the rest of the participants uh, are really worthy of noting. Um, that is to build strong democratic parliaments, advance gender equality and respect for women's rights, protect and promote human rights, contribute to peace building, conflict prevention and security, promote interparliamentary dialogue and cooperation, promote youth empowerment, mobilise parliaments around global development agenda and bridge the democracy gap in international relations. Uh, this is a very, very important uh, international organisation. Uh, in which Australians have taken a significant and prominent role over many years, 
uh, and it's different from many of the other delegations that might be just uh, incidental. This is a period of commitment over the course of a parliament. Uh, sadly, we haven't been able to do as much work with our, our fellow parliamentarians around the world as we would have liked um, but for COVID. So we are where we are, um, hopeful that next year might provide an opportunity for a delegation from Australia to meet formally with others to take our part in the debates about the future of how we can do our best as parliamentarians, servants of democracy, to, to bring about better outcomes for all, all people. So I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business. Clark. General business notice of motion number 1296 in the name of Senator Lambie relating to net zero emissions by 2050. Senator Lambie. <gasps> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. My goodness, it's been a long few weeks. <laughs> Got to love being one of the last ones here. I didn't always, uh, I didn't always believe in climate change. I used to think that it was all a bit of a beat up, to be honest. Something that leftist types were drumming up for votes or social media kudos. No offence, but not something that the rest of us really need to worry about. I tell people that the weather getting warmer had nothing to do with, the, do with what humans are doing. I figured the climate's always changing. I didn't see what Australia could do about it. I don't think like that anymore. I changed my mind. A lot of Australians have changed their minds as well. I'm not the only one. And you know what? The coalition has followed suit. They've signed us up for a net zero target for 2050, and they say every Australian will be $2,000 better off under their plan. I think it's a good thing that we have a net zero target. Anyone could see that it wasn't an easy process for the coalition to get there, but they did, and I'm grateful that they did that. We're all sick of the political back and forth on climate change. It's been going on since 2007. The country's moved on. That's why I'm proposing this motion. The motion call, calls on the government to give Australians certainty that their plan will be the plan from now on. Let's lock it in and get on with it. Because while we've all been fighting over emissions targets, we've missed something really important. We haven't done anything to prepare the country for the fires, floods, the drought and storms that are headed our way in the very near future. And this is what scares me. We have no plan of attack to deal with the natural disasters that are already developing, that are already destroying people's lives. We have out of control bushfires starting months before the fire season should have begun. People seem to have forgotten about the 2019 fires that were running all the way down the country just before COVID hit our shores. Those fires weren't just ferocious, they were everywhere. The smoke was so bad it went all the way across the Pacific to South America. It went all the way around the world. We lost 34 people and more than 46 million acres of land and thousands of homes. Right now, families are still living in tents because they can't afford to rebuild the homes that they have lost. What the experts are telling us is that fires like that, fires that cover the whole country, are going to be more frequent and more full on. Even if we do pull back our emissions, those fires are coming. And this is the problem with the way we've been talking about climate change in our country. No one, absolutely no one, is talking about how we deal with the cleanup. There's nothing there to make sure we're ready when the fires hit. It's the same with the floods, the drought, the storms, you name it. We're going to have more of these extreme weather events, whether we like it or not, that's the reality. So what are we doing about it? Because when the 2019 bushfires rolled through, we were flying by the seat of our pants. Let's be honest. We didn't have boots on the ground when we needed them. Think about what we're asking, asking our volunteer firefighters. Those 2019 fires started in June. In June, it was the middle of winter and we already had fires starting. Things got bad in September and they stayed that way until March. That's more than six months of having our fireys on standby. We're asking them to be on call in case there's a fire at any time from June through to March. That means they have to be prepared to go to their boss for leave at short notice or turn down shifts at work so they can help their community and go, f go fight the fires. That's not practical and it's not realistical, and neither is it sustainable. It's just not. And that's just when the disaster hits. Then you've got the clean-up. 
Right now, we're counting on the SES to go in and tidy things up after disasters. They're wonderful people and we'll always be very grateful for what they have done. But we're asking way too much of them. They don't have enough people either. And that means the Australian Defence Force gets called in. The government admitted they're going to have to rely on the Australian Defence Force more when they introduced a bill last year to call in reservists to help when a fire or flood has come through. But the ADF is supposed to be protecting our national security from external threats. They aren't really supposed to be in our country handing out bottles of water to people and sandbagging rivers. We need to get more organised with this stuff. We need to get on the front foot and we need to do it right now. Because at the moment we're clearly making it up as we go along. And that's going to get harder and harder as the weather, and get, weather gets more extreme. This is what I reckon we need to do. It's actually quite simple. If we want to take care of our country and our communities, we're all going to have to pitch in and do our bit. Everyone. We can't go on letting our elderly pick up the slack because, as the, I said, they are elderly. Volunteers in this country are getting elderly. So we cannot, cannot continue just to allow the elderly to pick up the slack. Well, everyone goes on about their daily lives and says, no worries here, that's fine, they're doing the clean-up. Pretending they don't have a role to play. Well, guess what? You do have a role to play. Australia needs a National Guard to respond to the threats of climate change. If you're under 25 and you are not working or studying and you're physically and mentally able, you will be expected to join up, do your service, help your country, give back. How about that? When the fires roll in, the National Guard will put boots on the ground to get people out safely, get people housed and clean up the rubble after the fires and floods have gone through. The National Guard will build resilience, will reinforce shorelines to protect houses from rising sea levels, help farmers out with better irrigation systems to manage the droughts, put levees on rivers so they don't overflow into neighbourhoods when it floods. This is all good stuff that we need to do, but not in 20 years' time. I need them now. The country needs them now, and we need to be realistic about that. And for the people who sign up, we'll make sure you have a choice in what you do. You can choose to help out in local community organisations, or you can decide to go out and fight fires with the fire service. It's up to you. But whatever you do, you'll get your hands on training in a decent job. You'll get paid. And you'll be doing something meaningful for your country and your neighbours. There's nothing more hardy than that, trust me. It's going to take a massive change in the way we think about our disaster response. And that's what we need. We need better coordination between the states and the Commonwealth so we aren't doubling up and going over the top of each other. We need to get a national view of how we're going to manage our response because the problems we've got are nationwide. The other thing we need is to do a full risk assessment of what climate change means for this country. An independent risk assessment is the only way to take a good, hard look at where climate, ch climate change threats are going to come from and what we have to do to prepare for them. It's about being prepared. It's all prepared, 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 because we can't keep doing what we're doing. We've still got people building their houses in flood zones, for goodness sakes. People are building houses right next to the beach, where the water will be at their back fence in a decade or two. You aren't even going to be able to get insurance on those properties pretty soon, and I know some people aren't already. But we're letting it happen because there's no planning and no forward thinking. We're going to look at our farmland and figure out where our food security will be in 10 or 15 years' time. We have more severe and longer droughts right now, and that will continue. What do we need to do to help our farmers cope with that? Has anybody even asked them? It's about having sense of what we're doing and, what, and where we're going. It's all well and good to say we'll get there, we'll get to net zero by 2050. But what are we doing on the way there? What road are we on right now? Because if we don't know where we're going, whatever target we have for 2050 isn't going to matter very much, really, is it? We'll be in a bad shape no matter what. 
Australians deserve to know the truth of what to expect over the next 30 years, because the honest answer is that it won't be very pretty. It's going to be tough. And walking around pretending we're all ostriches who can't see what's going on because our heads, is, heads are in the sand is only making things worse. The, the reality is that we're all going to have to pitch in. We're all going to be doing the heavy lifting because we won't have a choice. This government and future governments after it are all going to have to figure out how we deal with this more severe natural disaster. Basically, we're not going to be in a conventional war. We're going to be at war with climate change. That's the truth of the matter. And while you're worrying about targets, I'm more worried about having volunteers and boots on the ground. I don't, give, I don't care if you go and tell the university students they'll get 30 or 50 per cent off their fees if they go and volunteer. I don't care. But right now we have a very old cohort of volunteers out there, and the next 10 years or even five years, they won't be there. So if someone could please give me the answer of how we're going to fill those boots without doing something like a National Guard, then please put it on the table. But I'll be working really, really hard on the second half of my term in Parliament to push this ahead. I want this National Guard up and going. You can no longer rely on our Australian Defence Force. God forbid if we have to send to Taiwan because you've got no boots on the ground here then. Okay, we've got a defence force that fills just over half the MCG, and 25 per cent of them are officers. They sit in an office. That's what they do. We have to be realistic about this, and we've got no one to clean up. We've got no one to prepare. And really? I think this would be great for the younger generation coming up. We have to be pacific. We have to be leaders. I need those boots on the ground, and we need to start discussing this. And as a parliament, all of us here are going to have to take, take, are going to have to take hard questions to the Australian public. It won't be easy, but I'd rather tell people the truth of what's going on. I don't even care if I'm front and centre leading and get some smackdowns along the way. I, couldn't, I, I just don't care, because I can see what is going on out there, and it's not much, and we're not prepared. Climate change is happening, and we might be able to reduce emissions and, and slow that down eventually, but it ain't slowing down tomorrow. And these weather extremes are getting worse. God forbid I, I, I dread to think what they're going to look like in five or ten years' time. So I just want everyone out there talking about how we're going to do this, instead of talking about how we're going to rally and we're going to reduce emissions. I want to move to that next stage. That's fine if you want to rally and, and do reduce admissions, but quite frankly, I need young guns out there and you need to be a part of this because the elderly cannot do this volunteering for much longer and we've got a big gap in society here. That's the truth of the matter. We are, we are running out of time to get ourselves ready. We are already miles behind. And it will be Australians that bear the brunt of that delay. It will be the next generation. We are miles behind. It is time to get some courage and it's time to start talking about this. It is time to sell this to the next generation because they are the ones that will be out there with their boots on cleaning it up. And we have to be honest and truthful with them about that. We owe them that, leaving them our mess, saying, hey, guess what? It's not about rallies anymore. It's not just about that. You're going to put some boots on. I'm sorry, but that's just being realistic. And we need to be honest with the next generation about that. That's all I have to say. I do want to say a very quick Merry Christmas to all Australians out there, especially Tasmanians, of course. Um, I want to—I know it's been a tough year for um, all the parliamentarians, tough couple. Uh, Sometimes I don't, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit. We have been running around with COVID and that's been really difficult. Many of us too uh, have spent a lot of time in isolation. Um, and I know we don't, we don't say much about that, but um, I, I do want to thank my colleagues in both houses. Um, 
you know, it hasn't always been easy, like I said, but uh, I wish you all a really Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And of course, all the staff that work in Parliament, um, thank you very much. So, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Senator Abeth. This motion on the last day of the 2021 sittings highlights the top agenda item for Senator Lambie, and it's the extreme green agenda. You can't pretend to be the champion of the worker and those doing it tough whilst you're in Kui and put forward an extreme jobs-destroying green agenda when in Canberra. The call to legislate a net zero emission outcome by 2050 is a glib, shallow approach devoid of any analysis or consideration for our fellow Tasmanians. Legislation means it would be illegal not to reduce emissions irrespective of the cost. Now we all have a common vision, and that is for as clean an environment as possible. But to legislate targets may sound good, but it means job-destroying, livelihood-destroying consequences. The extreme green ideology embedded in Senator Lambie's motion has consequences, job and livelihood-destroying consequences. It will hit the poorest, hardest, and our manufacturing jobs. Legislating targets is exactly the same as saying you support a carbon tax, something which the Australian people quite rightly comprehensively rejected in 2013. Handing over control of our economy, our Australian jobs, to courts and activists, which would occur if this was legislated, is something the coalition will never do but Sen Senator Lambie champions. It is irresponsible. A bit of research tells the story, but of course doing research might mean a bit of less time for dancing for TikTok. Where climate targets have been enshrined in legislation in the last two years alone, the people have been the losers. Look at Germany. Look at France. Look at the United Kingdom where extensions to the Heathrow Airport under this type of legislation and proposal of Senator Lambie was delayed. The motion would usher in a new era of green lawfare. But of course, Senator Lambie voted recently to protect the Bob Brown Foundation uh, to enable it to continue its un-Tasmanian work. So on this side, we have never legislated emissions targets, and for a good reason. It destroys jobs for everyone other than for green lawyers. On this side, we make calculated, balanced commitments, and then we get on with meeting them and beating them. We beat our 2020 target. We are on track to meet and beat our 2030 target. The only time an emissions target was legislated in Australia was the carbon tax, and that didn't end very well, did it? The people repudiated the Labor Green carbon tax without hesitation. They will do so again, even if Senator Lambie is used as the stalking horse for the Labor Green Alliance. It really does seem, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Senator Lambie has been sitting between Labor and the Greens for a little bit too long, and the colour with which she started off her political branding, namely yellow, seems to change to green when she hits Canberra. But let's be clear. Emissions are already more than 20 per cent below 2005 levels, while our economy has grown 45 per cent. We're on track to meet and beat our 2030 target. We've set out a credible plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And here I have the comprehensive book setting it out with over 100 pages. And of course, Mr Acting Deputy President, that is so much more hard work than a glib two-line motion before the Senate. But we've set out a credible plan, preserving jobs in existing industries, taking advantage of new economic opportunities to grow jobs, ensuring our regions grow even more jobs, and establishing Australia as a leader in low emissions technologies. We do this through technology, not through taxes, by empowering choice and delivering affordable—a word 
never mentioned by Senator Lambie, affordable, reliable energy to all Australians. We achieve this by getting the cost of clean energy and low emissions technologies down, not driving up the cost of meat, of fuel, of steel, aluminium and goods that use intensive energy. We need to protect the cost of living, something completely devoid from Senator Lambie's contribution. And those doing it tough rely on us to have the calibration of our policy position to ensure that they can make their household budgets balance. That's what we are on about. A carbon tax, albeit by a different name, and sector mandates favoured by supporters of this motion would shred affordability. Australia will achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in the Australian way, and that isn't through an expensive, job-destroying, ham-fisted, mandated, one-size-fits-all legislative fix, which is being promoted by the Australia Institute, of which Senator Lambie now, in recent times, seems to have become the ventriloquist doll. We will act in a practical, responsible way to reduce emissions while preserving Australian jobs and taking advantage of new opportunities for industries and regional Australia. Our plan is not a plan at any cost. It will not shut down manufacturing production or our exports. It will not impact households and jobs. Mr Acting Deputy President, there's a very straightforward message. You can either adopt, adopt this flawed, glib, green motion, or you can be clever and clean, which is our Liberal National Party practical approach in this policy area. Senator Green, unfortunately, we've run out of time for, for debate. I wish you a happy Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Uh, I propose that the uh, minister. Uh, okay, I move that the Senate, at its rising, adjourn until Tuesday, the 8th of February, 2022, at midday, or such time, uh, such other time as may be fixed by the president, or, in the event of the president being unavailable, by the deputy president, and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each senator and leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. I put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President and, uh, and now Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, it is uh, the end of what has been an extraordinary parliamentary year. Uh, it has been uh, the most challenging of years that, uh, that I can certainly recall in my time in this place, uh, and we have seen many things occur uh, over those 14 and a half years. Uh, it's a time where individuals working in this building and those who have worked in this building have been challenged uh, perhaps more at any other time and have challenged us, and rightly so. I want to begin my remarks tonight by acknowledging survivors of bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault and abuse um, through this parliament, uh, through parliamentary workplaces and right across the country. It's a year in which uh, their heroic voices have been heard, uh, in which uh, changes and actions have been taken that are so necessary to occur uh, and in which uh, I trust and hope that all have learned to listen a little harder, think a little more and ultimately ensure their behaviour meets appropriate standards. Yesterday when I addressed coalition staff, uh, I said to them that they should all show respect and expect respect. And that is something that we should all take out of this year as we move forward in terms of the lessons from this year and ensure 
that all act in such a way. It's a year where the country has continued to be challenged not just by distressing stories uh, but also uh, by the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. We started this year, I think, with great optimism uh, prior to uh, the Delta variant striking and becoming the dominant variant and having impacts across nations all around the world. In this city, it had an impact that had not yet been seen in relation to COVID-19 and caused a prolonged lockdown here in Canberra, as it did across Sydney and Melbourne. That had particular repercussions for many of the people upon whom we rely, uh, the people who run and operate this parliament across parliamentary services, uh, the people uh, in Comcar, in all of the parliamentary departments and other departments of state uh, across uh, Canberra, uh, who had to keep the wheels of government and the wheels of parliament turning, uh, notwithstanding uh, the dramatically changed circumstances in which they worked and changed circumstances that become ever more challenging as you deal with both the personal and the professional challenges uh, of COVID, of lockdowns, of restrictions, of uh, working from home, whilst also in case of places like this uh, needing to uh, facilitate at least physical presence as well. So I do uh, pay enormous tribute uh, to uh, all those across the parliament, particularly from this chamber in the Department of the Senate, uh, the clerk and his team, uh, all of those in DPS uh, and the other services of the parliament uh, who have had to respond as they did last year, but with even perhaps greater challenges this year to ensure uh, that the oddities of remote participation uh, that the safety and conduct of the Senate could continue uh, and that we could deliver the type of certainty that uh, Australians expect. They've done that, of course, Mr President, alongside some changes in leadership as well, uh, a new president and a new speaker. Again, I congratulate you and thank you for the manner in which you have assumed this office, uh, as I thank uh, your predecessor, Senator Ryan, former Senator Ryan, who it was such a delight to be able to see once more this morning, uh, and whose service to this parliament uh, we continue to salute, and particularly his service to this chamber as its presiding officer. This place works based on cooperation, convention, uh, and the ability to be able to put our differences aside when required. And I thank uh, my opposite number, uh, Senator Wong, uh, and her leadership team and, uh, and colleagues, as I do Senator Waters, uh, uh, Senator Hanson uh, and all of those across the crossbench uh, for the fact that uh, we all have to find means to be able to engage from time to time uh, to get things done, to cooperate and to put aside those differences. Uh, we've seen challenges in terms of conduct in this place, uh, and uh, that is something, again, uh, that all need to reflect upon uh, and to make sure that if there is a pledge people can make for 2022, it is uh, to enter uh, this parliament and this chamber in particular uh, with the fiercest and strongest of arguments for the battle of ideas, not with the personal derogations or sledges uh, that undermine those arguments. I, Mr President, as you well know, am blessed with a fantastic team uh, that support me. Uh, my deputy leader, Senator Cash, uh, our manager uh, of business and Senator Rustin, uh, her deputy manager of business and Senator Dunningham, the leader of the Nationals in, uh, in Senator uh, McKenzie, um, uh, our chief government whip in Senator Smith and, uh, and his uh, long-standing deputy now in Senator McGrath, um, newer deputy replacing you, Mr President, um, in Senator Chandler and the Nationals whip uh, in Senator Davey. Uh, you, uh, you all help to make sure uh, that in this place I can have confidence uh, that uh, the government's agenda is being pursued, uh, interests upheld um, and that uh, the team is working as it should uh, without the need for me to be here breathing down everybody's neck any minute or every second of the day. So I thank you all very much for that and for the confidence that I can have in what you do and you should all be very proud of uh, what we have managed to achieve. We are, each, we are each blessed with uh, some wonderful staff who help us to get the job done. 
uh, and I thank all of the staff of every senator, uh, but I do uh, single mine out uh, just a little more. Uh, I want to thank my chief of staff, Rachel Thompson, who has been with me uh, from the moment that I was appointed uh, a minister back in 2015 as my chief of staff through a number of portfolios uh, and does an incredible job leading not just my team uh, but providing incredible support to so many. Um, I do also single out uh, Loretta Sist in my office, who has been with me from day one as a senator 14 and a half years ago, um, and in particular uh, her work, especially while I held the Special Minister of State portfolio uh, through some very challenging times in supporting other staff across this building, was so essential. Uh, but I can, uh, I can see the, the two guys sitting in the advisor box in uh, uh, Mams and Jono, well known around this chamber, who are incredibly important for the operation of the chamber as are all of my team and I know all of your teams uh, and we owe our staff uh, that support and respect. Mr President, uh, next year uh, will be an election year and, uh, and of course uh, we will go into battle in our great democracy uh, to see which sides of this chamber we come back to sit upon. Uh, we are fortunate to live in a country where that battle will be done and had peacefully, where Australians will have their say uh, at the ballot box uh, in a manner uh, where ultimately we can, will and must all have confidence in the result. We saw uh, in the last 12 months what happens when people undermine aspects of that democracy uh, and we need to make sure that we speak uh, as one, uh, as democratically elected officials with that confidence in our democratic processes uh, as we head to that election. As we all prepare for it, I wish everybody across the chamber uh, all the best, not so much for the election, um, uh, but of course all the best in, uh, in the rest of your preparations and uh, particularly encourage everybody outside of the coalition to take a very long and restful break <laughs> over the Christmas and New Year period. Everyone has earned and needs uh, a break during this time. I do, Senator Wong, as I'm, I'm watching you now, I hope that next year when we can come back COVID-19 can enable us to take down the perspex, have people back in their normal seats and go back to having glasses of water, which I'm sure are more environmentally friendly than these bottles. And I too have had many bottles where I keep twisting the lid and it just doesn't open, <laughs> um, uh, so, which can be very frustrating at times. But seriously, uh, to all, uh, to all who celebrate the spirit of Christmas, a very, very Merry Christmas. Uh, to all across the chamber, uh, please take the time to be with your loved ones. We sacrifice an enormous amount in these jobs, uh, as do many in our teams, to be away from our loved ones. For those who have had long periods of quarantine during the course of, uh, of these sittings and so on, it's been an added strain on those loved ones. Take that time and have a very happy new year. And I look forward to seeing you all back for battle in the most respectful of ways in 2022. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I'm glad to have the chance to place some, some remarks on the record as we end this parliamentary year. And it has been a hard year. It's been a hard year for the country, a disruptive year for the country. Pandemic lockdowns, separation from family, insecurity of employment and in business, some of the jagged features of the year we've had. And it's also been a hard year and a disruptive year for this chamber and everybody in it and everybody who supports all the people who are in it. Uh, um, isolation of lockdowns, extended periods of quarantine. Uh, I think it's you know, certainly been a year uh, that I'm quite happy to move on from, and I think I, most, I think everybody else would agree that, with that. Uh, I'll start by saying that leading this Senate Labor caucus is a, an enormous privilege uh, and something for which I'm, I'm deeply grateful. And, uh, I'm very proud of my team, of our team, uh, and the unity of purpose that we demonstrate. And I'm pleased to put on um, the record uh, on behalf of my team, uh, greetings of the season and, and thanks. So a few thank yous. Firstly, acknowledge you, Mr. President. I think you said 12 months ago, I didn't think I'd be addressing a new president at this time. I think you said that yourself, uh, that you, um, uh, didn't expect to be in this role, uh, and I will do wish you well in this important role. Um, uh, and uh, I look forward to our continued engagement across the 
through the perspex. Um, my thanks particularly to the Deputy President and Chair of Committee, Senator, Senator Lyons. She is uh, on to her third president. <laughs> See, she, she's no, demonstrating. Just <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. I'm just not making any comment on it. Um, and uh, she does an, a fantastic job. Um, I, I, I said this to her privately, and I'm happy to say to this say it publicly. Uh, Sue hasn't missed a, a sitting, I don't think. Um, notwithstanding being from WA, with all of the quarantine that we know that brings, that's a big effort. It's a big effort, and I really thank her for it. Um, to Simon, um, I've always enjoyed a cooperative working relationship with you. Uh, I agree with you. Sometimes people uh, don't get this, but actually having a strong working relationship, if not always agreement um, across parties, is actually vital to the democracy. Um, I sometimes think he's got a hard job. He's got a lot of opposition in front of him, a little bit behind him at times. <laughs> I don't know if he misses Matthias more than I do or less. <laughs> I do want to say one thing, though. You know, Senator Birmingham's partner uh, is obviously he's, he's, he's part of a political power couple in our state with um, his partner, his wife, serving as the chief of staff for the premier. You can tell by the fact that. We've spent so much time in quarantine, he actually has not managed to get any favours for either of us as a result, which sometimes he could have done so. Um, I do want to, if people would um, uh, allow me, I want to pay particular tribute to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Keneally. Um, this may or may not be the last time we get to be together in this chamber, depending on whether or not Mr Morrison goes a bit early. Uh, I want to say in this place that Christina has been an outstanding deputy. Uh, I have been able to count on her every single day. Uh, she is a rare talent. She's fearsome and courageous, and she strengthened our team immeasurably. Uh, I am sad to lose her from the Senate, but I know she will be a formidable representative for the people of Fowler, and I wish her the very best. I haven't been able to guilt her into staying. So, a second best, I'm, I hope she makes a long and successful contribution in the House of Representatives, and I thank her for her friendship. <laughs> I also thank as always, my dear friend and colleague, Senator Gallagher, our manager. This is the finest group of women I've, I've worked with. Um, this has been a particular feat of endurance this year for Katie Gallagher, uh, not only chair of the COVID committee and all the work she does here, but uh, in the midst of all of this, the way in which the COVID-19 pandemic became real for her and her family. And she demonstrated through that the, the character that she has. Put simply, Katie's just a great human being. It's great to work with you. To uh, the opposition whips and deputy whip, whip and deputy whips, to Senator Urquhart, to um, Senator Ciccone um, and Senator McCarthy. Uh, you know, whipping is the centre of chamber management, and uh, I really want to thank you and your staff for all their work. This has been an even tougher year, with all the travel and pairing and. Uh, remote participation, uh, and you know, you've done a great job. And thank you all uh, for your work. And I know that um, opposition senators are really uh, grateful uh, for your work. Um, I thank all of my team for the commitment to advancing the Labor cause in the Senate this year. We don't win all of the time, but I always reckon we outperform our numerical position. Um, it's going to be a tough few months, but we hope to be on that side by, this, by the time I'm giving these remarks next year. Um, uh, just a few thanks to the people who support us to be here. First to uh, the clerk, uh, Richard Pye, the deputy clerk, and all those, the whole Senate team, uh, the, st and the staff of the Department of the Senate. Thank you for all of your work for what is, I think, such an important institution of the democracy. Um, particular thanks to the chamber attendants uh, who um, uh, really keep this place ticking along. Uh, and I particularly acknowledge the service of Adrienne Morrison, who, as the President of the Chamber acknowledged this morning, is retiring after 15 years. Um, thanks to the Secretary and staff of DPS, um, particular thanks to the cleaners, uh, who you know, uh, often uh, are, are not recognised sufficiently um, and without whose service this place wouldn't run. Uh, to Comcar, to all of those, and uh, to the parliamentary security team, AFP, um, thank you for all the work you do um, uh, to keep the parliament uh, operating safely. I do want to particularly express thanks 
for the efforts of all opposition staff. Staff do have a unique role in the jobs we, we undertake. Uh, as you know, contributors and to and witnesses to some of the most consequential decision making in, uh, for the nation. Uh, they serve us professionally, they serve us tirelessly, and as have we have heard this week, this workplace has not always been the model we would hope it to be and that the Australian people expect it to be, for, for which we must all collectively work to improve. Political staff make significant personal sacrifices to service. They make those sacrifices without complaint or resentment especially in a year, this year, where many of them have spent extended periods of many weeks in Canberra due to border restrictions. So I say to all of them, we are grateful. To all senators, it's been a, uh, a year where I think there has been a lot of passion and emotion uh, expressed. Uh, as I've said many times in this place, this is where conflict is engaged in. Uh, and we all work to contain that conflict, sometimes successfully. Well, I hope we can all work to contain that, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But whatever differences we have, we all have people whom we love and cherish. So my hope for you is that in this time ahead, that everyone here can reconnect with those you love and replenish this most important part of our lives. And finally, to Labor members and supporters throughout Australia, including the Labor movement, on behalf of the Senate Labor team, I extend our gratitude and hope that the holiday season is a happy and safe one. May Father Christmas deliver on 25th September, and may we and the country deliver at the election in 2022. And we, we know with your support we will. Merry Christmas, everybody. Let's not fight about it. Senator McKenzie, you No, it's the spirit the of the season, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, this has been our decade year, so it's um, great to still be in the chamber. Um, I think the, the tone of today's um, contribution sort of really reflects the year that our country and our, um, our chamber has been through. So, like uh, Senator Wong, I'll be very, very glad to see the back of 2021. <laughs> and I think our country is with us in echoing um, those sentiments. Um, I want to say thank you to our staff too and the families of the senators that I'm very, very proud to lead. Um, they work very, very hard, um, often in trying circumstances, and it has been a challenging year, I think, for our staff. And um, I want to say thank, a huge thank you to them. Um, for the National Party Senate team, we're very, very proud of what we've been able to achieve this year, uh, fighting for forestry, competition law, labelling laws, two seats saved in the Northern Territory, um, ensuring Australia Post continues to carry um, firearms legally, uh, having a serious and considered uh, debate on water policy, uh, ensuring that local content is protected uh, in our film industry, and from the AWI, to the ABC, making sure that those government entities um, which service our nation, but particularly for us in the region, as we are um, never going to be uh, able to access these services as a result of um, commercial operations, to be able to come to this place and hold them um, to account is, is very, very important. I've been very, very privileged as Leader of the Nationals to work with a new Senate leader, Simon Birmingham and his team. And thanks to the respect and communication we've developed not only between ourselves but between our staff, uh, we've been able to manage some very, very challenging periods and issues over this year. So I want to say a huge thank you to both your staff um, and also to the people, um, to, to you as individuals. Uh, we, as a coalition, serve a very broad group of people in the Australian public. Uh, we've been sent here to serve them, and thanks to the way we handle our relationship as the two parties of government, means we uh, really can achieve the best for them. Um, I'm privileged to um, serve and lead very courageous, principled and um, passionate National Party senators. Um, who often have different views to each other, let alone uh, to many in this chamber, and the way they can respectfully um, 
have those conversations in this chamber, I, I think really reflects what is unique about where and how we serve. Um, the five people that I lead are also very proud of who they are and where they come from, and I think their voice is unique in this um, parliament, and I'm so proud to be part of a democracy that allows that um, minority voice to be heard. Um, I don't think uh, COVID wasn't the only challenge that APH has experienced this year. Um, and proud again to be part of a generation of parliamentarians across the divide that are going to see change in our workplace um, because of the decisions we as individual senators and members will make um, as a result of, of what has occurred and been disclosed throughout this year. So, um, not shirking that responsibility, I'm, I, I, we're going to get there. We're the generation of change that's going to make this happen. So, um, that, that's going to be a good story. Um, people have thanked the gardeners, the Comcars, attendants. Thank you, um, particularly for carrying all my folders in um, <laughs> of, of recent months. But also the gardeners. I walk in every day, and it is such a blessing to. Um, walk through such magnificent gardens here in APH, and I find, given we're inside all the time, um, those moments where we can run between courtyards for votes, etc., and and feel the natural environment, I think is important. This is our home away from home, and all the staff at APH, whether they're at Aussies um, or the, our security guys or, or Comcar boys, um, and I'm saying that because they are actual both men, um, Lindsay and Andrew. Um, take care of us. And uh, I think it is people say it's a boarding school. I think it's actually more of a home. Um, I'd like to also thank my Chief of Staff, Liz, Liz Dowd, who actually leads an incredible team of um, professional, passionate people in my office. And I'd like to thank my Deputy Leader, Maddie Canavan, and Parent Davy. It's no easy task being the whip of the National Party in the Senate, can I tell you. Um, and she does it with aplomb class and uh, strength, which is amazing. Um, I wish everyone in this chamber and more broadly across our country a very COVID-safe Christmas and recognise that this, for many, is the first time you may have seen loved ones for years, and not because they're overseas, because they're actually here, just happen to be in the wrong state. So I hope you get to hold them, laugh with them, share with them. I wish you all a very peaceful, loving, joyful Christmas and uh, look forward to punching on next year. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Well, reflecting on my remarks from last year, I thought 2020 was a bin fire and 2021 has trumped it. We need a bigger bin for it to get in. Um, another tumultuous year for our country um, and for the world. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I express the love and support to all Australians who have suffered this year. I would like to uh, commend all of the remarks that have been made, associate myself with them and also start by thanking the staff in this building um, and who work um, in electorate offices for us. They are the backbone of how we can do our work and it's absolutely critical that we make sure that this is a safe workplace for them. Um, that they can be proud of and continue to want to work in. It has been a year of reckoning with the brave disclosures of women like Brittany Higgins and Rochelle Miller being the catalyst for so many other stories told. The Set the Standard report released this week is a line in the sand that we cannot turn away from. We must seize the opportunity to make this place better and to actually set that standard that the community demands and live up to it. I look forward to working with everyone in this place to implement the Jenkins recommendations in full. Um, to the formalities here in Parliament, we've caused farewell to former President Scott Ryan, and I want to place on record our thanks for the work that he did keeping the chamber functioning during the pandemic. Um, we also, of course, welcome the new president to the role, and I think he's well and truly been initiated in these last few weeks. And let's hope. Uh, anyway. Let's hope that everything's different next year and that everybody's happy and well. I want to uh, extend the Greens' thanks to the clerk, Richard Pye, to, of course, uh, the deputy clerk, Jackie Morris, to everyone at the tables office and the procedure uh, office, to those in the drafting office. Thank you for working so hard for us Greens and for us all, to the Senate staff, the wonderful attendants, and, of course, um, Adrian, who's retiring after so many years in this place. Uh, thank you for all of the water, and I too look forward to the, just the normal glasses again in future. 
Uh, I want to thank the Parliamentary Budget Office in a re-election year. We've kept them very busy, as I'm sure you all have also, um, to the Parliamentary Library staff who do excellent research work and always answer our tricky questions, to the comm car drivers, the security guards, the baristas, the cleaners, the early childhood educators, the chefs at the trough, the gardeners as well, to the Department of Parliamentary Services staff for all of the service that you give us morning, noon and night. Thank you to the IT teams for keeping democracy functioning in a pandemic, um, particularly during the innumerable sittings and meetings and estimates and committee hearings. Um, I only had to hold up a note once saying that I couldn't hear, and that's not a bad record. Remote parliament has provided some important flexibility, which I think we could all um, hopefully carry forward, and it's also helped to personalise the experience in some ways, as pets and kids and all sorts of things popped up in the background. No one was a cat, so I guess we can call that a win. Um, I hope that this parliament can use the success of the past 18 months to start looking at ways to encourage greater participation uh, and the diverse representation that remote parliament could provide. Uh, to all my colleagues in this place, thank you for your commitment to trying to make the world a better place, even though we disagree on how that should happen. I acknowledge your commitment in performing these roles. It is not easy on us or our families. Thank you for doing it. Thank you to all of the citizens in our electorate who contact us with stories. It's critical that we remain connected with uh, the community and the people that we represent. To my wonderful staff, I'm eternally grateful to their, for their support. Um, to all of my Greens Senate team, amazing dedicated people, clearly not here because they're already on their way home after an enormous year that they have all worked so hard on. Um, acknowledge, of course, that this year we farewell to the indefatigable Rachel Seawitt, whom we dearly miss. Um, we know she's very happy in her, her new role, but the place is, is very different without her. Of course, in her stead, we have the wonderful Dorinda Cox, who's already made such an impact. Um, and we, it's a testimony to what she brings to this place, that we have an inquiry already into missing and murdered First Nations women. Um, Rach, of course, left the task of whip open, so acknowledge uh, Senator McKim has taken on that, uh, that task, and uh, I suspect he's regretting that decision. However, it's too late now. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to getting home to my kids, as I'm sure we all are. Please look after yourselves over the holiday break, and uh, see you all next year. I just, if there's nobody else, I just wish to add a few personal reflections uh, on the year that's been. It has been a strange year. Uh, many weeks spent away from family and friends. Uh, far too many weeks in uh, in lockdown. But um, during that time, when I've been in Canberra, I've been reading Lord of the Rings to Jonathan, Eleanor, and Felicity. Uh, chosen not just for its length. Uh, we commenced this long journey with Frodo in May, and we're only about halfway through. Uh, it has been one of my favourite books uh, carried through from my youth to adulthood. I tell you this to explain why, as we close this very strange parliamentary year, uh, a quote from that most excellent of hobbits, Bilbo Baggins, came to mind. I know half of you half as well as I should like, and like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Now, as you puzzle that out, as have Proudfoots, and as did I when I was a young boy reading the book, I will assure you it is praise, uh, but it is praise with a dose of humility. Taking the time to connect with our colleagues is never time poorly spent. As we all know, connections across the chamber are valuable and productive. To display civility in the face of fundamental ideological difference is the exemplar of our democracy, uh, and particularly of this chamber of the Senate. It is the reason I honour this place, and it is the reason that I believe the role I fill uh, is such an important one. As I take time to reflect this summer, one of the things I'll be reflecting on is how I can, in this busiest of workplaces, assist the Senate to more strongly embrace this civility. Now, I have more people to thank than in previous years. Uh, very quickly, to Richard and his team in the clerk's office, uh, John and team in the Black Rod's office, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm sure the change of presiding officers is viewed with some trepidation, uh, but I very much appreciate all the advice and support I have received. Uh, the chamber attendants have been thanked so much. You deserve it. 
thank you, but the whole staff of the Department of the Senate who looked after us through these difficult COVID times. Uh, we all thank you so much. Uh, to Rob, Kate uh, and all the staff of the Department of Parliamentary Services, cleaning, IT, uh, catering, security staff, gardeners, Senator McKenzie, uh, I mean, they do a remarkable job looking after us and looking after our democracy. Uh, to all our staff, uh, you all do a remarkable job and I hope you all get to enjoy a break. To my staff, I cannot thank you enough. To my team in Perth, Grace, Sonia, Riley, Neve, Catherine and Lewis, I assure you that I will actually be out of quarantine and back in the office at some point. Uh, to my new team of Vincent, Duncan, Fiona and Shireen, thank you for supporting me in my new role so well. To Sue Lyons, uh, Deputy President of the Senate, thank you for your assistance over the past weeks. As I took up the role of President, uh, you have been an enormous support to me. Uh, I also wish to acknowledge uh, Scott Ryan and Tony Smith. Uh, both assisted me enormously in recent months. Uh, and I hope and I'm sure that no matter what their futures hold, they will almost certainly be slightly calmer than that for the role of uh, presiding officer. Uh, finally to you, my colleagues, Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong, uh, to everyone in the chamber and to those who couldn't be here. Um, there are those who I know in this place deeply, whose friendship, counsel and support I greatly cherish. And there are some who have recently arrived in, to this place. To one and all, I offer my thanks, my sincere hope for a safe, peaceful and blessed Christmas to you all. And I'm sure we all look forward to stepping into our own homes and saying, well, I'm back. And yes, that is another Lord of the Rings reference. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, the President will receive a letter requesting a the President has received a letter requesting a change of membership of committees. Minister. I motion to vary the membership of committees. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the list available in the chamber. Uh, though, uh, the question, I'll put that question. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Tuesday, the 8th of February 2022 at 12 noon.